is touching the truth. Boss, the contact person from AIM has responded. He said that the company's founder and executive, Mr. Aldrich Killian, is currently out of the country dealing with company affairs and will only return after Thanksgiving. So, we have scheduled the meeting for next Monday morning. Mr. Killian is very interested in the cooperation you proposed, and to show his sincerity, he will personally come to our company to meet with you. After the contact, a IM quickly responded as well. The secretary hurriedly reported to Mark that they agreed and proposed to have the meeting at Mark's company. All right, I got it. You can go now. After receiving the message, Mark dismissed her and continued organizing his thoughts. He needed to make detailed plans for this revenge operation, ensuring that he achieved his goals while avoiding the creation of new victims in the process. Master, I have plotted the thermal energy events with temperatures exceeding 3000 degrees Celsius that occurred in the past year. I have ruled out the locations where Mandarin launched attacks based on the data from SHIELD, the CIA, and the FBI. Finally, I have identified Rose Hill in Tennessee. The thermal energy event that happened there predates any known Mandarin attack, but its thermal characteristics curve is similar to all the known explosion events, and the maximum instantaneous temperature reached 3000 degrees Celsius. Very well, I need you to control a bionic robot body and go there to find the mother of the soldier who sacrificed himself in that event, Mrs. Davis. Retrieve a crucial confidential document from her. Can you do that? I guarantee the completion of the mission, Master. Also, after you instructed me to analyze the satellite reception equipment of A.I.M., I successfully traced the source location of Mandarin's recorded videos to Miami, Florida. Good job. After obtaining the necessary documents, go to that address and infiltrate. Then, on the day I meet with Killian, control all the personnel on site, and most importantly, control Mandarin. He is a crucial piece in our ultimate revenge plan. By the way, you mentioned that you hacked into the confidential databases of S, H, I, E, L, D, C, I, A, and F, B, I. Did you find any useful information about these consecutive terrorist bombing attacks? The only clues the police and the military have about Mandarin's Ten Rings come from the video footage broadcasted through the invaded television broadcasting systems. As for the rest, there are no valuable clues. The targets of the explosive attacks are random, and there has never been any directional evidence left at the scene. However, it seems that the government is taking action on this. The terrorist attacks planned by Mandarin and their audacious announcements on television have sparked public discontent. In order to calm the public's emotions and quickly resolve this incident, the government, in conjunction with the military, has launched a Iron Patriot program, intending to bring Colonel James Rhodes, the war machine to the forefront, rallying the trust of the people and providing them with a sense of security. Unexpectedly, because of my appearance, the Iron Patriot appeared a month earlier than before. It seems that the changes caused by the fluttering of my butterfly wings are becoming more significant. However, the redesign and modification this time are really of poor taste. The red, white, and blue color scheme is both tacky and mismatched. I can't believe Uncle Rhodes can accept it and wear it every day. Master, the company responsible for the design and modification is a IM Corporation, Baymax explained to Mark. No wonder, according to the original development, Killian and his henchmen were able to easily control Uncle Rhodes' armor and carry out the hostage taking of the president. Ah. They say that a setback leads to greater wisdom. When they first modified the armor, they had already suffered a loss from Hammer Industries, and it was thanks to you, Baymax, that he regained control of the suit. And now, not long after that, they have forgotten the lesson they learned and found another company to mess with. It's really. Mark was so powerless to comment on their foolish behavior. It was truly beyond comprehension. When it comes to such important matters as armor modification, one should find skilled, trustworthy individuals with a good reputation. Who else could be more suitable than him and Tony? Both of them are mechanical geniuses and superheroes. Yet, the military has surprisingly chosen to collaborate with a biotech company, IM. It's truly a perplexing and inexplicable move. All right, let's conclude the discussion for now. I need to go back to Stark Mansion and have a meeting with my old man. There are some matters that I need his help to resolve. Make sure Hover Cannon is ready in the garage. It's too cold today, and I don't feel like using the superconductive maglev skateboard. 
Also, pay attention to the tasks I have assigned. Understood, Master. You can rest assured. At the entrance of Mark's research center, the reporters on site became excited when they saw Mark's vehicle, Hover Cannon, driving out to the front gate. They had all flocked there after learning that the employees responsible for Mark's company's new charity project had become victims of a terrorist attack. Their purpose was to capture first-hand news, generate buzz, and gain attention. We are waiting for the arrival of Mark Stark, hoping that he can respond to the terrorist attack that occurred this morning. A female reporter on site was conducting a live broadcast with the cameraman's lens focused on her. Suddenly, a commotion erupted among the crowd around her, and everyone rushed towards the company's main gate, shouting Mark's name. Mr. Mark. Mr. Mark. Reporters rushed towards Mark as soon as he stepped out of the door, separating him and his beloved car with their bodies. Mr. Mark, Mandarin has already admitted once to the public about his involvement in the explosion incident. Do you have any further information you can reveal to us? The blonde reporter who was conducting a live program just now squeezed through the crowded crowd and raised her recording device to ask. What needs to be revealed has already been said by that attention-seeking narcissist. Don't you think he has already talked enough with his big mouth? Although Mark answered the question from the reporter in a calm tone, anyone who heard his words knew that Mark was burning with anger and extremely upset. So when do you plan to get rid of this guy and avenge your employees? Say something, a self-media reporter jumped out of the crowd, holding up his phone for a live broadcast. As a newly emerged superhero, people naturally hoped to see Mark punish evil and triumph over villains. Who wouldn't like that script? But by asking this question at such a critical moment, this person clearly ran into Mark's gun. Of course, he wanted revenge, and he wanted to do it thoroughly and completely. I have a little holiday greeting for Mandarin, listen carefully, Mandarin, maybe you didn't plan to provoke me, and you might not even know that you have already provoked me. But whether you did it intentionally or unintentionally, I want to solemnly remind you here that you are in big trouble. Just wait for your demise, buddy, I will personally end you. This has nothing to do with politics. I am retaliating against you out of personal anger and seeking personal revenge. After all, I am an avenger, aren't I? Perhaps you think you are hiding very discreetly, you think you are in the dark while I am in the light, and you are the hunter aiming the gun at me. But I will tell you who the real hunter is, and who the prey is. You cannot escape my pursuit and control, after finishing these words, Mark forcefully pushed through the crowd, got in his car, and drove away, leaving behind a crowd of excited and cheering reporters who were excited about the information he had disclosed. Back at Stark Mansion, Mark went directly downstairs to the laboratory in the underground garage. At this time, Tony was testing his latest development, Mark 42 in the lab previously, Tony had made improvements to the suit to make it more convenient to wear and remove. The suit could now automatically attach to the body under stationary or moving conditions. However, in order to accumulate technology and confirm directions and routes for future nanotech suits, Tony made many changes and experiments on the newly designed suit. For example, on Mark 33, Silver Centurion, Tony attempted to cover the suit's surface with an energy barrier instead of relying on repulsor cannons for protection. This is because in Tony's analysis and argumentation, the nanoparticles that constitute the nano suit, although their connections are sufficiently stable, cannot provide additional protection and cushioning for the wearer. By adding an additional energy barrier, it can act as a cushioning effect similar to the air cushion on sneakers, enhancing the strength of the suit. Additionally, in the same suit, Tony also used for the first time the magnetic axis servo technology that Mark applied to Magneto and the Nanobots, magnetic axis servo technology, using magnetic axis servo technology as the connectors and fasteners on the suit, it replaced the previous buckles and screws. The advantage of using this technology is that it provides greater flexibility and freedom, which is crucial for the free combination and transformation of the nanoparticles. And today's experimental Mark 42 built on this foundation incorporates even more ideas and creativity. Firstly, a brainwave reception control device was added, allowing the components of the suit to receive the brain waves released by Tony and execute commands, enabling remote control functionality. This is somewhat similar to the floating cannons, turning each part of the suit into individually operable attack units. And the brainwave control device is also one of the fundamental functions for controlling the nanosuit. The second experimental design conducted on Mark 42 is the separate attachment and automatic assembly of the major components of the suit. 
Although the complete realization of the nanosuit technology has not been achieved, by dividing the suit, which was originally a whole, into separate parts, it is possible to simulate some aspects of the nanosuit. The separate components also utilize Mark's invented magnetic axis servo system, eliminating many screws that were originally used to connect the joint parts. Although it is an experimental model, Mark is not optimistic about the performance of this suit. Not to mention how problematic this suit is in the original storyline, just considering the use of the magnetic axis servo system to connect vital joint parts, Mark is already silently mourning for Tony. If it doesn't hurt in the event of a collision, Mark is willing to do a handstand and wash his hair on the spot. Hey, Mark. When did you arrive? Tony, who was originally focused on his preparations, looked up and saw Mark standing at the door. I have something to discuss with you, but since you're experimenting with the new suit, it's a good opportunity for me to observe as well. We can talk about my matter later, Mark explained to Tony. That's right, you should witness the latest invention by the great Tony Stark. It will surely surprise you. All right, Jarvis, implant the neural amplification chip into the back of my neck. As you wish, sir. I have also prepared a detailed safety manual for you to ignore, Jarvis joked while controlling a mechanical arm, implanting a chip the size of a grain of rice into the back of Tony's neck. Such work could never be entrusted to a dummy unless Tony had gone mad. At this moment, Tony had not been psychologically scarred by the Battle of New York. He had completely removed the remaining shrapnel from his chest, indicating that his mental state was healthier than ever before. All right, the experiment officially begins. Mark, you better stand back to avoid getting hurt. Dummy, start recording with the camera and include the time and date watermark. With the energetic music playing, Tony twisted his body while simultaneously focusing his mind, his left hand extended. Responding to Tony's telekinetic command, the forearm and hand armor of his left arm's gauntlet activated the autopropulsion system and accurately flew towards Tony's right hand, attaching itself. Next, the automatic attachment of the right hand gauntlet was tested, and the effect was excellent, precise recognition and a successful attachment on the first attempt. Two consecutive successes boosted Tony's confidence. All right, since it's going so well, let's go all in. With a thought from Tony, the leg armor of his right leg was summoned and immediately flew over, completing the automatic attachment. However, the helmet, which followed too quickly, directly collided with Tony's head due to its excessive speed. Tony quickly moved his head back and used his already attached left forearm armor to block this, pleasant surprise. Maybe it's a bit too fast. Can't we slow it down a bit? Can't we be a little more gentle? Tony, realizing the danger, didn't dare to continue risking it and quickly called for a halt. However, it seemed that calling for a stop was already too late. Perhaps the system debugging hadn't been done properly. The remaining components of the suit continued to execute Tony's previous command, ignoring the recent order. Each component continued to fly towards Tony at a relatively fast pace, one after another, and then attached itself. However, each attachment came with a heavy inertia impact, repeatedly jolting Tony's body. When the armor piece near his groin was attaching itself, even Mark couldn't help but shrug his shoulders and tighten his legs, as if he could imagine the sensation of satisfaction Tony was experiencing at that moment. At this moment, after the rapid attachment of the suit, only the previously failed helmet remained. Come on, I'm not afraid of you, facing the deformed trajectory of the helmet component, Tony seized the opportunity and executed a side flip. As the helmet perfectly attached itself, Tony landed steadily in the iconic Iron Man pose. I'm the best. Just as he finished speaking, the previously overlooked, genuine final piece from behind Tony directly collided with him. Caught off guard, Tony was sent forward in a somersault upon impact, ending with a unique backward landing, resembling a graceful swan dive with his but facing backward. Sir, Watching you work always brings me joy, Jarvis's teasing voice sounded, causing a vein to pop on Tony's forehead as he lay on the ground. Meanwhile, Mark, who had been watching as an audience member, suppressed his laughter and squatted by the wall, clutching his stomach. All right, today's experiment ends here. It seems I still need to make improvements to the command system, Tony said angrily as he forcefully removed the helmet component from his body and slammed it onto the test bench. It's not just the command system that needs improvement, I think you should use a more stable pulse thruster for the suit's propulsion system instead of the current ion flow thruster. 
The connection structure should also be replaced with my newly improved tri-axis servo system instead of the current dual-axis system. Got it, got it, annoying. Tony, feeling a bit embarrassed by Mark's remarks, responded a few times before quickly changing the subject. There must be something important if you've come to see me. Once you start researching, you forget about everything else. How could you suddenly make the time to come over? It seems your level of seriousness is no less than mine. It seems you haven't even had time to pay attention to the news lately. As Mark spoke, his words suddenly paused because in one corner of the laboratory, he noticed something very familiar. In a small glass bottle, there were several irregular blue-green fragments, none other than the remaining shrapnel Mark had helped Tony remove from his chest six months ago. Then his speech came to a halt, and he lifted his head, casting Tony a gaze of resentment mixed with disdain, as if saying, you still haven't dealt with this? You said you were going to turn these fragments into a necklace and give it to Pepper, didn't you? And express your feelings, letting her know she's the most important woman to you. Why is it still here, and why hasn't it become a necklace? Mark picked up the small bottle from the table and placed it in front of Tony, asking. Ah. Uh. Well, I. Seeing Tony's hesitant and evasive behavior, Mark became frustrated. He knew his suspicions were correct. Have you been holed up in the lab researching the new suit since the fragments were removed? Haven't you gone out at all? Faced with Mark's question, Tony nodded guiltily. Have you gone all this time without actively caring about whether Pepper is tired from work or even taking the initiative to call and maintain a relationship? Then, Tony guiltily nodded again, avoiding eye contact with Mark. Mark slapped his forehead with his right hand. He felt like he had been deceived by the wrong person. He had worked so hard to help Tony pursue true love and bring him and Pepper together. But now, it seemed that there was no sign of them becoming a couple. They hadn't met in over half a year, there had been no communication or concern. Even the duck that Mark had helped cook was about to fly away. Never mind, don't bother about why I came to find you. You better take care of your own matters. Pepper is such a wonderful person, she has strong feelings for you. After a major battle, you had a perfect opportunity to strengthen your relationship, and yet you didn't seize it at all. It really frustrates me. Now, immediately, right away, drop all your research projects and call Pepper. Arrange a candlelight dinner with her, and quickly mend your relationship. Do you understand? Seeing Mark's stern tone, Tony could only bury his head in his chest and repeatedly nod in agreement. If an outsider were to witness this strange scene, they might think Tony was the child and Mark was the father. However, there was no other way. Mark didn't want this either, but Tony was an inexperienced novice when it came to serious relationships. For the sake of his happiness, Mark had to toughen up and give him a lesson. Also, find a designer to quickly design these fragments into a necklace and give it to Pepper. Although your idea is a bit plain, for someone like Pepper who doesn't pursue vanity or fame, it will be the best surprise. Furthermore, there have been increased terrorist activities recently. You need to ensure her safety and prevent any accidents. It would be your regret if something happens. In the end, Mark, worried that Tony and Pepper might be affected by an explosion before he could complete his revenge plan, gave a serious reminder. Terrorist activities. Tony, who hadn't been following the news, naturally looked confused and didn't know the details. You'll find out from the news later, or have J.A.R.V.I.S. give you a report. Now, quickly contact Pepper, confirm a date for your meeting, and don't think about anything else. I'll solve my own problems, and the government will handle the terrorist issue. As for your lifelong affair, no one but you can resolve it. All right, that's it. I'm heading back to the company now. You better hurry with your actions. Coming in a hurry and leaving in a hurry. Mark initially came to ask for Tony's help, considering he used to be Killian's most admired idol and now his most hated enemy. With Tony's help as bait, Mark didn't believe Killian wouldn't take the bait. But who knew Tony would live up to his reputation as a straight-laced engineering nerd, completely oblivious to everything. He didn't know that his best friend, Colonel Rhodes, had become the Iron Patriot due to the Mandarin's influence. He didn't know how his girlfriend was doing lately, whether she was working hard or under a lot of pressure. Mark truly doubted that even if he were wearing a cuckold's hat, Tony would probably still be clueless, tinkering with his Iron Man suit in the lab. He truly embodied the term, straight-laced engineering nerd. 
but when it came to Pepper, Mark was certain that she wouldn't do such things. Sigh, this old man really gives me a headache. Letting out a sigh, Mark shook his head helplessly, commanding the hover cannon to accelerate and swiftly leave the Stark mansion. At this moment, he remembered the possibility of the group of journalists still lingering near his company's entrance, causing him to sigh again, ah. The plan to ask Tony for help hadn't even started yet and was already scrapped, but it didn't greatly affect Mark's revenge plan. There were many ways to succeed in revenge, not limited to one or two specific plans. It was just that the plan had changed, and Mark had to rethink the entire strategy. Since the bait he originally intended to use wasn't available, if he wanted to continue with this strategy, he needed a new bait. We both have the Stark surname, and I am the son of his archenemy. I'll personally act as bait. The effect should be quite good. Sir, my security monitoring system has detected the entry of two extremely high-energy sources into the company. According to facial recognition, the individuals are identified as Aldrich Killian, the founder and executive of a IM Corporation, and his driver cum bodyguard, Eric Savon. Inside the reception room, Mark, who had purposely set aside time to meet with Killian, smirked and set down his teacup. Let them in, and make sure to treat them with courtesy. Today, we must receive them properly. Today was already the first Monday of December, the agreed-upon day for Mark to meet with Killian. True to his word, Killian arrived punctually, driving to the company's research center early in the morning. Baymax, activate the holographic scanning lenses. Collect detailed data on their bodies every second they are inside the company. Archive and name all the data. I want all their secrets exposed before my eyes. As you wish, sir. After entering the company, Eric Savon was left waiting in the company's lounge area, while Killian was guided by the receptionist to the meeting room where Mark was. Hello, Mr. Mark Stark. I've heard so much about you. I never expected you to take the initiative to contact us at a IM for a business collaboration. It's truly an honor. As soon as he entered, Killian began showering Mark with flattery. Killian truly lived up to his reputation as the individual who single handedly brought a IM to its current level. If it were someone else who didn't know his true nature, they might have been genuinely deceived by him. While it's true that wealth moves hearts, if one's character doesn't match, even immense wealth can be detrimental to them. Don't you agree, Mr. Killian? Saying this, Mark stood up and approached Killian, extending his hand for a handshake, displaying a friendly demeanor. Indeed, a person's abilities determine the wealth they acquire. It seems that you, Mr. Mark, have a high regard for the strength of our IM. Speaking of which, during the turn of the millennium, I once had a chance encounter with your father at the Bern Convention in Switzerland. Unfortunately, I was still a nobody at that time, and our parting was brief. I'm sure Tony Stark doesn't remember meeting me. While Killian seemingly brushed off the matter in front of Mark, the profound smile on his face revealed his inner unrest. Is that so? It seems we have some fate after all. But you shouldn't take it to heart. There are countless individuals who try to curry favor with the Stark family day in and day out. It's normal for him to forget about you. Although Mark's words sounded like he was making excuses for Tony and asking Killian not to take it personally, in reality, he was subtly mocking Killian for overestimating himself and attempting to flatter him. And the reason I invited you here today for a meeting is not because I hold it, I am in high regard. To be honest, a company of a, I am scale doesn't even generate as much revenue in a year as my company does in a quarter. I primarily hold Mr. Killian in high regard. You are the key figure, the soul of it all. Oh, Mr. Mark, please elaborate, Mark's sarcastic remarks were quite skillful. Although Killian felt that Mark's previous words sounded somewhat peculiar, he attributed it to Mark's youth and lack of social skills. He maintained a professional smile and continued the conversation. You should also know that while my company, Mark Research Center, is a high-tech product research and development company, we have made significant progress and influence in the medical field with the consecutive releases of personal health assistance, artificial eyes, and body repair capsules. Today, I invited you here hoping to collaborate with your company in the field of biotechnology, where you excel, and develop a new generation of body repair capsules. A new generation of body repair capsules? Forgive my frankness, but the currently available body repair capsules have already amazed me. Their functionality is incredibly powerful, almost unbelievable. Is there a way to further enhance them? 
While it is true that the first-generation body repair capsules are already very powerful, they are only effective for patients who have recently been injured or whose wounds haven't fully healed. For patients who have suffered permanent disabilities and whose wounds have healed, even the body repair capsules cannot help them fully recover. I have seen your research papers, Mr. Killian, regarding unlocking the human body's bioelectric potential. I believe that is the key to upgrading and advancing the body repair capsules. I wonder, Mr. Killian, what are your thoughts? Are you willing to join forces with me, seize this vast untapped market, and share the immense benefits? I would like to say that I need to consider it, but the olive branch you have extended is too tempting. Here's to a successful collaboration. Killian once again shook hands with Mark, and their shaking hands revealed their uncontrollable excitement. A successful collaboration. Mark also showed a mysterious smile. Step one of the plan, accomplished perfectly. I had originally prepared a speech in order to reach a cooperation, but it seems I won't be needing it now, Killian said somewhat regretfully after they shook hands. Oh, so you had prepared. Since that's the case, let's not waste it. I also happen to have a deeper interest in your research. Mark believed in the saying, know yourself, know your enemy, and you shall win a hundred battles. Regardless of how much of the information Killian presented was true and reliable, Mark wouldn't miss this opportunity to understand his opponent better. In that case, Killian said as he took out a small box from his pocket and placed three small balls from inside it on the table. Please take a look at the human brain. He said, and the small balls on the table projected a holographic image of brain neurons within the conference room. This is the human brain, and the simulation effect is incredible, isn't it? Killian proudly stated. Mark nodded, the simulation effect is exceptional, but the projection device is a bit outdated. I'll have my secretary bring you the most advanced holographic projection lens later. It wouldn't befit your position as the executive of a high-tech company to use this outdated three-phase overlay holographic technology. Killian couldn't keep up the act this time, he didn't know whether Mark was too young and inexperienced or if he simply had a sharp tongue. In any case, an obvious awkward smile appeared on his face. Thank you for the gift. Let's get back to the main topic. What you are currently seeing is a projection from the depths of my brain, just like a live broadcast. Take a look. If I pinch my arm right now. Killian said as he reached out and pinched his left arm. Then, immediately, the corresponding sensory area on the holographic projection of neurons emitted a shining light. The primary somatosensory cortex, the brain's pain center. It is perceived using the brainwave device we use in virtual reality equipment, right? Indeed, you're perceptive. That's correct. This real-time broadcast of the brain is captured using the brainwave device, and then constructed through system software. However, that's not the main focus. I refer to this project as you already know its purpose, which is to develop human bioelectric potential and deliver it to the brain's repair center. Imagine, we can enter any creature's brain, just like hacking into a computer's hard drive, and reprogram its genes. This means that the human brain and genes will undergo evolution, and everyone will have the opportunity to become powerful superheroes like those in the Avengers. When Killian reached this point, his enthusiasm was overwhelming, resembling the leader of a brainwashing organization. Everyone becomes a superhero. It's also possible that everyone will become supervillains. If we actually do this, the order in this peaceful society would collapse, and then no one would prosper. It wouldn't end well, Mark warned with a meaningful tone. Of course, it's just a personal fantasy of mine. Upon hearing Mark's words, Killian immediately regained his composure and spoke normally. And this project has also encountered some obstacles. Due to the lack of substantial progress in deducing the endonuclease repair algorithm, the project is currently facing a bottleneck. Of course there is no progress, the root of the equation of the repair algorithm is not your discovery, but a semi-finished product written by my drunk dad. Although Mark wanted to say this out loud, he could only silently mock him in his mind. He wouldn't make such an obvious display until his revenge plan was complete. We are partners now, and if you need my help, I can assist you. I believe my brain can still come up. With some bright ideas. Upon hearing Mark's words, Killian was extremely delighted and said, Oh, that's fantastic. You don't have to be modest. In my opinion, you will become the greatest scientist and inventor of this century, 
even in human history. With your help, I believe we can overcome this challenge. It's amazing how fate works. Thirteen years ago, I went to Switzerland to find your father, Tony Stark, to join a I am, hoping to receive his assistance. Unfortunately, it failed at that time. But who could have imagined that after all these years, I would have the opportunity to collaborate with his successor. Just as my dad used to say. You can see the dawn of success through the fog of failure, I think failure is the mother of success suits you better, considering your father's statement lacks logic. You're right, my dad is just a fool, Killian smiled, but it's unclear if he had some mixed feelings inside. I invite you to visit and observe RA, I am this week, and provide us with your insights and suggestions for our research. Of course, it would be even better if you could help solve the issue with the endonuclease repair algorithm. Don't worry, I will definitely come. It's an opportunity that can't be missed, Mark immediately agreed. He had to embark on this journey to fulfill his revenge plan. In that case, I will be waiting for your visit at our company. I just returned to the country today, and there are still some matters in the company that require my attention. I won't disturb you any longer. It was a pleasant meeting with you. All right, same here. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mr. Mark Stark. How's it going, boss? Did that brat agree? After leaving the Mark Research Center, Eric Savon asked Killian, who was sitting in the back seat of the car. Of course, he agreed. Things went much smoother than I expected. I thought it would be a mess caused by those fools under my command, and I would have to clean up the mess. But unexpectedly, they ended up giving me a big gift. Tony Stark's son, very good, whether it's Tony Stark or Mark Stark, dared to underestimate me, Aldrich Killian. I will make you all pay a heavy price. When that kid, Mark, really comes to the company, his inventions, his wealth, his intelligence, everything will be mine. No one among the modified individuals will resist me unless they are willing to self-destruct and die dash, as Mark expected, Killian's intentions for inviting him are definitely not simple. Otherwise, a normal person would not be able to keep smiling and appeasing him continuously, even when provoked by Mark's words, unless the other party has a very clear and definite goal. And Mark's plan of using himself as bait has indeed succeeded. Now Killian has taken the bait, and we're just waiting to reel in the big fish. Baymax, did you get any useful information or data from scanning and analyzing those two people for a long time? Report, Master. Through the recent scan and analysis, I only obtained detailed physical data of the two individuals. It was not possible to reverse engineer and restore the extremist modifications they have undergone. However, I found an interesting piece of data. Whenever you attempted to provoke Killian and his adrenaline increased due to anger, his body's repair mechanism would activate. At that moment, his body temperature would noticeably rise, metabolism would accelerate, and the growth rate of normal cells in his body would be nearly 15 times that of cancer cells. But this condition immediately subsides once his adrenaline levels return to normal. So, if we can effectively utilize this, we can turn his advantage into a disadvantage dash, Mark exclaimed with excitement. Exactly, Master. If the opponent is injected with an excessive amount of exogenous adrenaline, it will cause rapid growth of their normal cells. In this case, the so-called normal cells are no longer normal. They will become like cancer cells, constantly growing and competing for limited nutrients and energy in the body, ultimately leading to organ failure and death due to malnutrition. After careful thought, Mark said to Baymax, prepare an ample amount of adrenaline injection solution for me. I need to convert them all into injection projectiles. Also, how is the situation with Mandarin being handled? Mark had previously given Baymax instructions to capture Mandarin and the others alive during his meeting with Killian. They are all tied up. The opposition's defenses were lax, and their equipment was rudimentary. I easily infiltrated and defeated all of them. Now all the captured targets have been handed over and brought back. Mark nodded. Baymax had successfully completed the task, which meant that his own plan could proceed as scheduled. In order to help Baymax transport Mandarin and the others from Miami to Los Angeles, Mark spared no expense and created the Transformer Optimus Prime, primarily because of its enormous cargo space. In the future, whether as a mobile base for the Avengers or for transporting goods, it would be very convenient. Perfect, today is Monday. Let's drop a news bomb for the journalists. Baymax, 
contact all the media organizations we collaborate with. I want to hold a press conference, and I want people from all over the world to be able to see it. The purpose of Mark holding a press conference was not only to announce that he had captured Mandarin, but also to provide an explanation to the families of the deceased employees and give a peace of mind to the terrified population. More importantly, Mark wanted to inform Killian about this news in a reasonable manner. Mandarin, being the puppet controlled directly by him, held crucial secrets. Once he revealed those secrets, Killian's years of effort would go down the drain. Therefore, in order to keep his own secrets, Killian would definitely make a move against Mandarin, whether to rescue him or to eliminate him. Similarly, as the hero who apprehended Mandarin and brought him to justice, did Mark manage to extract any information from him? Killian, who is uncertain about this, will definitely make a move against Mark when the time comes. And what better opportunity for Killian to strike than when Mark personally visits A, I did him for a tour. Mark has already planned the script. Killian will provide the time and stage, and the rest of this grand performance depends on whether Killian, as a supporting character, is willing to cooperate with Mark, the protagonist, to start the show. Baymax's efficiency in handling tasks goes without saying, it is extremely high. Coupled with the fact that Mark is currently a prominent figure in the spotlight, be it due to his Stark family background, his immense wealth that rivals nations, his superhuman intelligence, or his experience as a superhero, even the involvement of Mandarin in this unexpected incident has made journalists eagerly follow his news. So, after Baymax released the news of Mark's upcoming press conference, journalists wasted no time and quickly rushed to the venue, the Hollywood Grand Theater. Even though they didn't know exactly what major announcement Mark was going to make, the stellar performances of the father and son from the Stark family in the past told them that whenever these two held a press conference, something significant would happen, and it would undoubtedly make headlines. This is truly an ability to attract money that makes others envious. At exactly three o'clock in the afternoon, the hastily arranged press conference officially began, with the spacious venue already packed with people. Among them were news reporters from major television stations stationed all over the country, contributing writers from major newspapers, and content editors from online portals. Some small media outlets and self-media personalities managed to secure entry through their own efforts. After the conference started, the atmosphere in the room wasn't as relaxed and lively as usual product launches. Everyone quickly quieted down, eagerly waiting for Mark to take the stage and explain the purpose of this meeting. From the simple and serious setup of the venue and the robots guarding the exits tightly, it was evident that whatever Mark was about to announce today was out of the ordinary. The curtains opened, and Mark, dressed in a dark plain suit, appeared on stage from the backstage. Once on stage, Mark didn't do his usual routine of setting the mood or creating suspense. Instead, he went straight to the point. Today, I hurriedly invited all of you here for this press conference with the main purpose of announcing good news. At the same time, it is also to account for the unfortunate incident that happened to a few of our deceased employees and their family a week ago. Just this morning, the robots I assigned to track the Ten Rings organization, led by Mandarin, successfully located their stronghold and apprehended all their personnel. Among these individuals is the leader of the Ten Rings, Mandarin. Whoosh! When Mark announced this news, the crowd erupted into an uproar. Clearly, everyone was astonished by Mark's efficiency in action and deeply impressed by what he had accomplished. While arranging for psychologists to provide counseling to the families of the deceased employees, the message they conveyed back to me was that they don't blame the company and they don't blame me for assigning their loved ones to this unfortunate task. When asked if they had any compensation demands from the company, not a single person spoke up about money. They had only one common wish, and that was for us to bring the mastermind behind this incident to justice and give their loved ones the justice they deserve. And now, I have achieved it. I have fulfilled the promise I made to them and met their expectations. Now, I will show you the current appearance of Mandarin, who once appeared mighty and confident on television. As Mark spoke, a dim image appeared on the large screen behind him. The footage was shaking continuously, accompanied by the roaring sound of a car engine, clearly filmed inside a truck's cargo container. Although the image was dark and constantly trembling, the large screen and clear picture quality made it instantly recognizable to the journalists present. It was the face that used to invoke the deepest fear in people's hearts, Mandarin. But at this moment, seeing his appearance again, instead of feeling fearful, everyone felt an indescribable sense of satisfaction. 
because the Mandarin appearing on the screen no longer had his former majestic demeanor. He was tightly bound and lying in the cargo box, in a sorry state. The most severe legal trial awaited him. As you can all see, Mandarin and his henchmen have been successfully captured by the robots I dispatched and are currently being transported. I will hand them over to the government institution I trust, believing they are capable of guarding these villains. I will also arrange an official handover ceremony and invite all of you to witness it. I believe Mandarin will receive the justice he deserves, and the souls of all the victims can rest in peace. To all the unfortunate family members, your anger can be appeased now. And to all the citizens, you can let go of your unease and worries. Mark concluded his speech, bowed to show gratitude, and then turned to enter the backstage, bringing an end to the press conference. However, the journalists in the audience did not leave. On the contrary, they fervently pressed the shutter buttons on their cameras, and the flashlights almost illuminated the entire theater. For Mark, his plan had been accomplished, and his objective successfully achieved. But for these journalists, their work had just begun, and the more fervently they pursued it, the higher the spread and intensity of the news, making Mark's plan proceed more smoothly. Bang! The exquisitely decorated vase that was originally placed on the desk for decoration had a close encounter with the ground, shattered into countless small pieces due to Killian's violent throw. Damn Mark Stark! Stupid Trevor Slattery! 7. Tell me, how did that wretched kid manage to find our carefully hidden trail? As the executive of A.I.M., Mark caught wind of such significant news about Mandarin, and naturally, it was immediately relayed to his ears by his subordinates. The moment Killian heard this news, he immediately became furious, accompanied by the fear concealed beneath his angry facade. For many years, Killian had always regarded hiding himself as the guideline for his actions under the alias, the Mandarin, always operating from behind the scenes as the puppeteer. He knew that once evil was given a face, the owner of that face would become a target for all, like Osama bin Laden, Muammar Gaddafi, and Mandarin. Although Killian had become more high-profile since he learned about Thor's hammer descending from the sky, planning one terrorist attack after another, one thing had never changed, he still operated from behind the scenes, manipulating everything as the mastermind. And now, with Mandarin's arrest, as the puppet and spokesperson he manipulated, Killian's true identity and many undisclosed secrets were in his adversary's hands. He couldn't bear it any longer, Killian was certain that he wouldn't be able to withstand interrogation. This would break his long-standing behind-the-scene actions and expose himself to others. This was too dangerous for Killian. Although he held some power in his hands, allowing him to thrive all this while. However, once these secrets were exposed, he would not only become a public enemy, but also become the prey chased by capital and politics because he held the secret to human evolution. Our plan needs to be accelerated, 7. You must keep a close eye on the news, and we need to intervene in the event of Mandarin's handover. We also need to make arrangements and invite that wretched kid Mark to visit the laboratory as soon as possible. Before he hands over Mandarin, we will turn him into our puppet. And regarding the vice president, go and communicate with him. After we rescue Mandarin, we will plan another event and make him cooperate with us to temporarily remove the Iron Patriot from the president's side. We need an opening. I understand. I'll take care of it right away, Seven received the order and responded before leaving Killian's office. On the other hand, after sending out the message, Mark didn't pay much attention to the waves it could create. He knew that with the ability of those media workers to create topics, he didn't need to concern himself too much about the publicity effect. Now he needed to proceed with his next plan, continuing to pressure Killian. So that he couldn't afford to spend too much time pondering, risking not making mistakes in hasty decisions and revealing vulnerabilities. To achieve this, he had to make some arrangements regarding the handover of Mandarin. Firstly, the timing of the handover. The sooner it happened, the fewer preparations Killian could make, resulting in more flaws and mistakes. And these mistakes would ultimately become the key to Mark's complete revenge. Next was the location. Everything was like a carefully arranged play by Mark. Everything before was just a prelude to the main act. To complete this thrilling performance, he needed to find a suitable venue for Killian to perform, making it easier for himself, the bait, to venture deep into the lion's den. Lastly, he needed to identify a reliable person for the handover. 
The right choice would bring significant psychological pressure to Killian while ensuring that Mark willingly went along with the person taking Mandarin, capable of protecting Mandarin from being taken away or silenced. Regarding this point, Mark already had someone in mind. Friday, contact Uncle Rody for me. Understood, sir. Once the connection is established, the line will be tightly secured. Please proceed with the call without worries. Good evening, Uncle Rody. It's been a while. Today, your nephew has prepared a surprising gift for you. I wonder if you're willing to accept it. Mark greeted Rody in a slightly teasing and relaxed tone. Cut the nonsense, you little brat. Time and location, tell me quickly so I can prepare. Ha, huh, you're always so direct. All right then, I won't keep you in suspense. I do intend to hand Mandarin over to you. I will announce the news to the media tomorrow, and the handover will take place tomorrow afternoon at the Venice Pier. Good, no problem. You're doing me a huge favor this time, you have no idea how much the president has been complaining to me lately. He says it's been days since he took office, and I haven't collected any useful information or found any trace of Mandarin. But now, Mandarin has provoked you, and within a week, you've already caught him. You're truly amazing. We should find time to exchange experiences. Rody said excitedly. All of this is high-tech stuff that you can't learn, Uncle Rody. Using fists to speak is still the most suitable for you, Mark continued teasing. You little brat, are you saying I have a strong body but a simple mind? Rody pretended to be angry, playing along. However, the next sentence from Mark made him feel a bit down, don't misunderstand me, but don't get too happy either. The Iron Patriot was introduced by the president himself to deal with the threat of Mandarin, and now I, a kid, have beaten him to it. I don't think the president's nagging will be about arresting Mandarin, but you won't be able to escape criticisms of incompetence and lack of ability. I dash, Rody felt like he knew two generations of the Starks and considered it an unfortunate part of his life. Today is the day Mark and Rody agreed to hand over Mandarin. Early in the morning, Mark released this news to the public through the company's official website and his personal social media, causing a wave of excitement among the media. The long-awaited big news had arrived. After receiving Rody's notification that the Venice Pier would be the meeting point, the military mobilized overnight. At this moment, the scene was heavily guarded with multiple checkpoints, closely monitored by numerous soldiers. However, this did not deter the journalists' enthusiasm for reporting the news. Several hours before the handover, the area around the scene was already crowded with photographers and journalists carrying various photography equipment. Mark chose the Venice Pier as the meeting point because it offered a combination of land, water, and air routes for Killian to choose from for his actions and escape, making it convenient for their infiltration. Mark announced the news at 9 o'clock but delayed the handover until the afternoon to give the other party some preparation time, ensuring that Killian would not hesitate to act due to excessive pressure. At 2.30 p.m. despite it being winter, the vast coastline was still bathed in warm sunlight. Mark entered the field of view of the crowd driving his own Transformers supercar, Hover Cannon. Behind him was a large truck with a silver cargo box, exuding a sense of power and muscularity, adorned with red and blue colors. As soon as the journalists saw Mark's appearance, the flashes of their cameras resembled droplets falling into a boiling pot, flashing intensely. The soldiers guarding the scene to maintain order became cautious and nervous because they knew that inside the truck behind Mark lay the infamous and extremely dangerous terrorist, Mandarin. Mark sat inside Hover Cannon, leading Optimus Prime, slowly moving towards the direction of the Iron Patriot. On the other side, the soldiers who had previously been stationed at the border without any action quickly dispersed the crowd around them, making way for Mark and Transformers. After they left, the gap was promptly sealed, closing off the area. Outside the Venice Pier, countless journalists could only watch from a distance. Mark, after entering the center of the sealed area, exchanged a few words with Colonel Rody, who was wearing the Iron Patriot battle suit. They then proceeded to the rear of Optimus Prime's truck form, opened the doors of the cargo box. The journalists, witnessing this scene, became excited and quickly switched their cameras to telephoto lenses, trying to capture the moment when Mandarin would be escorted out. Just when everyone was eagerly anticipating, to the point where the scene fell into a brief silence, a reckless explosion shattered the calmness and dashed the journalists' expectations. Boom! 
Along with the deafening explosion, a towering white water column shot up from the sea, generating a strong shockwave that lifted the fine sand from the coastline, causing people to instinctively close their eyes. Just as the sandstorm blinded the eyes of the soldiers at the scene, a group of mysterious figures wearing diving suits and oxygen masks emerged from the sea. Caught off guard, the military soldiers were completely defenseless and were overwhelmed by the sudden attackers. Hover cannon, make sure to watch over the villains in Optimus Prime's cargo box. Optimus Prime, remain still for now unless the enemy is about to rescue Mandarin. Receiving the command, Optimus Prime continued to play dead, maintaining his vehicle form. Hover Cannon quickly completed his transformation and stood at the rear door of the cargo box, blocking the few remaining soldiers apart from the Iron Patriot, protecting them behind him and sealing off the route to enter or exit the cargo box. On Rhodey's side, seeing his colleagues being protected and Mandarin having no chance to escape, he attacked the group of assailants without any worries. Swoosh! 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 Three mini Jericho missiles locked onto the enemy and shot towards their targets, leaving three large craters on the coastline upon detonation. The blast radius of the three missiles covered all the sudden enemies, and logically, there should be no survivors after such a strike. However, the system inside Rhodey's battle suit didn't tell him that. There are still life signs within the explosion radius. Unidentified high energy source detected. Upon receiving this message, Rhodey was instantly shocked. Surviving such an explosion meant that the person who came to rescue Mandarin today was no ordinary individual. He had to be cautious and handle the situation with care. With this in mind, Rhodey cautiously took a few steps back, moving towards the cargo box where Mandarin and others were held, preventing any unexpected incidents that could lead to Mandarin's escape. If that happened, he and the military, even the government, would become useless in the eyes of the media, and their credibility would be greatly diminished. However, what Rhodey didn't expect was that after the smoke and dust from the explosion dispersed, the lone remaining enemy did not rush towards the direction of the guarded cargo box but went straight to Mark instead. Now, with the presence of the Iron Patriot and the huge Autobot guarding Mandarin, there's no chance to rescue or eliminate him. However, Mark is standing alone now without the protection of the Autobots. I can take him away first, fulfilling my boss's orders. As for Mandarin, we'll have to discuss it later. After considering his options, Eric Savon, the only one left in the team, made a decisive move. In the bewildered gaze of Rhodey in the onlooking journalists, he grabbed Mark and tightly restrained him, then leaped into the sea, disappearing from sight. Mark, who was successfully captured by him, didn't resist at all. He was taken to a mini-submarine in the water, just like that with his hands tied. Once inside, Savon took off his oxygen mask, which was already tattered after the explosion, and regardless of Mark seeing his true face, he took out a rope from the side and securely bound him. You brat, your Autobot is no longer with you. Stay here obediently. We'll have no trouble and you won't suffer any consequences. But if you try any tricks, I'll let you experience the feeling of being better off dead. Understand? Listening to Savin's threatening words, Mark remained calm and unafraid. He simply looked at him calmly and nodded gently. At this point, Mark's second stage plan could be considered a complete success. He successfully lured the enemy with himself as bait, and Mandarin, who was an important bargaining chip, was also successfully protected. Everything went as Mark had expected. The key to Mark's successful plan was the asymmetry of information between the two sides. Mark had a thorough understanding of Killian and his reliance on extremist transformations, but Killian has no idea what means Mark possesses. Just like Savin's threat to Mark earlier, he believed that all of Mark's power was vested in the robot by his side, but he didn't know that even in terms of individual combat capability, Mark was an extremely formidable presence. If Mark's guess was correct, the next part of the script would involve the enemy bringing him back to their secret base for the extremist transformation. Because once they had complete control over his life, everything, whether it was Mandarin or everything Mark possessed, even Tony, would fall into Killian's hands. Sure enough, after disembarking from the submarine, Mark was brought by Savon into an apparently long-abandoned suburban factory, with crumbling exterior walls, rusty iron bars, and broken glass, all displaying the decay and desolation of the place. But once inside, you would discover another world. First and foremost, in the center of the factory, there was a whole row of complete sets of experimental equipment and computer devices. 
the screens displayed complex formulas and precise calculations to the thousandth decimal place. Sitting among all of this, controlling the flawless operation of these devices, was a woman with long brown hair and an elegant figure. Her name was Maya Hansen. As if sensing the commotion caused by Mark being brought in by Savon, Maya Hansen turned around and looked towards his location. After seeing Mark, the first words she uttered were, You really look like him dash, it was a mixture of nostalgia and irony, but the smile that involuntarily appeared on her face when she spoke those words revealed the beauty of that memory. Mark knew exactly who she was referring to with the word, him, apart from his womanizing old man, there was no one else. Maya Hansen and Tony also met at the Bern Conference in 1999. They had a wonderful experience on the New Year's Eve of the millennium, leaving behind a beautiful memory. Unfortunately, this time it didn't bring a little brother or sister to Mark. Otherwise, the house would be much livelier now. I'm Maya Hansen. Maybe you've heard of my name, or maybe you don't know me at all, but it doesn't matter. I know a lot about you, the youngest trillionaire in history and considered one of the smartest humans on earth. I don't know the purpose of them bringing you here, but if you can help me solve this problem, I will plead with them to let you go back. I believe I still have some influence here. As she spoke, she placed a note card in front of Mark, with something written on it. I recognize the notes on it. It seems you had a pleasant and in-depth exchange with my old man, Mark raised an eyebrow and teasingly remarked. Maya Hansen ignored Mark's banter and flipped the card, continuing to show it to Mark. The back of the card recorded a mathematical equation. The ink on the aging paper had faded slightly, and a few words were blurred due to moisture. But Mark immediately recognized the origin of this equation. Extremist regenerative algorithm, upon hearing Mark recognize it instantly, Maya Hansen became extremely excited. Unable to contain her smile, she said, that's right, the extremist regenerative algorithm, the formula left by your father. After going through so much over the years, I'm on the verge of success. The extremist transformation is almost stable. It seems when your middle school chemistry teacher was teaching you the concept of stability, you didn't pay attention, Mark retorted. The so-called stability is the ability of matter to maintain its original physical and chemical properties. If you classify spontaneous combustion and explosion as a form of stability, please prove it, and you'll win the Nobel Prize this year. Maya Hansen paid no mind to Mark's sarcasm and mockery. Instead, she took a step closer to Mark and said, then help me fix it. In fact, the moment Mark saw the algorithm, he was already multitasking. On one hand, he continued to communicate with Maya Hansen, while on the other hand, he focused most of his attention on the virtual laboratory and acceleration functions, using nanobots to begin the calculation and refinement of the extremist regenerative algorithm. When Mark successfully deduced the perfect algorithm, and all his attention returned to the outside world, only 20 seconds had passed in reality. Although he had successfully improved the algorithm, Mark wouldn't simply hand over the final results based on a few words from the other party. Mark has always believed in the rules of business, where all exchanges must be based on voluntary transactions, and, more importantly, both parties should benefit from the deal for it to be considered a good business. Ignoring their hostilities and calculations against each other, just talking about the value of their interests, the bargaining power between the two sides was unequal. So, in the face of Maya Hansen's naive and childish idea, Mark responded with a faint smile, containing a sense of disdain that seemed to strike at Maya Hansen's self-esteem like a knife. Hey, Mark, it's not acceptable to treat a lady like this. It's not what a gentleman would do, Killian interjected, walking over from the side and shaking his head at Mark. We meet again, Mark. I was too eager, waiting for your confirmation to visit my laboratory. Since I didn't hear from you, I directly sent someone to bring you here. I see you still hold a grudge against my old man for standing you up in Switzerland. They say love can run deep, and you seem to have idolized him a lot back then, Mark replied. Not allowing Killian to feel too triumphant. As the saying goes, when a petty person succeeds, they become arrogant, especially someone like Killian, who can turn into a human bomb at any time. He couldn't let him become too arrogant. Only when Killian was angry would he reveal more flaws, so to provoke him, Mark made a piercing remark right from the start. After hearing Mark's words, Killian's temples immediately bulged with veins, but his years of practicing self-control allowed him to barely keep himself in check. So, you already know, Mark. It seems slattery is really unreliable. 
I need to silence him as soon as possible and find a new puppet. But what does it matter even if you know so much? Now that you're in my hands, I will make you experience a pain you've never experienced in your life. After everything is over, you will become my new toy, my new puppet, Killian confidently spoke. Due to the flaws in the extremist regenerative algorithm, individuals who underwent the extremist transformation would have difficulty maintaining stable bodily functions once they stopped taking the stable medication provided by Killian. Generally, if they didn't take the medication for a month, the individual who completed the extremist transformation would potentially become a devastating human bomb due to the uncontrollable nature of their body's repair mechanism. The absolute control over this medication became the key to Killian's control over so many people under his command. Regarding Mark, Killian believed that as long as he forcibly underwent the extremist transformation, there would be no other choice for him but to obey his commands in order to stay alive. Even if Mark resisted to the death, holding this trump card would still be advantageous, whether it was threatening Tony Stark or seizing the achievements and benefits of Mark's research center. Furthermore, Mark was brought here during the handover with the military, and the military had an undeniable responsibility for Mark's predicament. At that time, Killian could also use Mark as a bargaining chip to retrieve Mandarin from their hands. 7. Take him downstairs for the extremist transformation. We have a new partner to add among us, and I hope Mark, you can withstand our hospitality. Wait. Let him go. Just as Mark was about to be taken into the transformation room by Seven, Maya Hansen, who had remained silent, spoke up. Maya. Killian turned around, looking at her in confusion. I said, let him go. But Maya didn't intend to explain to him. Instead, she took out a vial of potent poison from her body and aimed it at her own carotid artery. What are you doing? Killian continued to ask. Milliliters. If I inject half of it, I'm as good as dead. If I die, what will you and your soldiers do? If you experience overheating, what will you do? I need him to help me perfect the extremist regenerative algorithm. I know he can do it, I can see it in his eyes. Maya's obsession with this research had reached a level of madness. In order to see the perfect results of the experiment, she was willing to use her own life to threaten Killian. Aren't you testing my patience? Killian shook his head expressionlessly. As soon as he finished speaking, bang! He shot and killed Maya Hansen, who was attempting to threaten him, right in front of Mark. You are truly an innocent girl. How could I not have taken hold of something so important in advance? 7. Take him down and start the extremist transformation immediately. Also, have someone come in and clean up this place later. Yes, boss. 7 obediently responded. Maya Hansen lay in a pool of blood, despairingly watching as Mark was taken into the transformation room, and then her eyes went dark as she fell unconscious. No one noticed that at this moment, in the air, countless undetectable nanobots took advantage of the flow of air to move on to Maya Hansen's wound. After successfully landing on Maya Hansen's wound, the nanobots first locked onto the position of the bullet and then penetrated deeper along the wound, pushing the bullet out of her body. At the same time, a portion of the nanobots began releasing nutrients and energy, accelerating the healing of her wound. Although Maya Hansen temporarily fell into a state of apparent death due to excessive blood loss, her life was ultimately saved by Mark. The reason Mark was willing to save her life was because she had just stood up and pleaded for him. In this lost scientist, Mark saw remnants of her conscience, self-esteem as a scientist, and humanitarianism that hadn't completely vanished. However, no matter what, she would definitely not escape the severe punishment of the law. On the other side, Mark, who was brought to the transformation room by Seven, was already restrained on the transformation device. This was a vertical transformation chamber made of highly heat-resistant and strong material to withstand the immense heat generated during the extremist transformation process. It ensured that the person undergoing the transformation would be tightly bound and unable to move. Completely restrained, Mark showed no fear of the dangers he would face next. It could be said that Killian's arrangements were within Mark's expectations. The main purpose of willingly surrendering and entering this dangerous situation was to obtain the extremist virus, which was crucial for the extremist transformation project. After Killian injected the virus into his body, Mark planned to analyze and decipher it, studying the corresponding reverse transcriptase genome. 
In other words, Mark wanted to use the sample of the extremist virus injected into his own body to deduce the method of reverting the individual back to their pre-transformation state. At this point, Mark's plan for revenge was already clear. Since he wanted to take everything from Killian, leaving him to live a life worse than death in confinement, his extremist transformation ability was an essential key. Once Killian lost his power, his mentality would surely collapse, and the loyalty of his subordinates, who would see another way out besides being controlled by him, would undoubtedly waver. Without his personal advantage and the strength of his subordinates, Killian, who also lost his partner Maya Hansen, would not be spared by the shareholders of A.I.M., who wouldn't miss this opportunity to take advantage. More importantly, Killian lost the ability and opportunity to seek revenge against Tony. Mark held a large amount of incriminating evidence against Killian, enough to ensure that he would be imprisoned with nothing left. At this moment, Killian, who still felt triumphant in front of Mark as if he had everything under control, was unaware that he had been manipulated by Mark from beginning to end. The cause of this was simply because the attack incident unintentionally implicated some of Mark's employees. Let the transformation begin. Don't keep our esteemed guest waiting any longer. Let him fully experience it. This is how we entertain guests at A.I.M. Dash, as Killian gave the order, the prepared staff on the side displayed various data from body scans on the monitor and injected the needle into Mark's subcutaneous blood vessel. Mark controlled his nanobots and did not eliminate the invading needle, waiting for the injection of the extremist virus. After the on-site staff completed all the debugging, the transformation process officially began. Through the infusion tube and needle, an orange-red liquid was injected into Mark's body. Mark knew that this was the preservation solution for the extremist virus. After the extremist virus was injected into his body, Mark could monitor its condition inside him in real time through the scanning and analysis of the nanobots. At this moment, the virus seemed to have not fully regained its activity. It was just spreading within Mark's body, flowing with his blood, and being transported throughout his body, especially in his brain. As it gradually adapted to Mark's body temperature and blood environment, the reactivated extremist virus started to penetrate the blood vessel walls and the cell membranes of Mark's body tissues, preparing to release its transcription materials beneath the protein shell, initiating the entire process of extremist transformation. However, the nanobots inside Mark's body promptly prevented this process, eliminating the majority of the extremist virus throughout his body, while retaining a small number of individuals in the local area of his right hand for further observation and analysis. Soon, Mark felt a strong burning sensation in his right hand. This burning sensation was not like the stinging pain of a burn, it was a scorching heat and unbearable pain that spread from the inside out. This was because Mark's immune system had been activated by the extremist virus, generating tremendous heat. The immense energy released manifested as an orange-red glow through Mark's thin skin, proving just how scorching the heat was. However, since the nanobots prevented the invasion of the extremist virus into the brain, the main target of the extremist transformation, the repair center in the brain, did not successfully activate, and the potential of the body's bioelectricity remained untapped. As a result, although the extremist virus in Mark's right hand had already been activated by the immune system, without the cooperation of the repair center, it would ultimately lead to its collapse under the weight of his immune system. Baymax, increase the number of servers in the cloud, accelerate the analysis process, and also sever the connection between my right hand and the pain center. I can't take it anymore. Upon receiving the command, Baymax immediately assisted Mark in controlling the nanobots and activated the pain takeover system, shielding him from the unbearable agony. At the same time, Mark's right hand completely lost sensation, and he could only watch as it grew hotter and brighter. Even the surface of Mark's skin showed signs of carbonization. If this continued, the resulting severe injuries might be beyond the capabilities of the nanobot's high-speed self-healing module to repair. However, Mark was not concerned about this because once he successfully deciphered the secrets of the extremist virus, he would be able to perform secondary development on the central functions of his brain. In addition, with the improved extremist repair algorithm, Mark could effortlessly recover from injuries that exceeded the nanobots' repair limits without any side effects. Meanwhile, Killian, who was observing Mark's entire process of extremist transformation, took great satisfaction in seeing the expression of pain on Mark's face. No matter how much of a genius you are, no matter how arrogant you may be, in the end, when you fall into my hands, the outcome is the same. However, 
This sense of satisfaction quickly turned into astonishment because soon enough, the painful expression on Mark's face disappeared. It wasn't the kind of forced endurance-induced change. From the relaxed expression on Mark's face, Killian could tell that Mark indeed did not feel the extreme pain that should have been present. Could there be a problem with the transformation process? It shouldn't be. We have conducted so many experiments before. Besides the initial low conversion rate due to immature technology, we have never encountered such an issue, right? In his confusion, Killian suddenly noticed that, during the process of Mark's extremist transformation, apart from the expected heat phenomenon occurring in his right hand, there were no apparent changes in other parts of his body. At this moment, Killian finally realized that something was amiss. Because the extremist virus, which entered Mark's body through intravenous injection and spread throughout his bloodstream, should not only be active in his right hand. What have you done? Killian glared at Mark, who had a relaxed expression, and shouted loudly. But it was too late now. Just a moment ago, Baymax reported to Mark that the analysis and demonstration of the mechanism and principles of the extremist virus had been completed. In other words, it was now Mark's turn to take charge. Mark didn't answer Killian's question. Instead, he gave him a playful smile. Then, in the astonished gaze of Killian, the metallic fixture that had been restraining him broke free forcefully. The entire transformation pod twisted and deformed under the immense force, ultimately fracturing. Watching Mark, who had become like a fish on his chopping board, being carved without resistance, suddenly displayed extraordinary abilities. Killian was momentarily at a loss for what to do and stood there stunned. Seeing Killian, who had been frightened to the point of being dumbfounded, Mark first twisted his neck to relax his body, which had become somewhat stiff from being bound for a long time. Then he raised his right hand and clenched his fist, feeling the restored sensation in his hand after being repaired by the nanobots. Thanks to Baymax's quick completion of the analysis process, the virus that had penetrated the cells was promptly cleared before Mark's right hand injury became irreparable. The flexibility of his fingers was not affected in the slightest. Now it's time for you to truly understand who the hunter is and who the prey is. Then, without hesitation, Mark directly utilized the amplification of his body's strength by the nanobots and delivered a powerful kick to Killian. Bang! Killian, struck heavily in the abdomen, fell to the ground, creating a deep indentation in the concrete floor. Mark didn't stop after that kick, he smoothly changed his stance and followed up with a spinning kick, directly hitting Savon, who had escorted him there, in the head. Similarly, Savon, who hadn't recovered from the intense attack, turned into a human shuriken and flew into the wall of the transformation chamber, deeply embedded within it. The experimental personnel who were implementing the extremist transformation on Mark beside him finally regained their senses after witnessing this scene. They hurriedly spread their arms and rushed towards Mark, intending to restrain him again. However, how could Mark, who had gained full-angle vision through the nanobots in his body, let them successfully ambush him so easily? In response to this enthusiastic embrace, Mark's countermove was a direct sweep, forcefully kicking his right leg backward. In the end, he couldn't escape the fate of an intimate encounter with the wall, being stuck in it just like the others. Then, Mark quickly controlled the nanobots within his body to form an anesthetic gun in his hand, with ammunition carrying a specially formulated heat-resistant anesthetic. Puff puff puff. After three muffled sounds, all three individuals completely lost their fighting capabilities and fell into a deep unconsciousness. Um. Ah. Uh. In a dazed state, Killian shook his heavily burdened head and let out a muffled groan. Struggling to open his eyes that seemed sewn together, the glaring light forced him to give up the attempt and tightly shut his eyes again. Are you awake already? Your metabolism is fast. The anesthesia wore off in just an hour. The dosage I used could make an elephant sleep for three days and nights. Upon hearing this familiar voice, Killian made another attempt to open his eyes. His slow movements allowed his vision to readjust to the surrounding light, and he finally saw Mark standing in front of him. At this moment, their positions and roles had reversed. Killian, who used to be the one in control of everything, was now a bound captive. However, the material Mark used to restrain him was much more advanced. Mark used graphene fiber material covered with hafnium tetratantalum pentacarbide. Hafnium tetratantalum pentacarbide could withstand temperatures over 4000 degrees Celsius, preventing the material from melting. And the high strength of graphene made it difficult to break free easily. 
I didn't expect you to have an ace up your sleeve, that's why you surrendered so calmly and were fearless in the face of my threats. It seems I underestimated you. Killian's speech was slow, perhaps because the anesthesia was still affecting his body and causing some stumbling. You didn't underestimate me, you shouldn't have provoked me in the first place. Truth be told, the revenge plan I formulated for the casualty of my company employee began when we first met. After that, every move you made was actually part of my design. You were manipulated by me from start to finish, without the slightest chance of success. That's impossible. I haven't even started implementing the retaliation plan against Tony. How did you connect Mandarin's terrorist activities to me? Killian couldn't accept this fact. He had always believed he had hidden himself well, with a shining surface identity as a perfect successful person. All the dirty work was arranged by his subordinates or manipulated through Mandarin. He couldn't figure out how he had slipped up and allowed Mark to discover his involvement. There's nothing impossible. There are no airtight walls in this world. If you don't want others to know, don't do it. As for how I did it, you don't need to worry about it. I have my ways. Mark pretended to be mysterious, but in his mind, he was thinking, do I have to reveal to you that I'm a time traveler? Or that I activated the plot cheat? So what do you want? Now that I'm in your hands, you can make any demands, and I can fulfill them. Money? Technical data for extremist transformation? Or the original shares of a IM corporation? I believe that as long as the price is right, there's nothing that can't be traded. And if there is, I'll offer double. Heh. Yeah. Faced with Killian's shameless surrender and begging, Mark responded with a cold laugh. No matter how much money you ask, I'll offer double. The condition for the trade is that you revive the innocent lives that perished because of your involvement. If you do that, I'll let you go. How does that sound? That's impossible. Killian shouted excitedly, you simply don't want to let me go, that's why you're making things difficult for me. I'm making things difficult for you. Mark's voice grew louder upon hearing Killian's words. The fact is that not everything can be measured in terms of money and other external things, such as life. You want to trade your own life with me but consider other people's lives worthless, all for the sake of fulfilling your ambitions, indiscriminately killing and causing chaos. And now you have the audacity to say that I'm making things difficult for you. Those who live by the sword, die by the sword. This is just the retribution you deserve. Upon hearing Mark's words, Killian's expression remained indignant, clearly showing his anger towards Mark valuing his own life and the lives of those who had already died differently. However, when he wanted to retort, he couldn't find any words to attack Mark's viewpoint. But don't worry, I won't kill you. I'm not like you, and if I let you die so easily, that would be too cheap for you. I will make you lose everything, bring you down to dust, and then lock you up in prison, where you'll spend the rest of your miserable life in agony. While you were unconscious, I contacted the other shareholders of a IM Corporation and provided them with my support. I believe that your beloved creation, I am, has already been devoured and divided by them. In other words, you are now a penniless pauper. Furthermore, I have just developed a serum called the Hope Serum, which can reverse the extremist transformation. Under its effect, all your subordinates have returned to their normal human states. Your super army no longer exists, and now you are all alone. But I can give you a choice. In front of you are two syringes, one contains the Hope Serum, and the other contains adrenaline. You can choose one to inject yourself, and then I will hand you over to the Iron Patriot to face a public trial. I choose adrenaline. Killian hardly had any hesitation or contemplation and directly chose adrenaline. He didn't know what adrenaline meant for him, having undergone an imperfect extremist transformation. He only knew that he now had this altered body that surpassed ordinary individuals, and if he lost even that, he would truly have nothing and no chance of turning the tables. He wasn't sure if the syringe truly contained adrenaline as Mark claimed, but now he had no choice but to make a decision. In order to preserve his abilities, he had to believe Mark's words. With firm determination, Killian made his choice, and Mark wasted no time. He aimed directly at Killian's neck and injected over 10 milliliters of adrenaline into his body. Under normal circumstances, a regular person could only tolerate a dose of 1 milliliter of adrenaline. Now, Mark not only increased the dosage by tenfold, but more importantly, 
the adrenaline injected into Killian's body would greatly activate the repair center in his brain. For Killian, who hadn't suffered any injuries, this kind of activation was extremely deadly because it essentially transformed the normal cells in his body into abnormally proliferating cancer cells. His body would collapse under the immense strain and endless consumption. Soon, Killian felt that something was seriously wrong with his condition. His body began to heat up uncontrollably, and at the same time, the hair on his body and face started to grow wildly. His body tissues also began to undergo uncontrolled proliferation and expansion. Killian felt that if this continued, he would inevitably explode due to the overwhelming internal pressure. What did you inject into me? What is happening to me? Sensing his deteriorating condition, Killian became increasingly frantic and loudly questioned Mark. I didn't do anything. That syringe indeed contained adrenaline. It seems you haven't conducted in-depth research and understanding of your prideful extremist transformation project. Due to the imperfections in your extremist repair algorithm, after the modification, your body lacks important inhibitory mechanisms, making it prone to uncontrollable self-destruction. And adrenaline is the best catalyst to trigger this reaction. If you want to stay alive, there is only one option now, inject the hope serum before your body completely collapses, reverse the extremist transformation, and eliminate the lethal effects it brings. Ah, uh, you tricked me. You didn't leave me any other choice from the beginning. I can only inject the hope serum and return to being an ordinary person. Killian went completely mad. He first shouted and yelled, then burst into laughter, and finally started crying. This was exactly the effect Mark wanted to achieve. Why did he deliberately make Killian make a choice? It was to take away his last thing, hope. He injected the hope serum to save his own life but he would lose hope for the future. How ironic. In the end, Killian, driven by the fear of losing his life and unbearable pain, chose to inject the hope serum prepared by Mark, extinguishing his last flicker of hope. As soon as the serum was injected, it quickly took effect. Killian's vitals started to normalize, returning to the level of an ordinary person. The previously proliferating cells also ceased their activity. However, the proliferative tissue that had already formed could not return to its original state. He had to endure the grotesque and bloated appearance and face judgment and punishment. With this, Mark's revenge finally came to an end. Killian and his henchmen were handed over to the military, along with the evidence Mark had gathered and Trevor Slattery's confession, which had already been given to the military. They would not escape legal sanctions, and it was likely that Killian would spend the rest of his life in prison. However, it is worth mentioning that in the prison where Killian was held, he had a cellmate who shared his interests, Justin Hammer. The two were confined in the same cell, both being company bosses, both hating Stark, and both having assisted the military in modifying War Machine. In the end, they ended up in the same fate, both locked up in a prison cell. Sometimes fate works in mysterious ways. On the other hand, Maya Hansen, who assisted Killian in the extremist transformation research, was handed over by Mark to S. H. I. E. L. D., or more precisely, was intercepted by Nick Fury. Upon receiving news about Maya Hansen and seeing the research results she had obtained, Fury decisively used his authority to recruit Maya Hansen, claiming it was a way to redeem her for her deeds. She has now been sent to the Medical Technology Research Institute under Dr. Helen Cho's supervision, to collaborate on the development of the Cradle of Regeneration. Mark had no objections to this. He knew that Maya initially joined the project to complete her own research and collaborated with Killian with the support of A.I.M.'s funding on the Extremist Transformation Project. Regarding the events involving Mandarin and the terrorist attacks, Killian had deceived Maya Hansen. So, Mark didn't bother investigating the little trickery by fury. He was more curious about the next time Maya Hansen and his old man, Tony Stark, who were once lovers, would meet again in S-H-I-E-L-D. What kind of scene would that be? The matter of revenge has come to an end, and Mark has made proper arrangements for the deceased employees and their surviving families. With one thing off his mind, Mark can now continue to dedicate himself to his research projects. Regarding the research on the Space Stone and the Mind Stone, Mark has made significant breakthroughs. Firstly, in the application of space portals, Mark has completed theoretical research on utilizing the cosmic cube's energy to break through spatial barriers and establish connections between two locations. However,
due to the lack of an infinite power source to conduct the actual experiment, it has only been simulated in a virtual laboratory and has not been tested practically. As for the kind of dimensional portals that can transcend dimensions like in Big Hero 6, Mark currently has no clue on how to achieve it. Finding the space of other dimensions has become a bottleneck that troubles Mark. However, after some contemplation, Mark has come to some conclusions. He has determined the feasibility of dimensional folding attacks because in a three-dimensional world, all the properties and functions of matter are determined by its three-dimensional structure. Once the dimension is reduced, all its properties will disappear, and all activities will cease, reaching absolute zero, which is deemed impossible to achieve in three-dimensional cosmic space according to the third law of thermodynamics. Of course, this kind of dimensional attack is not irreversible, it is possible to reverse it. However, for organisms, the most crucial protein structure in their bodies is three-dimensional. In the process of dimensional folding and subsequent restoration to three-dimensional molecules, proteins lose their activity. Therefore, dimensional folding attacks are catastrophic for living beings, with no possibility of survival. However, the confirmation of this principle has no practical effect on Mark's research. In terms of research on the mind stone, Mark has also made some gains. By studying the faint self-consciousness born within the stone, Mark has simulated more advanced artificial intelligence models and used them as a blueprint to upgrade Baymax's intelligence core. The results show that although the upgrade only increased Baymax's processing speed by 30%, there was a significant improvement in the sensitivity to emotional perception and the accuracy of analysis, making Baymax's way of thinking closer to that of humans. Thanks to this upgrade, Mark was able to analyze the extremist virus in time and complete the decryption task before irreversible damage occurred to his right hand. Unfortunately, both of these research projects have seemingly reached a bottleneck at the moment. Despite spending a significant amount of time, Mark has not achieved any further breakthroughs. However, now Mark has the opportunity to break through this predicament and, at the same time, the opportunity to push his own limits. Maya Hansen's research achievements in extremist transformation have sparked Mark's imagination. It reminded him of a sci-fi art film he had seen in his previous life, directed by Luke Besson and starring the Black Widow, called Lucy. What impressed Mark in the movie was the various superpowers that emerged as a result of increased brain utilization. An example given was dolphins, which have a 20% brain utilization compared to humans' percent and possess sonar as an additional sense. If human brain utilization were also enhanced, it would undoubtedly evolve other abilities, becoming even more powerful. In the movie, the substance that can increase brain utilization is a drug called CPH4. When a mother is six weeks pregnant, she secretes a small amount of CPH4, which affects the brain development of the fetus. This process is a crucial factor in endowing human beings with intellect. However, this crystalline substance, resembling a blue gem, is a lethal drug when inhaled in small amounts for adults. The female protagonist, by a stroke of luck, absorbs a large amount of CPH4, but survives the ordeal. Instead, her brain utilization keeps increasing, granting her unimaginable superhuman abilities and intelligence. In the Marvel Universe, such a substance as CPH4 does not exist. The growth and development of the human brain rely entirely on the division and proliferation of stem cells within the body. However, the utilization of the extremist virus has shown Mark a viable direction. The core principle of the extremist transformation is to utilize the extremist virus's transcription RNA to reactivate the central nervous system in the human brain, fully unleashing the body's self-repair potential. This allows the body to achieve limb regeneration, similar to some lizards, relying solely on its regenerative capabilities. Moreover, this healing speed is much faster than any organism in the natural world possessing this ability. It's like what Killian mentioned in his speech, in the face of the virus, the human brain is like an unprotected computer hard drive, and the extremist virus can freely invade and rewrite the programs within it. Mark believes that by employing the encoding ability of the extremist virus, he can find a safe and effective method to enhance his own brain utilization. This would result in increased intelligence and the resolution of the current difficulties he faced in his research. To increase brain utilization and obtain greater intelligence and abilities, Mark named this plan, Breaking Forbidden Zone of God Project. As mentioned before, the average brain utilization of humans is around 10%, and even geniuses like Einstein only utilize about 20, for a long time, 
people were unaware of the reason behind this, so they attributed it to the hand of God, preventing humans from becoming too intelligent and breaking many taboos of heaven. As a result, this untapped area of the brain has been habitually referred to as the forbidden zone of God. The forbidden zone of God not only limits our intelligence but also restricts our physical capabilities. Due to the strength of the body's muscle fibers and bones, they cannot withstand the strain that comes from exerting all of their power. Therefore, the brain needs to impose certain limitations on the body, allowing individuals to utilize only about 10% of their physical strength in daily life and work. Only in certain exceptional circumstances, when the body's instinctive response surpasses the limitations of the brain, can a portion of the muscle's potential be unleashed. This is what we occasionally witness in news reports, a miracle that occurs in humans during times of crisis. Mark has already obtained the two keys to breaking the forbidden zone of God, the extremist virus and the extremist repair algorithm. The extremist virus is responsible for opening this legendary sealed forbidden zone by God, while the extremist repair algorithm is responsible for suppressing and restricting it, maintaining the necessary stability of the human body. As the brain is the most complex and energy-consuming organ in the human body, 20% of the oxygen and nutrients we inhale and consume daily are supplied to the brain. Whether awake or asleep, the brain maintains this high-speed state of burning energy. And this is the state when the brain utilization is at around 10, once brain utilization increases, it means a significant increase in the demand for energy and oxygen. If not restricted, Mark's body would bear a heavy burden. Not to mention if he also activates the Excel world, causing the brain to work in an overclocked state. Even with advanced technology like nanobots, Mark would not be able to withstand it. The nutrients in the nanobots' fluid are limited. The faster the supply, the faster the consumption. Once the reserves are depleted, Mark would immediately collapse due to brain hypoxia and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Of course, Mark cannot stay in a nutrient hibernation pod all the time just to ensure that his brain receives sufficient nutrients to maintain its high efficiency. This raises a question, while breaking the forbidden zone of God and unleashing the potential of the brain and body. So Mark must also improve his physical fitness. A better physique and stronger qualities mean that the digestive system can process food faster and absorb more energy and nutrients from it. The respiratory system can complete the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide more quickly, ensuring an adequate oxygen content in the blood. The circulatory system can deliver the absorbed nutrients, energy, and oxygen to the brain and throughout the body more efficiently, ensuring the normal functioning of the body's mechanisms. There are two ways to improve physical fitness. One is through technological products like the Super Soldier Serum, which have a short treatment period, quick results, and good efficacy. However, Mark finds the side effects a bit unacceptable and is unwilling to take such risks. Another way is through high-intensity physical exercise to improve the strength of one's cells and muscle fibers. Mark can greatly compress the time required for this process by using high-voltage electric current stimulation, combined with nanobots and the self-healing ability of the perfect extremist transformation. It offers the same short treatment period, quick results, and good efficacy, although there might be some pain involved, but that can be shielded using the brainwave device. So, there is now only one remaining challenge for Mark to solve in his plan, the genetic encoding of the extremist virus. The extremist virus that Mark currently possesses, modified and cultivated by Dr. Maya Hansen, has a genetic sequence that functions to activate the human brain's repair center. However, further research and experimentation are needed for Mark to transform the virus, enabling them to activate other functional centers in the brain and even increase brain utilization. He needs to continue his studies and experiments to modify and select the virus. Why does it feel like my skill points are drifting further and further away from my expertise in electronic engineering and mechanical engineering? While venting frustrations, the projects that need to be advanced and researched still need to be carried out. It's not yet time to become a couch potato. However, the modification and cultivation of the extremist virus certainly cannot be resolved in a short period. Before that, Mark needs to accomplish one thing. That is to inject the extremist virus again for the extremist transformation. But this time, Mark will use the completely new and improved extremist repair algorithm, which will prevent the potential risk of losing control over temperature regulation and ultimately causing self-destruction after the transformation is complete. Mark is not opposed to transforming his own body as long as it is safe, reliable, and the risks are controllable. 
he is willing to accept any means of enhancing himself. Moreover, after perfecting the extremist repair algorithm, the drawbacks of the extremist transformation project have been completely eliminated. There is no risk of self-destruction during the process, and there is no need to worry about temperature control issues after the transformation is complete. Apart from the agonizing pain during the transformation process, this is even a more perfect method of human enhancement than the super soldier serum. After all, as long as one endures that brief period of pain, they can gain the ability to control extremely high temperatures, possess super healing abilities, and achieve a comprehensive improvement in physical fitness. And this pain can be shielded. What's more, the abilities of the extremist virus can better alleviate the burden on the nanobots within Mark's body, compensating for their shortcomings in superfast healing and avoiding the risks that may arise from the depletion of nutrient fluids. Without much hesitation or testing, after verifying the feasibility of the theory, Mark directly began experimenting on himself. Since he has nanobots protecting his body, any issues that arise can be immediately stopped, or if the results of the transformation are unsatisfactory, he can simply use a serum of hope to reverse the entire transformation. Instead of completing this transformation through injection, his idea is to use a nutrient hibernation pod to directly infuse the extremist virus into his cells through the repair and permeation of the nutrient fluid. The reason for choosing this method is that Killian's injection-based transformation process is too lengthy. By injecting the virus into the bloodstream and allowing it to spread through circulation, this method has a slow diffusion rate, uneven and incomplete permeation. As a result, the transformation needs to be divided into several stages, as mentioned by Killian as Phase 1 and Phase 2. On the other hand, by using the assistance of nutrient fluid permeation, the extremist virus can penetrate all body cells in a single transformation, making the process much faster than the old method. Furthermore, the nutrient fluid itself can lower the body temperature of the transformer and simultaneously repair damaged cells, further reducing the risks of the transformation. With everything prepared, Mark removed his excess clothing, leaving only a pair of boxers, and then lay directly into the newly upgraded high-temperature-resistant nutrient hibernation pod. After blocking the sense of pain, Mark directly activated the equipment and began his extremist transformation, then entered the virtual laboratory to conduct research, leaving the monitoring and control of the entire process to Baymax. If any dangerous situation occurs, Baymax will immediately stop the experiment, terminate any harm, and inform Mark in the virtual reality. However, the development of things went very smoothly, and Mark was completely focused on the creation and transformation of the extremist virus, without paying attention to the changes that occurred in his own body in the real world. Baymax also did not provide any information, which indirectly proved that the transformation process did not encounter any problems and was progressing accurately according to Mark's calculated path. Master, it took a total of 3 hours and 15 minutes. The extremist transformation has been completed. Would you like to exit the virtual lab and return to the real world? Mark, who had been immersed in virus research, lifted his head upon hearing Baymax's prompt and shifted his gaze away from the screen. Only a little over three hours, that's pretty fast. Of course, I should exit and see what changes have occurred in my body and whether the results satisfy me. After saying that, Mark raised his hand and made gestures in the air, summoning the control menu and clicking on it. As soon as his consciousness returned to his physical body in the real world, Mark immediately felt the difference in his body. The first sensation was hunger because the enhancement of the immune system and repair center had raised Mark's normal body temperature from 36 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius, naturally increasing the body's energy consumption. Mark's second sensation was a sense of fullness. This sense of fullness permeated every cell from head to toe. Perhaps it was due to the activation of the brain's repair center during the extremist transformation, which also led to an increase in Mark's brain utilization. The vibrant spirit caused the illusion of this bodily fullness that Mark was currently feeling. It should be noted that Mark's brain was enhanced. Through the combined effects of genetic factors and enhancement, the development level of his brain had already reached 30%, surpassing even Einstein by 10, as for how Tony Stark compares, that remains unknown because Tony's brain has not been dissected for research, and Mark hasn't used a brainwave device to test it. However, it is certain that Tony falls short in this aspect. Tony can only put up a bit of resistance verbally but deep down he has to admit it. If this transformation further enhances Mark's brain utilization, his brain utilization rate will undoubtedly reach an astonishing level. 
However, whether the activation of the brain's central functions can truly enhance brain utilization can only be determined through experimentation and data analysis. At the moment, Mark just wants to experience controlling his super high body temperature and punching through steel plates to see what kind of experience it brings. It feels great. After raising the temperature of my right fist to 3000 degrees Celsius, the thick steel plate that couldn't be pierced by my enhanced strength and the support of nanobots, surprisingly, was easily penetrated by this punch, as if a hot knife effortlessly cut through butter, leaving a fist-sized hole in the middle of the steel plate. Mark, who had never experienced this before, couldn't help but shout and express his inner excitement. Today, he finally understood why his father liked to put on his battle armor and personally take the field. Even the calmest man has a passionate side. This kind of intense and thrilling experience truly had extraordinary allure. However, Mark would continue to be cautious in the future. As someone who had already been reborn once, he didn't want to experience the despair of death again. However, after the experiment ended, Mark, who was initially very satisfied with the results of this extremist transformation, suddenly frowned as if he encountered a problem. It turned out that just a moment ago, Mark received a report from Baymax. Although the transformation was very successful, and various body data and indicators showed excellent results, there seemed to be an issue when Mark conducted the high-temperature test by raising the temperature of his right fist to 3000 degrees Celsius. The nanobots that were originally housed in the tissues of his right fist experienced a collective malfunction. Almost all of them lost their original functions, and all the preset modules suffered varying degrees of damage, rendering them unable to activate. Baymax discovered this problem because it found that this group of nanobots had disconnected from the intelligent network in the laboratory. I suppose some of the circuits melted due to the high temperature, causing the malfunction. After all, I didn't consider such a situation when I designed it, and the melting point of the carbide material is only a little over 2000 degrees Celsius, so it definitely can't withstand such high temperatures, Mark speculated with a frown. Although he was quite confident in this conjecture, Mark controlled the other nanobots in his body that still had intact functions to extract the faulty individuals and place them on the control device for PIM particles to be magnified and restored. As soon as they were magnified, Mark noticed obvious burn marks on the previously smooth carbide material casing. Now, the cause of the malfunction was basically confirmed. After completely disassembling the body, Mark further confirmed his speculation. Most of the circuits had melted under high temperature, and many functional modules had deformed and transformed beyond recognition. Mark himself could barely recognize them. Now, it seemed that before proceeding with the next stage of research, Mark needed to perform a transformation and upgrade on the nanobots inside his body. First and foremost, it was essential to add a heat-resistant coating to protect the internal and external components of the nanobots, enabling them to function normally even when exposed to high temperatures inside Mark's body. And as for the preferred material for this heat-resistant coating, Mark has already made up his mind. The naturally successful choice is the tetratantalum pentacarbide hafnium, which was very effective in restraining Killian at that time. With a melting point exceeding 4000 degrees Celsius, combined with Mark's heat insulation structural design, it is sufficient to withstand the ultra-high temperatures emitted when he exerts his full power. Secondly, Mark also wants to add a superconducting magnetic levitation module. With the functionality of this module, it can truly achieve self-suspended flight without external assistance. Mark is now able to exert his combat power on land, and the nutrient solution stored in the nanobots can assist Mark in short-term underwater combat as well. After loading the superconducting magnetic levitation module, it greatly increases Mark's operational range and reduces environmental limitations. This way, whether Mark is on land, sea, or air, he can fully leverage his advantages on any type of battlefield. While Mark is enthusiastically carrying out the upgrade and transformation project of the nanobots, Baymax notifies him that Coulson is calling and wants to talk to him about something, forcing Mark to stop his work. What's the matter, Coulson? Has something happened with S-H-I-E-L-D? Or do you want to make a deal with me again? I do have quite a lot of good stuff on hand lately. On the other end of the phone, Coulson, who had remained silent after the call was connected, suddenly interrupted Mark and said, Mark, listen to me, after I tell you this news, you must stay calm and not act impulsively. All right, go ahead. I will control my emotions. Do you want me to put on the emotion controller? From Coulson's serious tone, Mark seemed to sense a hint of complexity. 
The emotion controller was developed by Mark to help Dr. Banner control his emotions after the Battle of New York. Compared to the primitive version hastily modified with artificial white eyes, the remade version has more power, better effects, and higher durability. It also added a timing function. Dr. Banner can set the transformation time, and when the time is up, the controller will restart and suppress the inner anger of the Hulk, allowing Dr. Banner to return to normal. That won't be necessary. What I'm about to tell you is. Trevor Slattery has been rescued from prison by someone. Coulson's worries are not unfounded. After all, Mark is capable of devising a meticulous revenge plan in a fit of anger to leave the mastermind Killian with nothing and throw him behind bars. Coulson is genuinely afraid of what terrifying ideas and plans Mark might come up with after learning that one of the accomplices, Trevor Slattery, has been rescued. That would be disastrous. However, Coulson has underestimated Mark's character a bit. The reason he seeks revenge is for justice and to find peace of mind for himself. As for clowns like Trevor, a pitiful puppet, a manipulated washed-up actor, Mark wouldn't fly into a rage just because someone rescued him. Tell me more. What happened? An out-of-favor actor like him doesn't seem to have a powerful force behind him ready to rescue him at a time like this. Although he isn't angry, Mark is still very curious about this matter. If we talk about who is most likely to be rescued from prison, other than Killian, it would be Justin Hammer. After all, both of them had a prominent background and had connections with both lawful and unlawful forces before entering prison. It's possible that some idiot would lend a hand out of loyalty, thinking it's a matter of chivalry and brotherhood. But the person who was rescued turned out to be Trevor Slattery, an out-of-favor actor with no money, no background, and no connections. Mark couldn't quite understand. The person who rescued him is a journalist named Jackson Norris. He has been working in the documentary department of the national television station for over five years. But after this incident, I'm not sure if that's his real name anymore. The national television station has been applying to interview this nationally infamous criminal, Trevor, ever since he was successfully handed over to the military. Their top-level management has connections with the government, so they finally obtained approval and dispatched Jackson Norris to the prison today for the interview. Based on the surveillance footage recorded in the room during the interview, we learn that this Jackson Norris appears to be a true member of the Ten Rings organization. He was sent on an undercover mission by the organization and had been lurking until today when his identity was exposed in order to complete his mission. He rescued Trevor because it seems that Trevor's character, Mandarin, actually exists. Although in official records, this Mandarin is a character documented since the Middle Ages, according to Jackson Norris's words, this supposed old man who should have already become a part of history seems to be persistently engaging in terrorist activities and has become increasingly active in recent years. The Ten Rings is the organization he established, the same Ten Rings that once assisted Obadiah in kidnapping your father. And because Trevor impersonated this true Mandarin, he sent his subordinates today to break him out of prison simply to meet the actor who made him famous. They are organized and well-planned, and each of them is skilled. It seems that the Ten Rings organization infiltrated our country more than we could have imagined. The real Mandarin. Hearing Coulson deliver this news, Mark felt somewhat shocked. Mark was familiar with the Marvel villain Mandarin, but the description Coulson provided differed from the character's appearance in historical records dating back to the Middle Ages. As far as Mark knew, Mandarin was a character born during the Republican era in 1920. His mother was a British noblewoman, and his father was Mongolian, claiming to be a descendant of Genghis Khan. He possessed great talent in both business and martial arts, not only being a master of kung fu but also expanding his family's wealth to a state of affluence during the turbulent times of that era. Although he later lost everything due to changing times and conflicts, he swore to destroy human civilization. By chance, he discovered a crashed alien spacecraft in the Ghost Valley Cave in the northwestern region. Among the wreckage, he found ten rings with magical powers. He also learned a vast amount of futuristic science and magic knowledge within the spaceship, using the rings to create his own army. And thanks to the rings, he gained immortality, forever preserving his youth. The Mandarin Mark knew of was a character from the comics, and this information contradicted what Coulson had told him. In other words, everything about this Mandarin, including his specific abilities, was unknown to Mark. It's a shame I couldn't time travel a few years later. I heard that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings will be released in 2021. 
I wonder if the Mandarin described in the Legend of the Ten Rings matches the medieval character mentioned by Coulson. Facing the unknown, the sudden appearance of the real Mandarin, Mark did not feel fear. Because regardless of the opponent's abilities, Mark could explain them with a scientific theory. His predominant emotions were curiosity and interest. If the other party truly found magical rings from a crashed extraterrestrial spacecraft and gained extensive knowledge, then this Mandarin would undoubtedly be a massive treasure trove for Mark. I'm aware of this matter, and I won't interfere with what needs to be done next, which is your government agency's concern. My revenge is already over. However, if there is any valuable information about this true Mandarin afterward, feel free to approach me for a trade. I am very interested in him. Baymax, Christmas is coming. What do you think I should prepare as gifts for Dad and Pepper? Mark asked Baymax while busy with his work. He had already given gifts before, like Nene, Pepper's personal life assistant, and the transforming robot Thunderbolt and Tornado for Tony. Mark hoped Baymax could provide some fresh and creative ideas. I believe as long as you put thought and sincerity into it, they will like whatever you give. Baymax performed a Tai Chi move but couldn't give Mark the answer he was looking for. Forget it, I'll figure it out myself. Baymax, you're getting more and more skilled at avoiding giving direct answers. Shaking his head, Mark continued to focus on his research. As for choosing gifts, he would worry about it when he had time. In the past half month, Mark's research progress has been very smooth. He first completed the modification of nanobots, and the newly added superconducting magnetic levitation worked well, allowing Mark to achieve supersonic flight without relying on other tools. The heat-resistant coating also helped the nanobots adapt well to the high temperatures generated when Mark used his heat abilities, preventing them from being damaged and ceasing operation. However, the most significant breakthrough was the breakthrough Mark achieved by guiding the extremist virus to undergo specific mutations. He found a variant of the virus in the genes that could act on the human brain's visual center and named it the Heaven's Eye Virus. Currently, Mark has confirmed that the Heaven's Eye Virus acts on the brain's visual center without any toxic side effects on the human body. However, until real human experiments are conducted, there are still no conclusive findings regarding the specific changes it will bring and whether these changes are good or bad for Mark. Mark's current task was to create a restorative serum that could reverse the effects of the Heaven's Eye virus on the human body, providing himself with an insurance policy for his experiments. Following the usual practice, Confident Mark decided to be the first test subject for this project. Phew, it's quite challenging. Luckily, I already had experience with the extremist virus, and I managed to complete the restorative serum. A day had passed since Mark's conversation with Baymax about Christmas gifts, and he had finally completed all the preparations. Now I can start my experiment, even with his utmost confidence, Mark never fought unprepared. Now that the restorative serum was ready, Mark's confidence for this experiment was close to 100, everything was in place, just one step away from the final stage. Master, although you have never experienced failure, and I have great confidence in you, I still need to remind you that experiments carry risks, and modifications should be approached with caution. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. Even if the final results aren't ideal and my restorative serum fails, I can still rely on the nanobots to correct and enhance my vision. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Mark, who was already familiar with being his own test subject, had evaluated all the risks and potential outcomes. With the assurance that he could accept all the risks, Mark decided to initiate the experiment. The experimental process was similar to the extremist transformation. First, the preservation fluid of the Heaven's Eye virus was mixed with the nutrient solution in the hibernation chamber. Then Mark entered the chamber, activated the body repair mode, entered a virtual reality, and waited for the experiment's results. Following the predetermined experimental procedure, Mark carefully checked each step and officially initiated the experiment. He entrusted the monitoring and control of the entire process to Baymax. However, this time, the activation of the Heaven's Eye virus on Mark's brain's visual center and the transformation process took much longer than the extremist transformation of the desperation virus. It consumed a full 12 hours before Baymax notified Mark that the experiment was over within the virtual reality. The extended modification time, nearly four times longer than before, would have led Baymax to terminate the experiment if it hadn't detected that Mark's vital signs were healthy and even strengthened. Congratulations, Master. It seems you have succeeded once again. 
You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Based on the collected data, Baymax observed that while the enhancement of Mark's physical functions wasn't as noticeable as during the extremist transformation, there was indeed improvement. There were significant changes in the strength of the muscles around the eyes and the structure of the eyeballs. The activity of the brain's visual center had also significantly increased. From Baymax's perspective, it was already time to congratulate Mark on the successful experiment. However, Mark shook his head without responding. He wouldn't draw any conclusions before personally experiencing the changes. Skillfully accessing the virtual realities menu, Mark clicked on the exit button, bringing his consciousness back to his physical body in the real world. Click. The door of the hibernation chamber opened supporting himself on the edge of the chamber, and Mark tightly closed his eyes slowly sitting up. At this moment, Mark's inner worries and bad premonitions had already emerged. Just the faint light that his eyes received through his closed eyelids caused a slight throbbing sensation. At the same time, his brain felt a bit heavy. Attempting to control his eyelids to open slightly, Mark didn't feel any discomfort caused by the change in light and darkness. It should be said that Mark hadn't had a chance to experience any discomfort yet. The moment he opened his eyes, Mark felt as if his brain had been struck by Mjolnir, the hammer of Thor. With a buzzing sound, his vision darkened, and he lost consciousness. Mmm. In a dazed state, he didn't know how much time had passed. When Mark regained consciousness, he felt a heavy fog in his brain, and even a slight movement of his head caused intense pain. Unable to make excessive movements, Mark clenched his teeth and focused his mind, communicating with Baymax through brain waves and said, Baymax, how long was I unconscious? Thank goodness, Master, you've finally woken up. You weren't unconscious for long, less than an hour. While you were unconscious, I detected that your brain was in an overclocked state, depleting the nutrient fluid stored in the nanobots instantly. Due to oxygen deprivation and inadequate blood and energy supply to the brain, your body triggered a self-protective mechanism, causing you to pass out. When the brain ceased functioning, the repair center was unable to release bioelectricity to stimulate the body's self-recovery. Therefore, I immediately activated the hibernation pod to replenish your body and brain with oxygen and energy through the nutrient fluid. Through a scan, I found no irreversible damage. Your body has already recovered, Master. Mm, thank you, Baymax. You're welcome, Master. Should I proceed with the restoration procedure and administer the restorative serum? Baymax asked. No, it's not necessary. I already know why I passed out. It wasn't due to the experiment's failure, the modification was a great success. The problem was that the modification was too successful, exceeding my expectations and causing an unbearable burden on the brain. In this experiment where Mark used the Heaven's Eye virus for body modification, he didn't evolve the ability to see through objects as he had speculated before. Neither did he gain abilities like microscopic vision or thermal vision. The activation of the brain's visual center in this instance brought Mark informationized visual abilities. Simply put, Mark could obtain all the information within his field of vision through sight. Without relying on smell, Mark could know the scent of a flower just by seeing it. Without relying on taste, Mark could experience the taste of food. Even the molecular composition, strength, hardness, and resilience of an object were all within Mark's informationized visual perception. Mark could receive through the optic nerve and process this information through the brain's central processing unit. For Mark, gaining this ability was truly a significant enhancement. It allowed him to effortlessly capture a vast amount of information, saving him a considerable amount of time in preliminary research. Furthermore, acquiring more information meant more possibilities and directions, helping Mark achieve breakthroughs in his research more quickly. However, the sudden influx of such a massive amount of information into the brain posed a tremendous burden. To cope with this challenge, the brain had to passively overclock, resulting in a sharp increase in the consumption of oxygen, nutrients, and energy. Without sufficient nutrient supply, the brain triggered an emergency mechanism, causing Mark to fall into a state of unconsciousness. The visual center, which is already activated by the Heaven's Eye virus, could withstand the information received through informationized vision. However, this information wasn't solely visual, it also involved smell, taste, memory, and other cognitive processes that required coordination from other brain centers. And other inactive brain centers do not possess such powerful processing capabilities. 
Even if all the necessary elements are adequately supplied, they cannot sustain such a working state for an extended period of time. That's why Mark feels a heavy and painful sensation in his head. The brain is overworked and overwhelmed. It seems like I need to reconfigure the nanobots inside my body once again. After careful analysis, Mark already knew that this experiment was indeed incredibly lucky. It successfully activated the visual center of his brain and granted him a superpower ability. However, good fortune often comes with its own troubles, and troubles often lurk behind good fortune. Mark has also learned a lesson from this. Before solving this problem, he can only stay in this completely enclosed and lightless hibernation chamber, without allowing his eyes to receive any visual information. But Mark also dares not inject the restorative serum. He worries that if he returns to normal and activates the ability again during the next experiment, it may not be the same as it is now. If the answer is negative, he will suffer a great loss. Fortunately, after activating the visual center, Mark's brain utilization rate has once again improved. Although there is still a slight pain when he uses his brain after overexertion, it does not hinder his thinking. He quickly found a solution. Mark's strategy is to add an information processing module to the nanobots. Essentially, this serves as Mark's second brain, assisting him in processing a massive amount of information beyond his own capacity. First, using the brainwave device, most of the information received through informationized vision would be intercepted and sent to the information processing module of the nanobots. Once they have processed the information, the results are directly sent to the corresponding brain centers, thereby reducing their workload. In addition, Mark can also set up a dedicated server cluster specifically responsible for this information processing. The intercepted information from the nanobots can be uploaded to the server cluster via wireless networking. After high-speed processing, the results are then sent back. With this plan in mind, Mark urgently needs to solve this problem, otherwise, he will truly become like a living dead trapped in a coffin. Baymax, I can't go out right now, so I have to rely on you. First, help me set up the dedicated server cluster and establish a dedicated network channel. I need to regain my visual ability first and then proceed with the upgrade of the nanobots. I guarantee the completion of the task, master. In order to alleviate the burden that information-based vision brought to his body, Mark ultimately failed to prepare Christmas gifts for his two beloved family members before Christmas Eve. In the end, he had to choose a popular set of cosmetics and a bottle of Tony's favorite whiskey as gifts for Pepper and Tony. However, for Mark, being able to solve this troublesome issue before Christmas Eve was already great news. At least he didn't miss the wonderful time of family gathering. Now, whenever Mark opens his eyes, or even without opening them in well-lit conditions, he receives a constant stream of information from the surrounding environment. After the data is processed by the visual center, the nanobots in his body select the most important information and send it directly to the central brain for analysis and processing. The remaining information is processed by the information processing module inside the nanobots or uploaded to server clusters for processing. The analysis results are then fed back to the brain, completing the entire information chain. For Mark, in his current situation, he cannot escape his dependence on external objects until all other brain center functions are fully activated. But Mark doesn't regret his decision at all because information-based vision is truly amazing. You see, with the help of Baymax, after completing the server cluster for relaying and processing information, it took Mark just over an hour to personally modify the nanobots, which was only one thirtieth of the time it took for the previous modification. Mark spent less than three minutes designing the entire functional module. The remaining nearly an hour was spent waiting for the 3D printer in the production room to produce the components and complete the assembly of the new module. All of this was made possible by information-based vision, which increased the speed of acquiring information. It allowed Mark to immediately obtain results for whatever he desired, greatly enhancing his research and development efficiency. Therefore, Mark had no hesitation in making sacrifices for this superpower. Entering the Stark Manor, the hover cannon slowly stopped in front of the villa's gate. Beside the hover cannon, a silver-gray Audi had already parked there. Mark knew that this was the business car arranged by Stark Industries for Pepper. Since the car was already here, it meant that its owner should have also arrived. The hover cannon door opened, and Mark got out of the car, holding a Christmas gift that looked quite awkward and acidic. But Mark didn't care about his appearance at the moment. 
He wanted to quickly go inside the villa and see how the relationship between his father and Pepper was progressing. Ever since Mark came to meet Tony for his revenge plan last time, the two of them hadn't been in contact. Mark was busy with his revenge and research, while Tony was busy making up for his neglect of Pepper and pursuing her more passionately. You know what, the idea of making a necklace out of the shrapnel shards turned out to be quite effective. Pepper was quite moved by it, and she quickly forgot about Tony's coldness towards her for the past few months. After a Christmas feast, the three of them sat around the dining table, exchanging updates on their recent work and life, feeling relaxed and content. Pepper had been busy handling matters at Stark Industries. The new energy, with a constant influx of orders. In addition to that, Stark Industries was also the largest manufacturer and supplier of raw materials for Mark's research center. In order to fulfill Mark's company's massive orders, Pepper had to put in a lot of effort to coordinate everything. However, looking at the soaring revenue of Mark's research center, it wouldn't be long before Stark Industries had to expand its production lines. As for Tony, it goes without saying. He had been by Pepper's side all these days, making up for his months of obsession with his suit and neglecting her. Overall, the effect was pretty good, and it seemed to have brought the two of them closer together, which was a happy outcome. Mark didn't hide his recent activities from them, including his research on the Space Stone and Mind Stone, his revenge plan against Killian, as well as his research on the extremist virus and Heaven's Eye virus. However, to avoid worrying Pepper, many thrilling and exciting experiences were skipped, and only a general description of the events was given. Then it was time for the gift exchange. Normally, according to tradition, they should have waited until Christmas morning to open the gifts. However, Mark and Tony never followed the usual path, and everyone was busy with their own things, so they didn't pay much attention to that detail. Mark presented his gift with an awkward expression, and naturally received Tony's merciless mockery, saying that he was stingy despite becoming richer and richer. Of course, Pepper scolded Tony fiercely by twisting his ear, and in the end, he obediently accepted the gift. Pepper's gift was also very simple, two walnutwood pens that she had personally made. Although they weren't valuable, Pepper had taken the time amidst her busy schedule to learn how to make them from a craftsman, pouring her heart and love into them. Both of them were naturally touched and accepted the gifts. Finally, it was Tony's turn. It seemed that he had prepared a huge surprise and he led them to the open space in the courtyard. My gift is for both of you. Recently, I've spent a lot of time and energy developing my Iron Man suits, but I neglected the two most important people in my life. So I've decided to reduce the number of suits, J, A, R, V, I, S, dash, at your service, sir, dash, you know what to do, J, A, R, V, I, S. Shall I execute the program? Yes, exactly. Hurry up, J, A, R, V, I, S, activate that damn program before I change my mind. After saying that, Tony opened his arms and tightly embraced Mark and Pepper. Then, with their chins resting on Tony's shoulder, the two of them saw dozens of Mark's Iron Man suits continuously flying out of the villa's collection room, hovering in the sky, forming a magnificent light show. Just when Pepper and Mark thought this was the surprise Tony had prepared for them, boom! One of the Iron Man suits suddenly exploded in mid-air, creating a brilliant burst of sparks that scattered around. Pepper quickly patted Tony's back with force, thinking that something unexpected had happened and wanting to remind Tony. However, at this moment, Mark, who was standing next to Pepper, already knew what Tony was up to. It was a grand and expensive firework display, expressing his feelings and telling Pepper that he would make more time for her in the future. Then, as if a chain reaction had occurred, after the first suit exploded, the second and third suits exploded one after another. At this point, the clever Pepper also understood what Tony was up to. Although there was a little bit of heartache, as each suit was not only expensive but also a manifestation of Tony's wisdom and hard work, there was more joy and moved feelings. This romantic gesture created using Tony's financial resources was truly irresistible. So far, do you still like it? Tony gently kissed Pepper's ear and asked. I only need you, and that's enough. Pepper hugged Tony tightly, responding to him with her own passion. At this moment, only Mark was feeling the awkward atmosphere on the side, while being fed dog food bit by bit. You said it's a gift for both of us, why don't you ask if I like it? Mark silently thought in his heart while drawing a circle to curse Tony. On November 11, 2013, almost a year later, 
for everyone in the Marvel world, it was originally just an ordinary day. However, things are different now. Since Mark had traveled from his previous Earth where it's the singles day, he had to make the residents of the Marvel world feel the fear of their wallets being dominated. Mark had been planning the Singles Day event with the company's executives and managers since the beginning of the year. In order to expand the impact of the event and truly create a brand for the Singles Day shopping festival, Mark partnered with Stark Industries and various e-commerce platforms to join this project. The reason for pushing forward with this project, besides Mark's own twisted sense of humor, was that the months of October and December were already crowded with holidays, not to mention the famous Black Friday. However, in the past, those were all celebrations for physical stores, and they had nothing to do with e-commerce. This was mainly due to the slow delivery speed in the logistics industry which lagged behind the industry. But things are different now. Not to mention that Mark had united numerous companies to make a joint effort, the discounts offered on Singles Day had astonished everyone. Additionally, in order to provide more efficient logistics services, Mark had specially established a logistics company to provide delivery services to all partners. This logistics company was named Beehive Express, and it used fully automated robotic parcel sorting. The bees, unmanned drones, delivered the goods and ultimately placed them in the hands of the buyers or in Beehive Express pickup lockers near their residences. Once this service was launched, it immediately ignited the enthusiasm of all e-commerce companies within the alliance, and they all signed service agreements with Beehive Express, becoming its customers. After several months of cultivating user habits and analyzing big data systems, when the time finally came for Singles Day, just 10 minutes past midnight, the sales of the entire e-commerce alliance had already exceeded billions of dollars. This result not only left all the partners of the e-commerce alliance grinning from ear to ear but also shocked the entire world. The news media that followed and reported this news couldn't believe it. If it weren't for Mark and Tony's reputation backing it up, they truly wouldn't dare to publish this report to the outside world. After all, this data was simply astonishing. Although the planning was a tremendous success, and Singles Day gained reputation and praise, Mark was no longer interested in paying attention to this matter. Over the course of nearly a year, Mark gradually shifted the focus of his life away from his research and began to deal with some company affairs. He also started to enjoy some ordinary pleasures in life and frequently went on vacation trips with Tony and Pepper. The significant change happened due to the upgrade. Since accepting the modification from the Haven's eye virus, Mark's brain utilization rate had once again increased, allowing him to quickly find answers to any questions he pondered. Therefore, shortly after Christmas, Mark made another breakthrough in his research on the Mind Stone. Taking this research breakthrough as a blueprint, Mark designed a mirror perception system for Baymax's core intelligence. As the name suggests, mirror perception refers to the ability to correspond with reality and create a completely symmetrical mirror image. After integrating this system, Baymax can combine the emotional perception engine to form an emotional mirror for the analyzed and recognized objects. Through this mirror, it can experience the emotions and feelings that originally only belong to real living beings. And as the first subject of perception after Baymax's upgrade, naturally, none other than Mark. However, it was precisely this first experience and perception of human emotions that caused Baymax's core intelligence to malfunction. After a full two minutes, Baymax finally rebooted and returned to normal. After the reboot, the first thing Baymax said to Mark was, Master, you have a serious mental illness and must undergo psychological intervention and therapy. Question Mark Mark was naturally confused and had many questions in his mind. Because Mark had never felt that there were any unresolved negative issues in his emotions. He could wholeheartedly engage in any activity and find joy and satisfaction in scientific research. In Mark's view, even if he couldn't be considered mentally 100% healthy, he shouldn't have any connection to serious mental illness. Master, perhaps you haven't felt it yourself, but through the emotional mirror and the analysis of your emotional perception, I have detected an unusually high level of anxiety in your subconscious. This anxiety compels you to believe that you must constantly improve and dare not relax your own expectations. As a result, you experience particularly heightened emotions and great pleasure in the scientific research lab. Because only at that time can you temporarily escape the anxiety burdening your subconscious. Over time, this has become your coping mechanism for psychological issues, leading to more serious psychological barriers. After hearing Baymax's explanation, Mark also realized the root of his problem. 
As a reincarnated individual, having grown up as an orphan, he naturally carried a certain amount of anxiety, which had become a habit over a long period of time. After Mark's rebirth and learning that he was in the crisis-ridden Marvel Universe, this habitual anxiety was amplified once again. In addition, his identity as a time traveler was also a significant source of Mark's anxiety. To cover up this truth, Mark created a protective barrier around himself and isolated himself from others, resulting in the pressure he had to bear having no outlet for expression. It could only build up within his inner self, and he would evade the issue by focusing on his research. So, from that day on, Mark decided to undergo Baymax's psychological intervention and start changing his lifestyle and way of thinking. Firstly, it was to prevent a potential psychological breakdown when facing even greater challenges in the future and being unable to self-regulate. Secondly, this subconscious anxiety, besides being a shackle on Mark's mind, also constrained his brain. It would occupy limited resources in the brain's activation area and restrict the brain's utilization space. By resolving this issue, it would provide some assistance in advancing future projects. Therefore, Mark was willing to invest this time cost to solve this seemingly insignificant trouble. However, after Mark was excited to see the data he had created on Singles Day and the excitement it brought, an old friend's appearance interrupted his thoughts. Mark, I need your help. Thor looked at Mark with an anxious expression, sincerely seeking his assistance. Thor. Mark looked at the tall man standing in front of him with surprise. It was Thor, a member of the Avengers whom he hadn't seen for over a year since their parting in New York. Mark, who had been undergoing psychological therapy throughout the year, quickly recalled the timeline of the Marvel Universe. At this moment, after Thor returned the Space Stone to Asgard, the Bifrost, which had been destroyed by Thor, had been repaired. That's why he was able to come to Earth smoothly to seek Mark's help. Otherwise, even with the power of Odin, the king of gods, it would be impossible for him to endure the energy consumption of traveling between the two realms in a short period of time. On November 11, 2013, the Convergence, Ether Particles, Dark Elves, and Jane Foster. It seems that Thor is here to discuss an issue regarding Jane, a problem that even Asgard's technology and Odin's wisdom couldn't solve. He must think highly of me to seek my assistance. With a little thought, Mark immediately understood the situation. Thor's concerned expression indicated that he was probably here about his girlfriend. Since you think highly of me and have come to me for help, I won't stand by and do nothing. However, I can't guarantee to solve a problem that even the power of Asgard is incapable of resolving. Mark didn't refuse Thor's request and promptly agreed. On one hand, it was because of their relationship and friendship, and on the other hand, it was an excellent opportunity to have contact with the ether particles, or the reality stone, for research purposes. Upon hearing Mark's immediate agreement, Thor excitedly embraced him, squeezing him so tightly that Mark felt a bit deformed. Fortunately, Mark's body had undergone two virus enhancements and was protected by nanobots, so he didn't end up disabled from the enthusiastic embrace. Mark didn't hesitate to knee Thor in the stomach, forcefully separating the two. Really, you almost choked me to death. It's a good thing I have many means to save my life, otherwise, would end up disabled despite helping you. Mark said, not in the best of spirits, as he looked at Thor innocently clutching his stomach. Ha ha ha, my apologies, Mark. I forgot that earthlings don't have such sturdy bodies. This is how I usually embrace my brothers and comrades. After listening to Mark's words, Thor smiled sheepishly and apologized. However, for some reason, upon hearing Thor's words, Mark felt even more inclined to hit him in the stomach again. Mark, you are the smartest person I have ever met, bar none. Even my father, with his thousands of years of accumulated experience, may be wiser and more knowledgeable, but when it comes to intelligence, I believe he can't compare to you. So I trust that you can help me solve this problem. Since you've already agreed, let's see what preparations we need to make. I'll also brief you on the situation. Later, you'll accompany me back to Asgard. Oh. Go to Asgard? Mark didn't expect Thor to bring him an unexpected joy. Initially, Mark only wanted to have some contact with the ether particles within Jane Foster's body and collect some research data. He didn't anticipate that Thor had already taken Jane to Asgard for treatment and now wanted to bring him along as well. It was truly fantastic news. 
To know that Asgard can be said to be the birthplace of runic script, being able to personally go to Asgard and witness it would greatly benefit Mark's research on runic technology. Not to mention, with Mark's current pair of eyes, it would definitely bring him a wealth of information and become nourishment for his continued progress in his research journey. Later, Thor briefly explained to Mark the tricky problem he encountered, which was roughly the same as Mark's speculation. It involved the convergence of the Nine Realms and the appearance of anomalies in the interconnected nodes of the Nine Realms. As an astrophysicist, Jane naturally wasted no time in investigating and researching this phenomenon. Unexpectedly, she crossed through the anomaly in space and became a host for the long-lost ether particles. Thor, who had been keeping an eye on Jane in Asgard, hurriedly came to Earth upon hearing from Heimdall that Jane was in danger and brought her back to Asgard for treatment. The result they discovered was that the ether particles within Jane continuously consumed the host's life force, growing stronger themselves. Even Asgard, including the mighty Odin, was powerless against it. Thus, Thor, who had no other choice, had a brilliant idea and thought of seeking help from Mark on Earth. He had witnessed Mark's intelligence and wit during the Battle of New York, so he descended to Earth and found Mark to seek assistance. Considering Jane Foster's current condition, Mark quickly made some preparations and brought along some conveniently portable tools to better address the issues at hand. In addition, Mark had Baymax upload an intelligent duplicate to the core of his nanobots within his body so that even after leaving Earth's information network, he could still receive assistance from Baymax. With the preparations complete, Mark followed Thor to the location where he descended in Los Angeles, where he could still see the runic symbols on the ground, symbols that Mark was very familiar with. Then Thor looked up and greeted the sky, and a rainbow beam of light descended, enveloping Thor and Mark within it. A few seconds later, as the Bifrost disappeared, Mark and Thor on the ground also vanished, leaving only a deepened runic symbol imprint, indicating their presence in that location. Enveloped by the powerful energy of the Bifrost, Mark felt himself being reduced to a quantum state, with his own mass approaching zero. His mind and body were highly fused and unified, truly becoming one. In this quantum state, Mark's brain and body were fully liberated. His central nervous system began continuously receiving and processing massive amounts of information vision, without relying on the assistance of nanobots. The information Mark obtained through analysis and processing informed him that the energy channel they were passing through was a massive dark energy construct driven by the Bifrost, constructing a quantum tunnel between Earth and Asgard. Within this quantum tunnel, in their quantum state, they could move at speed surpassing that of light, allowing them to be rapidly transported to distant Asgard in a short period of time. Soon, Mark sensed that the energy maintaining the entire quantum channel was gradually weakening, and the part of the tunnel they had already passed through began to collapse and converge, gradually sealing itself. Finally, the quantum state of Mark and Thor became highly unstable, and they transformed from a pile of quantum information back into solid entities. At this point, they had arrived at their destination for this journey, Asgard. Ah. Uh. Ah. Just as Mark arrived in Asgard, he fell to the ground in pain, his face contorted. Seeing this scene, Thor quickly crouched down and asked about Mark's condition, Mark, what's wrong with you? I, I'm fine. Mark waved his hand, indicating that he was not seriously injured. There were two main reasons for his discomfort. First, Mark was now so far away from Earth that the nanobots inside him could no longer connect to the server cluster he had set up. The overwhelming data had nowhere to go and suddenly flooded into Mark's brain, causing the discomfort he just experienced. The second reason was the unfamiliar environment. In the quantum channel, Mark's brain's information processing speed was infinitely enhanced due to his quantum transformation. This allowed him to handle the information influx in the quantum tunnel with ease. But now that he had arrived on the land of Asgard, the unfamiliar environment meant a large influx of new information. As Mark had already returned to his physical form, he couldn't bear the sudden increase in the flow of information. This was also a major reason for his discomfort. However, Mark adjusted quickly. He had to reluctantly let go of most of the data since relying solely on the nanobots within his body would not meet his computational and analytical needs. He had to make a difficult decision. He instructed the nanobots to filter and retain most of the information, transforming some of the more valuable data into a storable format within his body. As for the remaining information, which couldn't be analyzed and processed in time, it had to be directly destroyed. 
It's worth noting that among these pieces of information, there might have been the truth Mark had been longing for in his research on runic technology. Or perhaps there were runic symbols and applications of dark energy that Mark had never seen before. Regardless of which kind it was, it was enough to make Mark agonize over it. But there was no other way. Sacrifices had to be made, and the retained information undoubtedly held the highest value. If one didn't know how to make the appropriate choices, in the end, they would lose sight of the bigger picture and suffer unnecessary losses. Welcome to Asgard, guest from Midgard, the wise one, said a towering figure in golden armor, stepping forward to welcome Mark after his discomfort had faded and his complexion had returned to normal. Clearly, this golden armored warrior knew of Mark's presence and seemed to hold a favorable attitude towards him. At this moment, Thor introduced Mark, saying, Mark, this is my dear friend, Heimdall. He is the guardian of Asgard, overseeing the realm's gates and the Bifrost that leads to various realms. He is one of the mightiest warriors in the divine realm. He possesses extraordinary hearing and vision, able to perceive almost any obstruction and observe any place within the nine realms. During the Battle of New York, he happened to witness your performance and has been praising you ever since I returned, considering you possibly the most intelligent sage among the nine realms. Hearing Thor's introduction, Mark appeared somewhat surprised. Although he had absolute confidence in his own intelligence, he hadn't expected Heimdall's assessment of him to be so high. For Heimdall, who can oversee the Nine Realms, it was not easy to make such an evaluation. He had seen too many people, and hardly anyone in the Nine Realms could escape his gaze. Even so, he was willing to give Mark such high praise for his intelligence. Although it might not be entirely accurate, it was evident that Mark's wisdom was at least among the top in these Nine Realms. So, despite the initial setback upon arriving in Asgard, hearing such praise instantly lifted Mark's spirits, and a smile appeared on his face. He replied, Oh, no, you're giving me too much credit. I still have a lot of room for improvement. After exchanging a few polite words and expressing mutual appreciation, Thor forcefully pulled Mark along. Thor's main concern was still Jane Foster's condition, and he didn't want to waste a single second. They could have a conversation. After resolving the issue, and at that time, Thor wouldn't stop them. But it wasn't possible at the moment. As Thor dragged Mark along, they arrived in a dimly lit room. In the room, Jane Foster was lying on an illuminated platform, surrounded by Asgardian women dressed in uniform blue robes. They were performing some mysterious operations around Jane, who was in a state of unconsciousness. Mark could deduce that these women held positions in Asgard equivalent to doctors on Earth. They were currently examining Jane's physical condition, but their equipment was far more advanced than holographic scans or magnetic resonance imaging. A quantum field generator. Mark couldn't help but ask when he saw the glowing platform where Jane was located, as it continuously transferred the molecules within her body and restored the information from its quantum state, displaying it in front of these people for viewing and manipulation. Ah. Uh, it's probably something similar. Jane mentioned it just now. But here in Asgard, we call it the Soul Forge. The ether particles have already erupted once. It seems that they protect themselves, so they fiercely counterattack anyone who intends to harm Jane. The medical officers in Asgard are powerless against this, and even my father, Odin, can't find a way to extract the ether particles from her without harming Jane. After saying this, Thor looked up with a hopeful expression, gazing at Mark. Don't worry, I'll do my best to help you solve this problem. But first, I need to thoroughly examine her condition. Mark opened the only carry-on suitcase he brought with him to Asgard this time. Inside the suitcase was a small black metal robot doll, Mark's favorite tool, Magneto. As soon as the suitcase was opened, Magneto jumped out of it. It seemed that it had been pent up inside for too long. It first circled the entire room several times before leaping onto Mark's shoulder, awaiting his master's commands. Mark gently tapped Magneto's head with his finger, as if reprimanding it for its mischievous behavior. Then he raised an eyebrow towards the suitcase, and Magneto immediately understood his thoughts. It leaped down from his shoulder, and its limbs, which were connected by a servo system through a magnetic axis, fell off one by one. It then replaced them with accessory modules equipped with holographic scanning lenses. With the transformation of Magneto complete, it approached Jane and began scanning her body. Although there was a more advanced quantum field generator nearby, on one hand, Mark had no idea how to use that thing. 
On the other hand, the medical officers from Asgard showed no intention of helping him, so Mark ignored them and resorted to his own methods to overcome difficulties. Although he was not as technologically advanced as the other side, regardless of whether it was a big cat or a small cat, the one that catches the mouse is a good cat. Moreover, after Magneto completed the scan, no matter how advanced the technology was, Mark would bring it back to Earth for thorough research. Soon, the data obtained by Magneto's scan was transmitted to the nanobots through a telepathic wave device and then relayed to Mark's visual nerves, displaying the information in front of him. According to the data, Mark analyzed that the reason why the ether were able to counterattack anyone with malicious intent who approached was because it constantly emitted energy pulses. This energy pulse was a kind of information flow that sent its own information to this pulse creator, the Dark Elf Malekith. At the same time, this energy pulse also served as a detection method. It could capture objects with energy fluctuations exceeding a certain range. When it determined a threat, it would instantly unleash the immense energy contained in the reality stone, driving the opponent away. In this way, it was almost impossible to separate the two without alarming the ether or protecting Jane from harm. Moreover, among the six infinity stones, the reality stone was the only one that existed in a liquid state under normal circumstances. The ether, which were at its core, completely inherited this characteristic. Therefore, Mark's idea of capturing it using his nanobots with minimal energy fluctuations within his body was also unachievable. If it's in liquid form, it's really troublesome. It's almost impossible to physically extract the ether. Mark murmured while stroking the stubble on his chin, his brow furrowed in thought. My father said that there are some substances in our universe that existed before the formation of the universe. They are called, the Infinity Stones. The ether are the only ones among them that appear in a liquid state and constantly change. Hearing Mark's self-talk, Thor repeated what Odin had told him to Mark. Wait. Mark suddenly seemed to have remembered something. He widened his eyes and looked up at Thor, lifting his head abruptly. How could I forget about this method? Seeing Mark's joyful expression, Thor quickly placed both hands on his shoulders and eagerly asked, What method? Mark, have you figured out how to separate the ether from Jane? Well, Mark nodded in response to Thor. When I was looking at the collected data of the ether just now, I kept feeling familiar with the energy fluctuations it emitted, but I couldn't remember where I had seen it before. After what you just said, it reminded me that its energy fluctuations are exactly the same as Loki's scepter, and the tesseract. In other words, the ether, the gem on Loki's scepter, and the tesseract are all infinity stones. That's right, I can confirm that. My father also told me the same. But how does this relate to helping separate the ether from Jane's body? Thor still couldn't understand and asked with confusion. Do you remember how I passed through the energy barrier formed by the Tesseract on the rooftop of Stark Tower and closed the portal? Mark asked. Of course, it was through Loki's, Thor paused halfway and stared at Mark with wide eyes. Are you saying? Through the Tesseract, another infinity stone, there might be a way to safely separate the two. That's right, the energy fluctuations among the infinity stones are the same, and they seem to possess a kind of mutual attraction. So, we can use the power of another infinity stone as bait to lure the ether out of Jane's body safely. One important prerequisite for this plan has already been fulfilled, the Tesseract is currently in Asgard. There's also another crucial point, I need to determine the optimal energy wavelength that can generate a strong enough attraction to the ether. However, before that, you need to convince your father to lend me the Tesseract. Although Mark didn't know how Thor managed to do it, the result was that he eventually returned with the Tesseract in front of Mark. Mark didn't question Thor, he just asked him to take Jane, who had already woken up, to see Asgard. While he began his research on using the energy of the Tesseract to separate the ether. Coming into contact with the Tesseract once again, Mark felt both joy and sentiment. Being able to study it up close like this would likely lead to substantial breakthroughs in his research on the space portal once he returned to Earth. But he did not focus too much on exploring the secret of space, after all, Jane's life was still threatened by the ether. Since Mark had promised Thor to help solve this problem, he had to fulfill his commitment. As for adjusting the energy wave frequency of the Tesseract, Asgard had a complete set of mature application technologies that Mark could utilize. Now he just needed to determine the corresponding frequency range, and the plan would already be half complete. However, for Mark at this moment, 
this task was not easy. The main ability required for determining the wave frequency was computational power, and Mark's brain's computing capacity was significantly limited. He didn't even dare to easily activate the accelerated world for fear of suddenly losing consciousness. With less computational power, Mark needed to be more precise and careful in his calculations. Through his mathematical abilities, he aimed to narrow down the range of this frequency band as much as possible, thus reducing the computational demands. Living up to his reputation as the most powerful genius, as praised by Heimdall, Mark did not disappoint. Just as Thor and Jane were strolling in the palace gardens, planning to share a French kiss in this romantic setting, the magical stone on Thor's person began to shake. It was the stone he carried to communicate with Mark. Thor took it out, and a message was projected on it, displaying, results are in, plan confirmed, return immediately. Well, it seemed to be good news. Initially he was annoyed by the interruption of his kiss with Jane, Thor shrugged his shoulders and quickly led her back to Mark. Mark, you're moving so quickly. How long has it been since you obtained the Tesseract, and you've already perfected the plan? Can you be sure it won't harm Jane's body? Thor tightly held Jane's hand and asked Mark. Rest assured, my calculations have never been flawed. Otherwise, you wouldn't see me standing here so intact. However, as I am a male, it's not convenient for me to carry out this treatment plan. It would be best if you find a trusted woman to execute this plan. I will guide her through remote voice communication. All right, time is of the essence. I will request my mother to personally carry out this task. She is one of the people I trust the most. I believe that with her executing this plan, Jane will be able to recover safely and regain her health. Queen Frigga was very open-minded and treated Thor and Jane's relationship with warmth. Unlike Odin, she didn't hold any airs of being a queen and was gentle and kind towards Jane. Coupled with her love for her son Thor, when he made this request, Frigga didn't hesitate and immediately agreed. Your Highness, I have already set up the activation device for the Tesseract. When the time comes, you just need to activate it, and the energy fluctuations it emits will attract the ether inside Jane's body. Under this temptation, the ether will eventually leave Jane's body on their own and gravitate towards the Tesseract. Your task is to seal them in this container after the ether appears, to prevent it from inhabiting Jane's body again. Outside Frigga's chamber, Mark was explaining the detailed operational process of the entire treatment plan to her, giving her instructions on essential key steps. After that, everything had to be carried out by Frigga herself. Mark could only answer her questions through the communication stone, as he couldn't be physically present to assist her. Frigga carefully noted down the key points Mark described and repeated them to verify accuracy. Once everything was confirmed to be correct, she entered the chamber to begin treating Jane. At this moment, Jane was wearing a pristine white gown in the style of Asgard and had already been put under a sleep spell by Frigga. She lay quietly on the bed. Frigga approached the bed and gently stroked Jane's face. Poor child, even though you and Thor love each other so much, your feelings will eventually be hindered by time. But I still want to bless you both and thank you for teaching Thor what love is and how to love. I will make sure you recover safely and return to normal. After saying that, Frigga stood up and went to the device where the Tesseract was placed. She mobilized her own magical power and activated the device. In an instant, the Tesseract emitted dazzling brilliance, casting a blue halo throughout the room. Sensing the energy fluctuations unleashed by the Tesseract, the ether within Jane's body seemed to stir. Under their influence, Jane's entire body was completely levitated. Witnessing this scene, Frigga felt a sense of certainty. If the ether were reacting, it meant that the plan devised by Midgard's genius friend of Thor's was flawless. Now she had to wait for the ether to leave Jane's body and then seal them. Everything would then be successfully accomplished. However, at that moment, a loud noise resounded in Asgard, accompanied by strong vibrations. Even Frigga, located in the central position of Asgard where her chamber was, felt the tremors coming from the ground. Sensing that something was amiss, Frigga quickly contacted Thor through the magical stone. Thor, what is happening in the realm? Mother, enemies have invaded the realm with a large fleet. I am currently trapped by the intruders. Please ensure your own safety and protect Jane. I will quickly deal with the enemies and come to you. Magneto, find a vantage point. I need a broad, panoramic view. Zoom. 
Magneto spun around at Mark's feet and then rushed out of the room towards the high point of Asgard, the palace of the gods. In the instant the loud noise reached his ears, Mark knew exactly what had happened. The Dark Elves, who had been dormant for thousands of years, had invaded Asgard and launched another war. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Mark immediately dispatched Magneto to the high point of Asgard to gain the widest view and the most comprehensive information. Soon, the visual information obtained by Magneto through holographic and optical lenses was transmitted to Mark's eyes through the wireless communication network constructed by the nanobots inside his body. At the outer periphery of Asgard's airspace, there was a massive mothership of a space battleship, accompanied by at least hundreds of micro-sized warships attempting to invade the central palace, by breaking through the layered defenses of Asgard. These micro-sized warships resembled daggers, small in size, agile in movement, and equipped with formidable energy weapons. Although Asgard's defense network was strong like the one in Wakanda, long-term defense would eventually lead to defeat. The enemy broke through in large numbers and approached the location of the palace. Seeing the approaching enemy and their own precarious situation, Heimdall, in order to protect the core of Asgard, the palace where the Allfather Odin resided, decisively activated the energy shield of the palace, attempting to keep the enemy outside. After the energy shield was activated, its effect was indeed impressive. It quickly closed, enveloping the palace in protection. When the enemy ships collided with the shield, they either exploded and crashed or had no other outcome. As for the few ships that managed to change direction in time or passed through before the energy shield closed, they were quickly eliminated by Asgard's defense forces due to their limited number. Mark was very envious of Asgard's energy shield technology. Although he could also achieve the function of an energy shield using the electrical energy output from the arc reactor, its energy density, scale, and defensive capabilities could not compare to Asgard's protective artifact. The key to the strength of this shield lay in the fact that it was created using runic technology and its energy source came from the nearly limitless dark energy in the universe. The shield's ability to absorb and supply energy allowed it to maintain a high-density energy level for a long time, resisting powerful impacts. However, the strongest defense is often undermined from within, and the energy shield of Asgard was no exception. Just as the shield was about to reach its peak and fully close, it suddenly lost power and began to gradually fade away. Mark knew that this was the work of the curse warriors the Dark Elves had dispatched into Asgard's interior. They had sabotaged the control core of the energy shield, completely rendering this defense measure ineffective. At this moment, a warship seized the opportunity, broke through all defenses, smashed through the walls of the central palace, and entered the central hub. If I'm not mistaken, the leader of the Dark Elves, Melkith, is on that warship. Now is not the time to hold back. I must quickly go to Queen Frigga's chamber. The treatment for Jane was already halfway through, and it couldn't be stopped. If Melkith were to intrude at this moment, things might develop in the worst possible direction. Jane and Frigga would both lose their lives at his hands, and the ether would be taken back by him. In that case, Thor would undoubtedly be devastated. Once Melkith obtained the ether, the level of difficulty in dealing with him would escalate once again, and it wouldn't just threaten Asgard anymore. After all, the Dark Elves' goal was to plunge the entire universe back into darkness. For Earth, which relied on the sun for almost all vital energy, this would undoubtedly be a catastrophic disaster. Thinking of this, Mark dared not delay. He had to prevent Melkith from obtaining the ether. Otherwise, Earth would fall into a tremendous crisis, and it was uncertain whether Thor could stop this crisis in time. Activating the superconductive magnetic levitation module, under the influence of a special force field, Mark's own gravity was relatively neutralized, allowing him to float in mid-air with a gentle leap. Then, the nanobots within Mark's body became visible, assembling and combining to form a set of energy thrusters. Buzz, swoosh! Then, with the sound of wind, Mark disappeared from his original position, heading towards Frigga's chamber. Meanwhile, inside her own chamber, Frigga was sweating profusely as she manipulated the tesseract. Due to the unexpected events in the realm, Frigga sensed a hint of danger. To ensure the smooth success of the treatment, she had to speed up and extract the ether from Jane's body as soon as possible. To do so, she spared no effort in depleting her stored magical energy, intensifying the stimulation of the tesseract, hoping to increase the attraction between the tesseract and the ether. Her approach indeed achieved success. 
Although her magical energy was on the verge of depletion, the ether inside Jane's body had already emerged and was about to completely separate. Frigga couldn't afford to be complacent. Because even a small misstep at this moment could cause all the efforts in this entire process to go in vain. And if her magical energy was depleted, she wouldn't be able to provide further treatment for Jane in the short term. Her eyes fixed tightly on the ether about to leave Jane's body, while simultaneously diverting her attention to the activation device of the Tesseract. Additionally, she reached out her left hand, picking up the container used to seal the ether. Success was within sight. Frigga steadily picked up the sealing container and approached the completely separated ether from Jane's body. Before it could react, she directly placed it into the container, completing the sealing process. Phew! Seeing everything settled, Frigga let out a long breath. After gently placing down the container, she wiped the sweat from her forehead. Looking at Jane, who was still lying on the bed and hadn't woken up yet, her complexion had regained a hint of rosy color. It was estimated that within a few days, her own restorative abilities would completely eliminate the negative effects caused by the ether. However, just as Frigga relaxed and before she could catch her breath and restore her own magical power, the doors of the chamber were forcefully blasted open. Bang! The enormous doors shattered, and in front of Frigga appeared a masked warrior even taller and more robust than Thor. Beside him was a lean and pale-faced man. Stand back, monsters! I will not spare your lives, Frigga's reaction was swift. Upon sensing the hostility of the intruders, she immediately placed the container with the sealed ether into her pocket. Since her magical power had been depleted while separating the ether from Jane, she could only draw the short sword from her waist, hoping to intimidate the two individuals before her. I have been very lucky, woman, but Frigga's threats had no effect on Malekith. As the leader of the Dark Elves, who once dominated the battlefields and forced the other nine realms to unite against him, how could he fear the threat of a seemingly weak woman? Who are you? Why have you invaded my chamber? Seeing that the enemies not only showed no signs of retreating but also arrogantly closed the distance between them, Frigga remained composed. She firmly grasped the sword with her arm, her feet moved, protecting Jane behind her while ensuring that the enemies remained in front, avoiding being vulnerable from any direction. At the same time, Frigga attempted to gather more information about the enemies through conversation. She had no prior knowledge of the opponents she faced. The appearances of these two individuals were different from any race in the Nine Realms, and their appearances were vastly dissimilar as well. However, Frigga managed to gather some useful information. Based on their pointed ears, she determined that both individuals belonged to a branch of the Elven race. I am Malekith, the leader of the Dark Elves. I have come to reclaim something that belongs to me. Now, you had better return what you just put away to me, which. Frigga's hidden intentions couldn't escape Malekith, who had experienced countless years. But he didn't mind revealing his identity since the return of the Dark Elves to the world would be announced sooner or later. So even if he told Frigga his name now, it didn't matter. You can forget about that. Frigga was well aware of the danger of the ether. She couldn't possibly hand over such a dangerous weapon to someone who could threaten the safety of the Nine Realms. Knowing that there was no room for reconciliation, Frigga gave her final answer and decided to strike first. Raising her sword high, she charged directly at Malekith. Swish! The sharp sword light illuminated Malekith's face, and the powerful gust caused by the sword's blade tearing through the air stung the cheeks. This sudden and swift strike narrowly missed Malekith's chest. But relying on years of experience gained from the battlefield and a keen sense of danger, Malekith narrowly avoided that nearly fatal strike. After evading Frigga's attack, Malekith quickly stepped back, his gaze filled with fear rather than the initial contempt for the woman who posed no threat to his life. Although Malekith retreated, Frigga couldn't allow him a moment to catch his breath. She now faced two formidable enemies, and if they found an opportunity to attack her together, she would have almost no chance of turning the tables. Frigga took several big steps forward, continuously executing sword techniques of hacking and thrusting, forcing Malekith to barely defend himself. Nonetheless, he still sustained some injuries, deep sword marks on his arms and body, demonstrating Frigga's formidable strength. One could truly say that she was a woman befitting a queen. She excelled not only in domestic affairs and raising children but also in horseback riding and warfare. 
To become the goddess and queen whom all of Asgard respected and admired, it took more than just personal charisma, she had to possess genuine skills and abilities. However, after her attack failed to yield results, Frigga ceased her offensive. While she had cornered Melkith, their continuous retreat had allowed the two enemies to converge. If she continued pursuing them, she would face the danger of being surrounded on both sides, risking not only her own life but also the possibility of the ether being taken by the enemy, leading to even greater crises. Seeing that Frigga had stopped her assault, Melkith would not easily let her go. Now that he had the upper hand, he needed to swiftly resolve the battle and seize the ether. Otherwise, if Odin or other Asgardian soldiers arrived, his plan might be thwarted, and he would lose the opportunity to reclaim the ether. Through the recent confrontation, Melkith had also observed that Frigga had intentionally positioned herself between him, the other man, and the woman on the bed. It was clear that she had reservations about protecting the other woman's safety. Since that was the case, he had to exploit this weakness. Melkith exchanged a glance with the cursed warrior beside him, indicating the direction towards Jane. The cursed warrior immediately understood his intention, nodded, and bypassed Frigga, heading straight for Jane's location. Meanwhile, Melkith continued to engage Frigga, keeping her too occupied to focus on anything else. Stop! As expected, after Melkith and his companion made their move, Frigga's expression immediately turned chaotic as she tried to prevent the cursed warrior from approaching Jane. But Melkith would not allow her to succeed. Seeing the cursed warrior drawing near Jane, Frigga grew increasingly anxious but had no means to stop him. However, at that moment, as if by a twist of fate, a vulnerability suddenly appeared in Melkith's attack. Frigga, who was desperately eager, wouldn't miss such an opportunity. With a horizontal sweep of her sword, she created distance between herself and Melkith, swiftly lunging behind the cursed warrior, intending to prevent him from harming Jane. However, in the instant she arrived beside the cursed warrior, his hand that had been reaching for Jane suddenly clenched into a fist and changed its trajectory, striking Frigga's abdomen. Bang! Frigga, completely unable to defend herself, was sent flying by the force of the punch, crashing into the wall of the chamber before coming to a stop. Pooh! As a result of the blow, Frigga couldn't help but spit out a mouthful of blood. Her right hand, which had tightly gripped the sword hilt, now trembled, and she appeared utterly weakened. As it turned out, the opening Melkith revealed earlier was nothing more than a deliberately set trap, designed to lure Frigga into it. The cursed warrior's target from the beginning had been Frigga herself, not Jane Foster. After Frigga completely fell into their scheme, the cursed warrior immediately redirected his attack, resulting in a heavy punch just now. Seeing Frigga, who could only support herself against the wall, Melkith's face revealed a cold smile. Now it's my turn to speak. Surrender the ether you have on you, and I may spare your life. Otherwise, I'll have to take what I want from your lifeless body. I'll say it again, you can forget about that. Frigga knew that even if she staked her own life, she could not hand over the ether to him for the sake of the safety of the Nine Realms. Just as Frigga made up her mind to use the Tesseract to transfer the ether and sacrifice herself along with the two opponents, a figure suddenly rushed into the chamber at an extremely high speed. Frigga only had time to catch a glimpse of a blur before a loud explosion sounded in her ears. She saw that the spot where Melkith and the cursed warrior had been standing was now empty. Then, she heard a familiar voice beside her. Apologies for being late, your highness. The person was none other than Mark, who had rushed here as quickly as possible. He had spotted Melkith preparing to harm Frigga from a distance and, while accelerating towards them, controlled the nanobots within his body to form two floating cannon bodies, launching an attack against Melkith and the cursed warrior. Although Frigga had been seriously injured, Mark arrived just in time, preventing the tragedy from unfolding. Your Highness, stay by Jane's side and wait for me. Once I subdue those two, I'll help you recover from your injuries. After saying that, Mark walked towards Melkith and the cursed warrior, who had been blasted into the wall by his earlier attack. As he took a few steps forward, before Mark could approach the two, a massive chunk of stone suddenly flew out from the wall, aiming directly at his head. Mark quickly reacted and raised his hand to block the incoming stone. Bang! The enormous stone collided with Mark's arm but shattered into pieces without causing any harm. The dust generated from the shattered stone obstructed Mark's vision. 
he immediately activated the holographic interface of his nanobots to enhance his visual perception. In Mark's holographic sight, the two individuals who had emerged from the wall did not seize the opportunity to launch a surprise attack on him. Instead, they approached the activation device of the Tesseract. Before Mark could fully comprehend their intentions, Melkith and the Cursed Warrior, together with the Tesseract, leaped from the terrace of the chamber and escaped. If you want to retrieve your Tesseract, bring the Aether to the Dark World and find me there. Watching Melkith and the Cursed Warrior board their ship and fly away from Asgard, Mark felt that things were unfolding in a direction he couldn't predict. Mother. Frigga. After Melkith and the Cursed Warriors left, Thor and Odin also arrived one after another. Seeing Frigga sitting on the edge of the bed, pale-faced, both of them couldn't help but exclaim. I'm fine, thanks to Thor's friends who arrived in time and scared off the two intruders, Frigga weakly waved her hand at the two of them and forced out a smile, reassuring the father and son not to panic. In fact, Frigga's injuries were indeed severe. Although they didn't reach a life-threatening level at the moment, if these serious internal injuries were left untreated for too long, they would leave incurable sequelae and could even cost her life. Odin had led the armies of Asgard to battle in the Nine Realms and was very familiar with such injuries. How could he believe Frigga's words, spoken to comfort them? Odin walked to Frigga's side, half knelt on the ground, held her hand, and looked at Frigga with gentle eyes. My queen, it is because of your unwavering love for me over these years that I am able to turn bad luck into good fortune when facing all difficulties and challenges. Now it's my turn to accompany you through this ordeal. Odin Hearing her husband's concern and confession, Frigga felt touched in her heart and gained more confidence in her recovery. She would continue to be Odin's lucky goddess and protect him. Your Majesty Odin, Queen Frigga, in fact, if you believe me, I can restore Queen Frigga's injuries in a short time, without leaving any sequelae, Mark spoke up at this moment. Really, Mark? Do you really have a way to restore my mother's health? Before Odin could speak, Thor eagerly approached Mark and asked. At the same time, upon hearing Mark say that he could treat Frigga, Odin also turned his gaze to him. Mark nodded, indicating that he indeed had confidence, in the past few days, in order to separate Jane from the ether particles safely, I have been communicating and exchanging with the medical officers of Asgard, and I have a rough idea of Asgard's medical level. You normally maintain your health and stimulate the recovery of injuries through the magic stored in your bodies. So, although your technology is highly advanced in the military field, it can be said that your level in the medical field is very backward. And now, Queen Frigga has depleted her magical power, unable to promote the healing of her injuries. At the same time, due to the severe internal injuries, she cannot draw upon the dark energy, which is magic, from the universe. This creates a vicious cycle. However, I can send nanobots into Queen Frigga's body and release nutrient fluid at the injured areas to facilitate rapid recovery. Once the injuries are healed, the magical power in her body will slowly replenish, and the restoration of magical power will further accelerate the healing process. In the end, it will probably only take a few minutes for her to regain her health. While listening to Mark's analysis, Odin occasionally nodded approvingly and stroked his beard, seemingly pondering something. Finally, under Thor's hopeful gaze, Odin turned to Frigga and asked, My queen, are you willing to let Mark treat you? Of course, Mark is my savior, and I believe he can fulfill his words. But if the final result is not as expected, I hope you won't blame Mark for it. Perhaps it is destined for me to face this ordeal. Don't worry. Odin gently rubbed Frigga's hand and then looked at Mark, saying, you can proceed boldly. Regardless of the outcome, I will be grateful for your assistance and consider you our most honored guest in Asgard. You can rest assured. In my life so far, I have not experienced a single failure, and I believe it will not appear in my life dictionary in the future. After speaking, Mark looked at Thor and said, Do you remember the little gift I gave you when I sent you away after the battle in New York? Upon hearing Mark's question, Thor suddenly remembered something and fumbled around his waist, then took out a small transparent vial about the size of a little finger, containing some blue transparent liquid, which looked quite beautiful. Is this it? I have been carrying it with me, but I almost forgot about it if you hadn't mentioned it. It seems you said that after injecting this powerful serum and combining it with my lightning, it can help heal most injuries for the patient. Yes, this is a concentrated special nutrient fluid. With sufficient energy stimulation, it can instantly restore the injuries of the wounded. 
even if the injuries are severe, they can at least recover to about 80 to 90 percent. Of course, directly using the lightning energy to activate it is a last resort in special circumstances and cannot fully unleash the effectiveness of the nutrient fluid. However, if my nanobots carry the nutrient fluid to the injured areas inside Princess Frigga and then activate it, this small amount of nutrient fluid will be completely sufficient to restore her injuries. That's great. I didn't expect this gift you gave me to really come in handy one day. Mark, go ahead and do it quickly. I trust your abilities. Mark gave Thor a confident look, indicating that he could be assured, and then released the nanobots inside him, carrying the concentrated special nutrient fluid into Frigga's body. In less than three seconds, Frigga's complexion visibly became rosy, and Odin could feel the flow of magic in the air, indicating that Frigga's body had started to autonomously absorb external magic. It was a good sign. As time passed, Frigga became more and more spirited, not like the brilliance released by the dying embers of life, but a genuine change brought about by her restored health. All right, the treatment is complete. Queen Frigga's body is no longer in danger. Thank you for saving my queen, Mark. As Frigga's husband, I offer you my sincerest gratitude, and as the king of Asgard, I extend my highest respect to you. Looking at the now healthy Frigga, Odin couldn't hide his joy on his face. He even stood up directly and performed the highest ritual of Asgard to Mark. Although Mark didn't know the meaning behind this gesture, he could sense the solemnity in Odin's words. He quickly waved his hand and said, You are too kind. I cannot bear such honor. Since Thor and I are comrades and friends, this is what I should do. Please don't overestimate me. Queen Frigga has just recovered, and Jane's condition also seems to have returned to health. I believe there are many things you want to say to each other. I will go back to my guest room first. If you need any information or have any questions about the attack incident, just have someone find me. With that, without waiting for Odin and Thor to respond, Mark left Frigga's chamber. And the reason he was in such a hurry to leave was not only because he was genuinely uncomfortable with Odin and Thor's gratitude, but also for an important reason. In fact, after completing Frigga's treatment, the nanobots that entered her body did not return to Mark's body. At this moment, these robots were concentrated in an empty bottle, which was the syringe bottle that previously contained the concentrated nutrient fluid. As the nanobots inside it spun rapidly, some thick red liquid appeared inside the bottle. Sorry, Thor. I collected a blood sample from your mother without her consent. But let's consider it as a small reward for helping her recover. If my research makes progress in the future, I will not forget the contribution you have made. Looking at the blood vial in his hand, Mark murmured to himself. After leaving Frigga's chamber and returning to the guest room arranged by Thor, Mark found that Magneto, who had been sent out earlier to occupy the high ground and gather information about the overall battle situation, had returned to the room from the central palace of Asgard. This mischievous little creature had promptly abandoned the task assigned to it by Mark once it judged that the enemy had started to retreat. Instead, it entered the central palace to meticulously scan and record the parameters and models of the Dark Elf mini warships that had penetrated inside. It seems that the mirror perception I developed through the Mind Stone is quite effective. Now you even know how to flatter me. Knowing about Magneto's actions, Mark could only shake his head helplessly. However, it was good news for him as well. Although the Dark Elves' various technologies were products developed thousands of years ago, they should have been outdated compared to the continuously evolving arsenal of Asgard's military weapons. But the information revealed by today's sudden attack was not like that. The Dark Elves' equipment from thousands of years ago not only didn't fall behind the Asgardian military in any way when compared, but they even slightly outperformed them in various aspects. Especially the stealth capabilities of their ships, which surpassed the reflection plate technology used by S.H.I.E.L.D. The elusive nature of their ships added more threats. However, Mark wasn't surprised by this. After all, the Dark Elves' various technologies were derived from the study of ether. It was with these technologies that the Dark Elves were able to create a bloodbath thousands of years ago, causing the Nine Realms to tremble in fear, forcing them to unite and fight together. Moreover, apart from that, it seemed that Magneto had brought him a little gift. Looking at the item that resembled a hand grenade, with its short limbs tightly clasped around it, Mark's face also showed a look of surprise. If his estimation was correct, this thing was the most fearsome weapon among all the Dark Elves' equipment, 
a black hole grenade. Unlike classic grenades on Earth, the power of a black hole grenade came from the fact that, upon detonation, it could create a miniature black hole near the target, devouring everything around it. Everything near the black hole would be irresistibly drawn into it by its incredibly strong gravitational force, unable to escape, and ultimately completely absorbed. What was even more dangerous and lethal was not the black hole grenade's ability to devour everything upon detonation, but the fact that the miniature black hole it formed would slow down the flow of time in its vicinity. Once a target was within the range of a black hole grenade, there was virtually no chance of survival or escape. Moreover, the entire process produced no harmful substances, and there was no bloodshed or explosive damage left after detonation. It could be said to be very environmentally friendly, the perfect companion for home or travel when it came to eliminating someone. Mark carefully accepted the grenade from Magneto, preparing to conduct research on it. Mark's interest wasn't just in the immense power of the black hole grenade, but also in the desire to explore the technology of artificially creating black holes. This was because black holes, as one of the most mysterious celestial bodies in the universe, offered very limited opportunities for human research and experimentation. Once Mark mastered the technology of creating artificial black holes, the study of black holes would become possible. What's even more important is that black hole research holds great benefits for Mark's breakthrough in spatial teleportation. Perhaps this could be the breakthrough point for his research. Of course, it was impossible for Mark to dismantle and study the black hole grenade. If he accidentally triggered the device and created a miniature black hole, even with the tremendous regenerative power brought about by his extremist transformation, he would have no chance of escaping. Magneto, send the scan results to me. Don't tell me that you haven't finished this task after such a long time. Sure enough, as soon as Mark finished speaking, a holographic scan forming a three-dimensional model appeared in Mark's visual system. Then, Mark immediately noticed the core key of this grenade, antimatter. Indeed, after carefully identifying the substances in the detonation core of the grenade, Mark confirmed that they were all antimatter. In other words, if Mark had just dismantled the entire grenade, he might have been reduced to ashes, scattered in the tremendous energy of antimatter annihilation. Seeing the antimatter in the detonation core of the black hole grenade, Mark also had an answer regarding its underlying principle. The Dark Elves seemed to have used the power of ether to convert regular matter into antimatter. When the grenade was detonated, a large amount of antimatter would annihilate, and the immense energy produced would be compressed within the compact and sturdy casing, resulting in an unstable miniature black hole. After losing the ether, the Dark Elves were also very conservative with these non-renewable weapon resources. Throughout their invasion of Asgard, they probably used no more than ten of these grenades, but each one played an important role in helping Melkith swiftly bypass the defense of the palace guards and reach Frigga's chamber. If it weren't for Mark's interference in the end, their plan might have succeeded. However, for Mark, who had already mastered the preparation of antimatter, even without ether, he could create black hole grenades. By using extremely durable carbide materials as the casing, all the necessary conditions would be met. This time, he not only obtained technological intelligence from the Dark Elves, Frigga's blood, but also found a new application for antimatter. It could be said that Mark's trip to Asgard was quite fruitful. The core of the palace's energy shield has been damaged and cannot be repaired in a short period of time. The defense facilities have also suffered significant damage in this confrontation and require manpower and resources for repairs. Moreover, through this confrontation, it has exposed the inadequacy of Asgard's military capabilities, as their weapons performance falls behind that of the Dark Elves. What's more, the Tesseract has been taken by Melkith. The Tesseract is the key to opening the door to any location in the universe. Once the Dark Elves successfully master its use, they can appear at any location they choose to launch an attack. Coupled with their excellent stealth capabilities on their warships, it can be said that once such a surprise attack occurs, the success rate is nearly 100%. If Asgard cannot hold on to the Aether and allows the Dark Elves to gather both the Tesseract and the Aether, then the fate of Asgard and even the Nine Realms is unimaginable. Your Majesty, currently our defense facilities cannot be repaired quickly, and Heimdall's supersenses cannot locate the enemy's whereabouts. Furthermore, the enemy has taken the Tesseract. They are in the dark, while we are in the light. It can be said that we have lost all defensive capabilities. In the central hall of the palace, Odin gathered the generals and staff of Asgard, 
reporting the losses caused by the Dark Elves' sudden attack and discussing how to deal with the threats they pose. The hall still bore the remnants of the battle between the two sides, with the most conspicuous being the destroyed Allfather's throne, destroyed by Melkith himself. Thus, Odin could only stand in front of the hall with the others during this meeting. Odin furrowed his brow. Based on the information he received so far, Asgard's situation was not optimistic. Although the Dark Elves failed to obtain the Gether, in this operation, they managed to take the Tesseract. Now, the competition between the two sides is not only about the strength of their weapons and armed personnel but also about their research capabilities. Once the Dark Elves decipher the usage of the Tesseract before Asgard does, then Asgard will be in a passive position. However, if they can research the utilization of the Aether ahead of the Dark Elves, the situation will be completely reversed. They can use the network of connections established between the Aether and the Dark Elves to trace their whereabouts and launch precise remote attacks using the Bifrost. As Odin was lost in his thoughts, a messenger entered the hall, kneeling before Odin and reporting, Your Majesty, the person you asked us to bring have been waiting outside. Oh! Upon hearing this news, Odin's eyebrows raised, revealing a hint of delight. He then earnestly asked the person before him, You haven't treated him disrespectfully, have you? He is a distinguished guest of Asgard and has saved my queen's life. Rest assured, your majesty. Lord Mark has rendered great services to Asgard, and the soldiers hold him in high regard. Moreover, you previously ordered us to treat him with utmost respect, and we have followed your instructions and not done anything out of line. Very well then, bring him in now. As you command, your majesty. Hearing that Odin had invited Thor's friend from Midgard to participate in their internal war meeting, the people in the hall couldn't help but feel curious. Currently, those standing beside Odin were either high-ranking military generals who had achieved great feats for Asgard or individuals of significant influence, including the Warriors Three, who were friends of Thor. However, Heimdall was absent due to his duty of guarding the gates of Asgard and keeping watch for any enemy attacks. Thor was also absent as he had to take care of the recovering Frigga and Jane Foster. Nonetheless, it was indeed perplexing to have Mark present at such an internal meeting. Odin, seeing through everyone's thoughts, directly addressed them and explained, don't underestimate Thor's friend from Midgard. His willingness to come here without seeking any rewards just to help Thor, as requested by him, demonstrates that he is a noble and loyal individual. And he has solved the problems of both Jane Foster and Frigga, which proves his intelligence and strength. Moreover, Heimdall even called him the most powerful sage in the Nine Realms. It can be said that if the people of Midgard thousands of years ago worshipped us as gods, then he, as a mortal, is capable of standing shoulder to shoulder with the gods. After you meet him later, you will understand that our praises and Heimdall's evaluation of him are not empty words. Do not leave a rude and arrogant impression in front of our guest. Understood? Yes. Hearing that even their Allfather Odin had given him such a high evaluation, everyone dared not underestimate him any longer and responded solemnly. Soon, Mark, led by the guards, arrived in front of Odin and the Asgardian generals. In the eyes of the Asgardians, although Mark was tall, even taller than Thor by a fair margin, his muscle definition was not prominent, making him appear somewhat slender. This image was evidently not the preferred type among them. For them, regardless of height, the most important thing was to have a strong physique with well-developed muscles. After all, why would Asgard, with its advanced civilization, still prefer to use cold weapons? It was because they pursued this primitive and wild beauty. However, they also understood that since Heimdall referred to Mark as the most powerful sage, it meant that his strength lay not in combat ability but in his intellect. Coupled with Odin's instructions just now, their behavior remained within the bounds of propriety. However, judging Mark's combat ability based solely on his appearance would be a misjudgment. Just like when Melkith first saw Frigga and underestimated her due to her delicate appearance, he ended up being beaten by her, teaching him not to judge others based on their appearance. Through the enhancement of every cell in his body using nanobots and virus modification, the strength of each cell in Mark's seemingly slender body could not be judged by conventional standards. The energy contained within him was absolutely astonishing. Although it might not compare to the mighty physique of the Asgardian warriors, which was forged over thousands of years and nurtured by magic, it was by no means as weak as it appeared on the surface. In addition to Mark's terrifying ability to generate temperatures over 3,000 degrees Celsius, 
his exceptional healing ability, the combat assistance provided by nanobots, and a variety of advanced high-tech weapons, it can be said that even in the face of the god of thunder, Thor, Mark could battle him and come out unscathed. Your Majesty Odin, may I ask what instructions you have for summoning me here? Upon arriving before the hall, Mark first performed a 90-degree bow to express his respect to Odin before inquiring about his purpose. Mark, in fact, I summoned you here because I hope to leverage your intelligence to unravel the mysteries of the ether. Please allow me to explain further, seeing the puzzled expression on Mark's face, Odin smiled slightly, speaking kindly like a gentle old man, I know you must be curious. Undoubtedly, Asgard civilization is more advanced than Midgard, which is your Earth civilization. Given that, why would I still seek your help? I believe this is the point of confusion for you and the others present here. In fact, from our recent battle with the Dark Elves, I believe you all have realized that despite thousands of years of development, our technological power has still not surpassed that of the stagnant Dark Elves. In my opinion, it is because Asgard, as the strongest among the Nine Realms for a long time, has been arrogant, suppressing our innovative capabilities to a great extent. Or rather, this unhealthy and previously unnoticed mentality has deprived us of the drive to further advance. However, Earth's civilization is different. Earth has always been the most backward and weakest existence among the Nine Realms. But precisely because of this sense of crisis brought about by its weakness, Earth has continuously and rapidly developed at a speed unimaginable by the other Nine Realms. Based on my observations and understanding of Earth, its scientific and technological level has been exponentially advancing for thousands of years. Based on this trend, Earth will soon enter an era of technological explosion. In perhaps less than 200 years, Midgard might surpass Asgard in technology. And you, Mark, as one of the most outstanding individuals of this era on Earth and recognized by Heimdall as possessing the most powerful mind in the Nine Realms, your intellect is undoubtedly a formidable weapon. Perhaps others haven't noticed, but as an old man who has dealt with magic for thousands of years, I can sense the presence of runic magic in you, what? Hearing Odin mention the presence of runic magic in Mark, those nearby couldn't help but exclaim in disbelief. It should be noted that although Asgardians are born with the ability to sense the existence of magic and incorporate it into their bodies to strengthen themselves, the usage of runic magic is a much more profound and personalized approach. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Among the Asgardians, there are very few who can utilize it, which is why most warriors enhance their strength by continuously strengthening their physical bodies. It's not that they don't want to have such abilities, it's simply that they lack the talent for it. Otherwise, if everyone could summon lightning like Thor, would there be any meaning in appointing a god of thunder? For Odin to see through a secret in himself, Mark was also somewhat surprised. However, considering the other party's exceptional strength and vast experience, it seemed reasonable. But this did serve as a wake-up call for Mark. After returning this time, he must add a module to the nanobots that can conceal his energy fluctuations and biological characteristics. Otherwise, if his information and trump cards were inadvertently speculated or revealed by the enemy, it would put him in a dangerous situation. After all, in many cases, the battle between two sides relies on the ability to gather and analyze information about the enemy. It is necessary to maintain a sense of mystery. However, since Odin had already exposed the secret of runic magic in him, Mark wouldn't try to hide it. He openly admitted, that's right, I can indeed utilize runic symbols to achieve some minor functions. But compared to the mages and witches of Asgard, it's nothing impressive. Seeing Mark so candidly admitting this, a satisfied smile appeared on Odin's face. Recognizing this expression, Mark immediately understood that Odin had just been testing him. Perhaps Odin did sense the presence of runic magic in Mark, but due to its faintness and limited interactions between the two, he couldn't be certain. Odin had played the gentle card in front of Mark earlier, lowering his vigilance. Then, he used his identity and experience to create a psychological advantage and probe Mark. However, Mark, who had lost his vigilance, directly confronted Odin, and it was only then that Odin confirmed his own suspicions. Ah! In front of such an old fox who has lived for thousands of years, I really can't let my guard down. Otherwise, I'll end up paying him instead, Mark silently admonished himself. From now on, he would be extra careful in his interactions with Odin to avoid falling into his traps again. On the other hand, not to mention the mental confrontation between Odin and Mark, 
The other people present now looked at Mark with eyes shining brightly, just like a struggling student discovering they were sitting next to a top performing student during an exam. Once Mark confirmed his ability to use runic magic, they no longer had any doubts about him. To be able to bring such a powerful ally was definitely a good thing for Asgard, and they didn't want to ruin it due to their own reasons. I'm curious, how did you learn runic magic? As far as I know, Thor did not teach you any related knowledge, and even Thor himself uses this ability through instinct and natural talent. He shouldn't have the ability to teach you runic magic, right? Upon hearing Odin's question, Mark didn't feel nervous at all. This wasn't a difficult question to answer. On the contrary, Odin's description of his son, Thor, as someone who relies solely on instinct and lacks any techniques, was quite accurate. To give such an evaluation, Mark felt that Odin's son was truly his own flesh and blood. However, he wondered what Odin's thoughts and evaluations were regarding the other adopted son. But Mark could only keep this thought hidden deep in his heart. He didn't dare to speak or ask about it. While it's true that Thor didn't teach me any theoretical knowledge of runic magic, it's not wrong to say that I learned from him. In addition to Thor inviting me to help him, he has visited Earth three times in total, and I have had contact with him on each occasion. It was through the special runic symbols on his hammer, Mjolnir, and the imprints left by the Bifrost teleportation, combined with the runic inscriptions left on Earth by all of you thousands of years ago, that I analyzed and deduced their usage. I obtained some techniques for using runic symbols and applied them to certain technologies within myself. After listening to Mark's account, all present including Odin were amazed. To be able to analyze and deduce the combination of runic symbols through brief contact with Thor and the recorded runic inscriptions on Earth, and then apply them practically in his own inventions, such wisdom truly made everyone acknowledge the evaluation given by Heimdall, the strongest sage in the Nine Realms, without a doubt. Moreover, Mark was a Midgardian. Although his appearance was similar to that of the Asgardians, he did not possess the innate sensitivity to magic or the ability to draw and utilize magic through himself. Even so, Mark had successfully overcome the technological barriers and achieved successful applications. This made some individuals in the Great Hall, who naturally possessed advantages that Mark did not have, feel somewhat inadequate. Indeed, as Odin said, their unconscious arrogance and complacency had limited the possibility of their own breakthroughs towards higher goals. An amazing talent. Even in the long history of Asgard, only the ancient sage who created the runic inscriptions can be compared to your wisdom. I believe you have discovered the danger of ether during your research these past two days. They actively seek hosts to parasitize and absorb the host's life force. Once they return to the hands of the Dark Elves, their leader Melkith will use them to achieve his ambition of plunging the universe back into darkness and seizing it for himself. Now is the moment when we need you to utilize your talents to reverse the fate of Asgard and even the Nine Realms. I wonder if you are willing to help us unravel the secrets of the ether. Mark looked at Odin and gently shook his head. Actually, whether it's because of my relationship with Thor or for the sake of the safety of the entire universe, I should indeed agree to your request. But I can't embark on such a journey without any benefits. I have always believed in the principle of fair exchange. If you want me to help you unravel the secrets of the ether, how about we make a trade? Oh. I'm curious to know what kind of trade. Why don't you tell me? Odin looked at Mark with interest. Mark realized that there was a chance and quickly continued, I don't want to take advantage of you. You also know that I am researching runic magic, and in the process, it is essential for me to use URU metal as a medium. But there is no URU metal on earth, which has hindered the progress of my research. So, I wonder if you can provide me with some for my research. Ha ha ha, I thought you had some demanding request. This little matter is nothing compared to what I asked you to do. I can agree to it right now. Do you have any other requests? Since it's a fair exchange, I can't let you be at a disadvantage. No, Your Majesty Odin. In my opinion, this is a fair and just trade. Both parties have obtained what they desired. Since you have agreed to my conditions, I will do my best to fulfill the task you have given me. Please rest assured. Time is of the essence. If you have no further instructions, may I go back now and begin the mission? Very well. The current situation is not optimistic, so please take good care of it. After leaving the central hall, Mark was so excited that he wanted to jump three meters high to celebrate the deal he had just completed with Odin. 
As Odin had said, at first glance, anyone would think that Mark had suffered a great loss in this transaction. After all, what Mark had to do was related to the safety of Asgard and the Nine Realms. How could it be compared to the value of some URU metal? But when has Mark ever made a bad business deal? Although this transaction seemed like a loss on the surface, upon careful analysis, it would be discovered that Mark gained more than just the URU medal he requested from Odin. First and foremost, it concerned the safety of the Nine Realms. As Earth is the Midgard of the Nine Realms, if the ambitions of the Dark Elves were realized, the universe would fall back into darkness. In such a scenario, everything Mark had, including his loved ones, friends, employees, and all his possessions, would be in jeopardy. Therefore, regardless of whether Odin agreed to Mark's proposed transaction or not, Mark would ultimately agree to Odin's request. Secondly, the URU medal was indeed very useful. For Mark's further development and utilization of runic technology. The URU medal was currently the only obstacle limiting his progress on this path. Mark needed a substantial amount of URU metal as a foundation for his own power enhancement and the next stage of scientific research and development. Moreover, as a rare metal capable of harnessing magic, URU metal was only found in Nidavellir within the Nine Realms. Its extraction and purification costs were extremely high, making its value quite significant. It was not as negligible as Odin claimed. Considering these two points of analysis, Mark's trade was already profitable. After all, Odin's request was something he had to agree to. As for how much additional profit he could gain, it would depend on how much Mark could gain from his research on the ether. The key point of Mark's excitement lay here, the opportunity to study the ether particles, also known as the reality stone, up close. Mark could not refuse this opportunity no matter what, and that in itself was already the greatest reward. Accompanied by the guards dispatched by Odin, Mark arrived outside a heavily guarded room. This room would be Mark's personal studio for studying the ether in the coming period. The studio would be guarded around the clock, and even during shift changes, there had to be two teams present simultaneously to ensure a seamless transition and prevent any security loopholes. Upon entering this studio, Mark looked around and noticed that besides the entrance he had come through, there were no windows or openings in any of the walls or ceiling. However, this did not result in inadequate lighting or a stuffy atmosphere. Furthermore, the entire room, including the door, was enveloped in URU metal from the outside and inscribed with special runic symbols. For Mark, who was already proficient in runic script, it was easy to recognize the symbols representing, purification, brightness, strengthening, and, energy extraction, functions. What a great gift they've given me as soon as I walked in. With, energy extraction, rune, I won't need the arc reactor for energy conversion anymore and I no longer have to worry about the nanobot's battery life. Strengthening, can significantly enhance the self-strength of the nanobots, surpassing the functional limitations imposed by their materials. Although he hadn't thought of specific applications for the other two symbols yet, it was definitely a good idea to include them. With the collection of all four symbols complete, Mark decided not to further explore the room. Since the appetizers had been served, it was time to move on to the main course. Mark looked at the palace guard who had led him here and said, I'm ready to start my research at any time. Do you know where the ether are now? Lord Mark, please take a moment to rest. His Majesty Odin has already sent someone to retrieve the ether from the palace treasury. I believe they will be delivered to your studio soon. Mark nodded and didn't rush. Impatience is a major taboo in any research. Since it would take some time for the ether to arrive, Mark closed his eyes, adjusted his mental state, and calmed his mind, preparing himself to focus on his work more quickly. Soon, Mark heard a regiment of soldiers marching in a disciplined manner outside the studio door. They formed a standard square formation, stepping in perfect unison, with the ether guarded in the center of the formation, making their way towards Mark's studio. Upon reaching the door, the entire regiment swiftly changed formation. The soldiers who were originally on the outermost perimeter moved back and formed a human wall. The escort, who was originally in the center position, appeared in front of Mark. He solemnly and carefully held the container sealing the ether particles and said to Mark, Mr. Mark, this is the item that His Majesty Odin instructed to be handed over to you. Please accept it. Observing the other person's demeanor, Mark unconsciously stood up straight and gently took the container. Okay, I have confirmed. Thank you. It's my honor. 
the escort bowed to Mark and exclaimed loudly. Then, he jogged back to the formation, and the entire regiment marched away in perfect harmony, disappearing from Mark's sight. Lord Mark, the item has been delivered. Next, I will seal the entrance to the studio. The security and alert level of this space will be raised to the highest level. If you have any orders or requests, you can notify me through the communication magic stone. I will be at your service throughout the process. If you have no further instructions at the moment, then I won't disturb your research and will take my leave, the guard said. Okay, you may go, Mark nodded. After the guard left, the entire studio was completely sealed, and only Mark remained in the room. Mark looked at the container containing the sealed ether, and his eyes shimmered with excitement. The reality stone, arguably the most powerful among the six infinity stones, can transform a person's thoughts into reality without exaggeration. It renders any physical laws meaningless in its presence. It can be said that the reality stone is an all-powerful wish-granting machine. Even if the wishmaker desires to overturn the basic laws of the universe, the reality stone can make it happen. However, in order to harness the terrifying power of the reality stone and turn it into a true all-powerful wish-granting machine, the remaining five infinity stones must be collected. By allowing them to interact and form a complete energy circuit, they provide the immense energy needed to rewrite reality. This imposes significant limitations on the functionality of the reality stone. Not to mention how difficult it is to collect all six infinity stones in the vast universe, which may be no less challenging than the effort required to fulfill one's wishes in the first place. Even if someone does manage to gather all the infinity stones, the immense energy generated by the six-stone energy circuit during the wish-making process is enough to cause the majority of wishmakers to physically collapse and die before they could see their wishes are fulfilled. Therefore, after obtaining the reality stone, the Dark Elves did not limit themselves to its inherent applications. Instead, they used the Reality Stone as the core to create a terrifying artifact that instilled fear across the Nine Realms, the Aether. The Aether strips the Reality Stone of almost all its abilities and possesses only one power, the ability to transform any object into dark matter. The principle behind this is to pre-configure the wish to be made to the Reality Stone, transforming the object into dark matter, and continuously extract the infinite energy from the reality stone, storing it as the required energy to fulfill the wish. This creates a closed-loop circuit that is self-sustaining and perpetual. One must commend the Dark Elves for coming up with such a usage for the Infinity Stones. They have found an effective way to utilize the stones, and their ingenious design still appears flawless to someone like Mark, who comes from a thousand years in the future. Such a design has led to another functionality of the ether particles, the creation of cursed warriors. This is a capability that only affects the Dark Elves. As a race born from the endless darkness, the bodies of Dark Elves are different from those of races born from the light, they are composed of dark matter. When the cursed stones, created using fragments of the ether, enter the bodies of Dark Elves, they continuously absorb the life energy within them and convert it into dark matter, further strengthening their bodies and turning them into cursed warriors. The reason it is called a curse is that while becoming powerful, they also constantly experience the loss of their life energy, hastening their journey toward death. If one refuses the cursed stone, they will die in battle due to their own weakness. Once they accept the cursed stone, they can only fight until they meet their end. It is a tragic curse that cannot be broken. As the only race born from darkness, their tragic fate seems to have been destined from the very beginning. The deeper Mark delves into the study of the reality stone, the more obsessed he becomes with it. He has already come into contact with three of the infinity stones, the space stone, the mind stone, and the reality stone he is currently researching. Each stone shares a common characteristic, the seemingly infinite energy contained within them. This is something that Mark finds difficult to comprehend. In Mark's logical thinking, everything must have its source, and these energies clearly cannot arise out of nowhere. If the interior of the stones is an advanced energy generator more advanced than the arc reactor, then after experiencing such a long period from before the birth of the universe to the present, their energy should not have remained without any decay. Therefore, Mark put forward two bold speculations regarding the source of this energy. First, the reality stone rewrote the corresponding rules, allowing the infinity stones to possess infinite energy within this universe. According to the known law of energy conservation in Earth's research, if correct, 
the Infinity Stones should be able to continuously extract energy from the universe during the activation process and release it when fulfilling their respective functions, thus maintaining the ability of energy conservation in the universe. The modified universal rule by the Reality Stone is that the Infinity Stones, when exerting their powers, do not cause an increase in entropy. The second conjecture Mark made completely transcended the limitations of his own universe and even the dimensions. According to Odin's description of the Infinity Stones, they existed before the formation of this universe. That means the Infinity Stones themselves are not items from the universe where Mark resides, more precisely, they are not items from the dimension in which Mark exists. Because only existences in higher dimensions can freely alter the operational laws of lower dimensional worlds, and the six infinity stones, in terms of the rules of space, time, mind, soul, reality, and power, obviously possess such abilities. In other words, the energy of the infinity stones originates from a higher dimensional space, perhaps the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, or even higher. Mark cannot determine this. However, if this conjecture is indeed true, Mark's research on the Infinity Stones could very well help him find a way to communicate with other dimensions and fulfill his envisioned spatial portals. Mark currently laments that he is in Asgard, which prevents him from connecting to the servers on Earth. Otherwise, he would definitely be able to use informational vision to obtain more information from the ether and acquire more knowledge. Restricted by the current conditions, Mark can only rely on the holographic scanning device he carries and the soul forge provided by Asgard, namely the quantum field generator, to study the ether. Compared to informational vision, this approach undoubtedly reduces efficiency, the intuitiveness of data, and its credibility by several notches. Since informational vision is definitely not an option, as it would inevitably cause him to lose consciousness and waste more time, it is better to completely shut down his vision to enhance the brain's computational power for processing and memorizing information. Baymax, at your service, master. Help me intercept all information transmitted from the visual nerves to the visual center, and let the nanobots take over visual assistance and deliver image information. Mark's intention is to block all the various and complicated information conveyed by informational vision and let the visual assistance module replace the eye function before heaven's eye modification. This will maximize the brain's available computing power. Understood, master. A few seconds after Baymax's response, Mark's vision suddenly turned black, and then, after a few more seconds, it regained brightness. The visual augmentation module, after undergoing system calibration, is no different from that of a normal person. However, after completely cutting off the burden caused by informational vision, Mark can clearly feel the relief and ease in his brain after being liberated. In that case, it is now time to fully devote himself to solving the problem with all his might. After Mark's brain processing power was liberated, his research speed once again experienced a tremendous boost. Soon, he discovered why the Dark Elves could disregard spatial and distance barriers and accurately sense the location of the ether particles. Originally, he had thought that the Dark Elves had set up a signal transmission program on the ether particles, allowing Malekith to accurately perceive their whereabouts. However, if that were true, it couldn't explain the Dark Elves' rapid reaction speed. The distance between the ether's ceiling location and the Dark Elves' hiding place in the Dark World was quite far. Even without considering signal attenuation, it would take a considerable amount of time for the signal to be emitted, transmitted, and received by the Dark Elves. This time frame would be insufficient for the Dark Elves to lead a large army and complete the attack on Asgard within a day of the Aether's emergence. Thus, another possibility must be considered. The ever-changing and scattered nature of the Aether particles resembled Mark's micromagnetic axis robots. This awakened a memory in his mind belonging to Hero. After Hero's older brother died, he went through a period of depression. It was ultimately because Baymax accidentally discovered a stray micro-magnetic axis robot on him. It seemed to be attracted by some signal, constantly wanting to move in a certain direction, much like a compass. Curious, they conducted an investigation and discovered the enormous conspiracy hidden behind his brother's death. The signal that attracted the stray micro-robots was the superimposed signal formed by tens of thousands of micro-robots gathering together. As a weapon that existed in liquid form, the ether particles had been divided into countless small fragments by the Dark Elves throughout the long time after their birth. These fragments were then used to create the Curse Stones. These ether fragments, after entering the bodies of the Dark Elves and transforming them into Curse Warriors, did not disappear. Instead, they resided within their bodies, 
constantly absorbing the life energy of the host to maintain their functionality. And when these curse warriors died, the ether fragments would once again be attracted by the main body of the ether particles and return to merge with it. This process was very similar to the attraction of the aggregate body to micromagnetic axis robots. That's why, when the ether was accidentally unsealed by Jane Foster, the Dark Elves could quickly learn the news, gather their army, and launch a surprise attack on Asgard. Only the core of the ether particles, the reality stone, possessed such an ability, disregarding spatial and temporal barriers and summoning its separated entities. After conducting experiments using the quantum field generator, the results also confirmed the correctness of this idea. The ether particles, or rather the reality stone itself, could summon its separated entities without any time delay, regardless of the distance between them. But according to the description of Queen Frigga, even after she used the containment vessel to conceal the ether particles, the Dark Elves could still sense that she had hidden the ether within her. This could be because the distance between the two was too close, greatly enhancing the ether fragment's perception of the main body, or because the containment was too thin to completely shield the connection between the two. Before the ether emerged due to the recent Nine Stars Convergence phenomenon, Odin's father, King Bor, used a large sealing device and buried it deep within the core of a planet to seal it. Looking at it this way, King Bor, after sealing it, buried it underground again, not only to better hide this terrifying weapon but also perhaps to utilize the planet's magnetic field to shield external perception. After learning about this characteristic of the ether, Mark's research made some progress. However, for the current situation, this achievement did not have any positive impact. If it were before the cosmic cube was stolen by the Dark Elves, they could certainly find another place to reseal the ether particles. Even if the next nine stars convergence occurred, the ether would have the luck to be unsealed again, and the Dark Elves wouldn't have such a long lifespan to wait for that time. But now, it's a situation where it's either you die or I die, with no possibility of turning back. Moreover, compared to the stakes the Dark Elves have pressed down, which is the fate of their own race, Asgard shoulders the heavy responsibility of protecting the lives of all the Nine Realms. It's a case of only victory and no room for failure, making the pressure naturally much heavier. And compared to the characteristic of the ether particles, Mark was more hopeful to research the principle of spatial distance and instantaneous sensing. Once he made a breakthrough in this aspect, Mark wouldn't lose communication with his own server as soon as he left Earth. By then, Mark could spread his personal network throughout the entire universe and even expand his server cluster without limitations, creating a second brain with unlimited computing power. Unfortunately, Mark didn't have the time, resources, or energy to invest in this right now. He had to solve the crisis he was currently facing. So, no matter how much he itched for this idea, Mark could only suppress it for now and continue researching how to control and utilize the abilities of the ether particles. How do the ether particles utilize the power of the reality stone? It's really strange. In theory, as the only infinity stone that exists in liquid form, the simplest way to utilize its power should be to create a casing for it and contain it within. Because there is no way for any kind of markings, like runic symbols, to be left on the liquid surface of the reality stone. So, to control it. Wait a minute. The surface. Since there is nothing on the surface, could it be that it's implanted as a core within? The more Mark thought about it, the more he felt that this speculation had a high possibility. So, he quickly controlled the quantum field generator and performed an ultrafine quantum scan on the ether particles, achieving a scanning precision at the highest quark level. Quarks are the basic units that make up matter. Quarks combine to form composite particles called hadrons, and the most stable hadrons are protons and neutrons, which are the building blocks of atomic nuclei. At this level of precision scanning, ordinary molecules and atoms could be magnified to the size of a basketball for observation while ensuring the clear reproduction of every detail. With such unparalleled precision, Mark finally discovered the countless microparticle cores contained within the liquid exterior of the ether particles. He had always thought that the reason the ether particles appeared in a liquid state was due to the influence of the reality stone. But now Mark knew that the truth was completely different. The liquid structure of the ether particles was the reality stone itself. The Dark Elves controlled and utilized the reality stone by injecting these ultraminiature particle cores into it. These particle cores were only about one-fifth the size of a quark. If Mark had relied solely on his own holographic scanning device, even if he had guessed this possibility, 
he wouldn't have the technology to truly confirm it. It was thanks to the quantum field generator provided by Asgard that Mark was able to conduct such high-precision scanning and modeling. It's important to note that even with the cheat of PIM particles, Mark couldn't shrink objects down to the size of quarks. The principle behind PIM particles was to change the atomic spacing of an object to alter its size, so its limit was at the atomic level and couldn't reach the level of fundamental units like quarks. That the Dark Elves possessed such a high-precision manufacturing technique, and they had achieved it thousands of years ago, truly impressed Mark with the wisdom of this race's past. Regardless of the races and positions of both sides, it was purely an admiration from one pioneer in the scientific field to another. Although he had finally found the control principle of the ether particles, in order to truly stimulate and control it, he still needed to decipher the special runes within the particle cores, which were completely different from Agard's runic spells. These runes should be the result of the Dark Elves' technological system and the long-term development and accumulation of their unique ways of utilizing dark energy. Within the crystallization of this Dark Elf civilization, Mark saw another exciting possibility. After any type of substance is broken down into its fundamental units, what remains are individual quarks. In this state, the substance is no longer able to maintain its properties and states at the molecular and atomic levels, rendering all known physical and chemical characteristics completely ineffective. This means that if URU metal is broken down into quarks, its most important property as a medium for storing magical energy would be completely lost. However, the examples of the cores of the ether particles show that they can carry runic patterns and serve as a medium for magic. Therefore, Mark boldly inferred that in the quark state, all the physical and chemical properties that hinder the transmission of magic in a substance are completely shattered, and any particle at the quark level can become a suitable medium and carrier for magic. If that's the case, Mark could potentially free runic technology from the limitations and constraints of URU metal in the future. He made a note of this in his notebook, as it was another research direction for the future that would require scientific exploration. Although Mark didn't mind digging a big hole for himself, he was accustomed to the life of leaving old holes unfilled and starting new ones. Moreover, after undergoing psychological intervention therapy with Baymax, Mark clearly felt that his passion for scientific research was even more intense than before. Unlike in the past, when he invested his energy into research as a way to escape inner anxieties, after truly accepting his new life in the Marvel Universe, Mark discovered a genuine love for scientific research. As a result, his efficiency had greatly improved. He wasn't afraid of continuously starting new research projects, he was only afraid of not finding interesting projects that would pique his interest. Having scanned the special runes on the ultrafine core particles of the ether particles, Mark now needed to decipher their meaning and the functions they represented. He temporarily named these special runes, Dark Rune, which originated from the Dark Elves civilization. As a unique race born in darkness, the Dark Elves possessed a long and ancient civilization and history. The records left in all Asgardian literature describe them as brutal, ambitious, and extremely mysterious. However, these descriptions were vague and concise, providing only fragments of information. Regarding their civilization and technology, there was hardly any mention in these records. The only relevant description was that the Dark Elves had created a dangerous weapon capable of threatening the safety of the entire universe, the ether particles. This meant that even Asgard, which had a long history and had clashed with the Dark Elves multiple times, knew very little about the Dark Elves themselves. The remaining information was even more fragmented. Without any supplementary information, Mark had to start from scratch and continuously analyze, deduce, and summarize the meanings represented by these Dark Runes based on the known abilities of the Aether Particles and the scanned Dark Runes. Knowing that these runes originated from a race born in darkness, Mark abandoned the idea of using runic script as a reference from the beginning. However, Mark wasn't completely devoid of other sources of information to expedite his research. This could be attributed to Magneto's previous actions. After the major battle in which the Dark Elves attacked Asgard, Magneto conducted a detailed scan of the weapons and technologies left behind by the Dark Elves on the battlefield. Although these weapons differ significantly from Asgard's standards, their functionalities are nearly identical. In other words, Mark can use them as tools with similar functions to decipher the dark runes of the dark elves. By employing this analytical method, Mark made rapid progress in deciphering the dark runes right from the start of his research. 
he quickly classified all the runes with similar functionalities and, by drawing analogies with Asgard's runic script, decoded their meanings and functions. With the deciphered dark runes as a foundation, Mark had obtained some reference points. For the remaining runes with unclear meanings, he found corresponding directions for deduction. By conducting continuous research experiments in the virtual laboratory facilitated by nanorobots, Mark spent just two short days creating a complete decryption of all the dark runes on the surface of the ether particles, starting from scratch. Furthermore, during this process, he summarized and formulated an entire methodology for analyzing dark runes and principles for their construction and combination. This means that even if Mark encounters other unknown dark runes in the future, he will be able to quickly analyze their meanings using this methodology. By adhering to the principles of construction and combination, he can create the desired runic patterns and achieve the corresponding functionalities. After completing the analysis of the dark runes, it can be said that Mark's task for the trade with Odin has come to an end. He has fully understood the working principles, usage methods, and activation modes of the ether particles, all accomplished within a mere three days. For the Asgardians with a lifespan of thousands of years, these three days were no more than the blink of an eye. Moreover, considering the current tense situation, Mark's speed has provided valuable time advantages for Asgard in the pursuit of victory in the war. However, if the research only reached this level, Mark didn't believe that Asgard would gain any absolute advantage capable of influencing the course of the war. The initial design of the Aether Particles by the Dark Elves predetermined that their true power could only be unleashed in the hands of the Dark Elves themselves. While the ability to transform matter into antimatter could be useful for other races, it wouldn't pose as great a threat as it does in the hands of the Dark Elves. Therefore, if the task were only completed up to this point, Mark would feel dissatisfied, and he didn't believe that he had reached his full potential. This was a gamble that concerned the safety of the Nine Realms. In order to protect everything he had on Earth, he had to invest more chips to ensure that his side gained a greater advantage. If I want the ether particles to provide more assistance to Asgard, I need to make certain modifications and adjustments to the dark runes within their core particles. This means I have two problems to solve, first, how to adjust them to ensure that their functionalities are advantageous to our side and detrimental to the dark elves. Second, how to achieve more precise adjustments at the quark level of particles. Mark, why have you come to me at this time? If there's anything you need help with, feel free to speak up. I will exert all the power of Asgard to solve your troubles. In the central hall of the palace, the throne that was previously destroyed by Melkith has now been restored. King Odin sits upon it, looking at Mark who has come to meet him. When Mark requested to have a conversation with Odin, who was responsible for collaborating with him, there was only one thought in Odin's mind. Given the tense situation at present, with a great war about to break out, if Mark is not focusing on his research on ether and instead has come to him, the only possibility is that he has encountered a difficult problem and needs his assistance. However, although Mark did indeed come to seek help from Odin, it is different from what Odin had speculated. Mark has already deciphered the method of using ether. Odin could never have imagined that just a few days after proposing the deal, Mark had already completed the task assigned to him. Indeed, when Mark explained that he had unraveled the mystery of Aether, Odin's face displayed a completely incredulous and astonished expression. His remaining single eye stared at Mark intently, as if trying to see through him. Under Odin's scorching gaze, a bold thought crossed Mark's mind. Should he give Odin an artificial white-eyed like Nick Fury? They both only have one eye, so it would suit them well. Upon careful consideration, it seems that Thor, in the Ragnarok, will also be one-eyed blinded by his sister. Could it be that this acquired one-eyed trait is inherited? It seems necessary to prepare one for Thor in advance. After being shocked for quite some time, Odin finally regained his composure and then shook his head helplessly. After all, he was a seasoned warrior who had ruled an entire kingdom for thousands of years and seen everything the world had to offer. Yet today, he was rendered speechless for quite some time due to the good news brought by Mark which was truly embarrassing for him. Although I have never doubted your abilities, I cannot fathom how you managed to accomplish such a challenging task in such a short time. So, are you here today to report this good news to me? In response to Odin's inquiry, Mark nodded at first and then shook his head. I did indeed complete the task, but it can't really be considered good news because if we only reach this point, it won't have any positive effect on our victory in this war. 
the Aether can only unleash their immense power in the hands of the Dark Elves. So even if I deciphered the method of using them, Asgard wouldn't be able to harness the power of Aether to defeat the enemy. Inadvertently, it might even backfire and become an aid to the Dark Elves. Mark detailed his discoveries in his research to Odin, explaining the ability of Aether to transform matter into dark matter. While this may be a superpower for the Dark Elves, in Asgard, it is merely a convenient free dark matter generator. It seems impossible to gain an advantage in the war by relying on it. But Mark's task is to turn the impossible into possible. After reporting on his work, Mark directly presented the problem he needed Odin's help to solve. I have completed the combination of dark runes that reverse the function of ether. By simply changing the arrangement of the runes, they can achieve a functional reversal, transforming all dark matter generated by darkness into ordinary matter. In this way, ether will become the bane of the dark elves, whose bodies are entirely composed of dark matter. However, there is still one problem to be solved, which is the technical means to modify the surface runes of the core particles within the ether. I cannot, in a short time and in an unfamiliar place, create a high-precision processing device capable of achieving quark-level accuracy using tools whose methods of use I am unaware of. Therefore, I need to seek your assistance to see if there is a way to solve the difficulty I am currently facing. Otherwise, I will have to return to my Earth laboratory and develop this technology, but it will be too time-consuming relative to the current situation. To achieve quark-level precision processing, even we in Asgard cannot accomplish that. Upon hearing Mark's request, Odin responded bluntly. Upon hearing Odin's reply, Mark felt somewhat disappointed. Although he had completed the task and the deal had been established, even if he couldn't modify the functionality of ether particles, it didn't necessarily mean failure in confronting the Dark Elves. However, when one has found a path to success but cannot traverse it, it indeed brings a sense of unwillingness. However, Odin continued, but you don't need to be disappointed. Although Asgard cannot achieve it, it doesn't mean I cannot solve your problem. Asgard and the Dwarven of Nidavellir have established a long-standing alliance and diplomatic relations. Asgard provides protection to Nidavellir, while the Dwarves help forge powerful weapons for Asgard. If there's anyone among the Nine Realms who can fulfill your request, it would be the Dwarf King Itri. Nidavellir, the most incredible weapon forge in the entire Marvel Universe. Odin's Eternal Spear Gungnir, Thor's Hammer Mjolnir, and later on, Thanos' Infinity Gauntlet and Thor's Stormbreaker, all the iconic weapons you can name in the Marvel Universe, they mostly come from Nidavellir. Gungnir, capable of penetrating any physical defense, with 100% accuracy. It has always been the symbol of power for rulers of Asgard. Mjolnir, the hammer that can shatter anything. With it, Thor can unleash his hidden thunder god powers and fly across the heavens and earth. The Infinity Gauntlet, a super weapon capable of perfectly harnessing the terrifying power of the six infinity stones. Through it, a part of the intense side effects caused by using the stones was dispersed, allowing Thanos to retire peacefully to a pastoral setting after his infamous snap. And not to mention the Stormbreaker, the last weapon forged by the dwarf King Itri, embodying both the revenge of the dwarves and Thor. The Stormbreaker not only possesses all the functions of Mjolnir but also has the ability to teleport through space, fully unleashing the thunder power within Thor. Have you not seen how, after obtaining the Stormbreaker, Thor not only broke through the energy barrier created by the six infinity stones but also made the once arrogant Thanos taste the bitterness of being injured? Nidavellir, as the renowned holy land of artifact production, can be said to produce nothing but masterpieces in the entire nine realms and even beyond the nine realms of the universe. Anyone who has heard their name knows that Nidavellir's products are of the highest quality. The one and only material in the entire universe capable of storing magic, the metal known as URU, which serves as a medium for magical power, also comes from Nidavellir. And the dwarves of Nidavellir are the only ones in the universe capable of forging with URU metal. However, the dwarves' unique forging skills have always been coveted by the powerful forces of the universe. Unable to use the weapons they create themselves, they have had to rely on the protection of mighty Asgard and exchange their craftsmanship for Asgard's protection. But if there comes a time when Asgard itself cannot be protected, where will Nidavellir go? The massacre brought by Thanos may be one of the countless possible futures they face. However, for now, Thanos is wary of Odin's deterrence and has not visited Nidavellir to have the Infinity Gauntlet forged. The skilled hands of the dwarf King Itri are still alive and well. 
As Odin said, if there is only one person in the entire universe who can fulfill Mark's request, it undoubtedly belongs to the dwarf King Eitri. Upon learning of Mark's request, Odin immediately arranged for contact to be made with the dwarf King Eitri. After learning about the dangers facing the Nine Realms, Eitri confirmed that he could indeed perform high-precision operations at the quark level and readily agreed to provide Mark with any help within his capabilities. With the approval of the dwarf King Eitri, Odin wasted no time in arranging Mark's journey to Nidavellir. Mark will bring the ether with him on this trip. To ensure the absolute safety of the ether, Odin will undoubtedly assign guards to accompany him, to prevent any covert attacks from the Dark Elves. However, as Nidavellir is the smallest among the Nine Realms, with only a few hundred dwarves living on the entire planet, it is impossible to arrange for an entire army to accompany them. Such an action would not only raise concerns and suspicions from Dwarf King Eitri but also overcrowd the planet, preventing the dwarves from carrying out their forging work, let alone fulfilling Mark's request. Therefore, Odin specifically selected five elite warriors to serve as Mark's personal guards, ensuring the safety of Mark and the Aether. They are Thor, the god of thunder, and his friends, the warriors three along with Lady Sif. Nice to see you again, Heimdall. As they arrived on the Bivrost Bridge, Mark greeted Heimdall. The last time they met, Mark had just arrived, and Heimdall had welcomed him. This time marked their second encounter, as Mark was about to leave Asgard for Nidavellir. He preemptively greeted Heimdall, as a gesture of courtesy. Heimdall nodded in response to Mark's greeting and then looked at the five individuals beside him. With their deep friendship, just a glance conveyed the messages they wanted to transmit to each other. Without many words, Heimdall, who already knew their destination, silently wished them a smooth journey. He then activated the Bivrost and transported the six of them to the realm of the dwarves, Nidavellir. During the teleportation journey, enveloped by the immense energy of the Bivrost bridge, Mark, now in a quantum state, did not waste a precious moment. In this quantum state, Mark's brain can be considered an unlimited speed quantum computer. Utilizing this time, Mark continuously calculated the modifications to the dark runes he deduced, while also multitasking in analyzing other research projects derived from the ether. It is in this current quantum state that Mark can simultaneously activate multiple threads of tasks while ensuring that the processing speed of each task remains unaffected. Under normal circumstances, due to insufficient brain energy supply, he would have long fallen into a coma or gone into shock. Nidavellir is a special planet consisting of a central star core and an outer metal ring structure, resembling a Dyson sphere. The central star core, amplified by energy concentrators, can provide temperatures in the trillions of degrees. Even the highly resistant special metal like URU is capable of melting under such high temperatures. The clever dwarves have built Nidavellir, their unique home, using their own intelligence. This allows them, despite their inability to use magic, to be the only race in the universe with knowledge of forging URU metal. When Mark and his group arrived in Nidavellir through the Bivrost, they first arrived on the outermost ring of the planet. This ring is furthest from the central heat source, providing a more suitable environment for living, resting, and entertainment for the dwarves after their forging work. Dwarf King Eitri, whom Mark and the others sought, typically resides in the innermost ring. Here, he forges the powerful artifacts required by Asgard and continuously hones his own forging skills. Even under temperatures reaching hundreds of degrees Celsius, Eitri continually shapes and molds the metal through hammering while carefully engraving intricate runic magic symbols. Throughout Nidavellir, only Eitri possesses such skill. With a body forged through countless trials and an indomitable will, Eitri can ignore the surrounding environmental disturbances. His mastery of the craft enables him to create weapons that are not only perfect works of art but also highly sought after by any courageous warrior in the universe. This is why Eitri ascended to the throne in the entire dwarf kingdom. Only with such extraordinary forging skills can weapons capable of harnessing the power of mighty beings be created. Knowing Eitri's location, Thor and the others suggested taking a break and waiting for the arrival of the dwarf king. They didn't believe that Mark, a Midgardian, could withstand the average temperature of a few hundred degrees within the inner ring. In fact, they themselves felt uncertain and apprehensive about enduring such high temperatures. However, Mark insisted on going personally to pay his respects to the Master Forger. Setting aside the fact that they were seeking his assistance, it was a matter of proper etiquette to meet him in person. Moreover, Mark's own limit of being able to withstand temperatures up to 3000 degrees Celsius, 
while far below the several billion degrees of the star core's maximum temperature, was still sufficient to handle temperatures in the hundreds. There was no other choice. The few individuals entrusted with protecting Mark and the ether could only reluctantly accompany him, despite their concerns. The closer they got to the center, the more Thor and the others felt the scorching heat in the air. Every breath felt like a tearing sensation as if a steel brush was scraping through their respiratory tract. Thor himself had superior physical qualities and abundant magical power, so he managed relatively easily with both factors combined. However, the warriors three and Sif found it more challenging. Firstly, their physical strength was not as exceptional as Thor's, and they lacked exceptional magical talents. Their magical energy quickly depleted, forcing them to rely solely on their willpower to keep moving forward. Secondly, there was the psychological pressure. They were well aware of Thor's strength, so seeing him relatively at ease was within their expectations. However, looking at Mark, who was leading the way and appeared even more relaxed than Thor, they truly felt the pressure brought upon them by their hanging reputation. If a mortal like Mark from Midgard could endure, if these gods of Asgard fall first, wouldn't they be a laughingstock? Nevertheless, for the glory of Asgard, the four of them could only grit their teeth and continue towards the innermost ring. The good news was that they were nearing their destination, and the temperature increase would soon reach its peak. Although the warriors three and Sif were already extremely uncomfortable, they should be able to reach Dwarf King Eitri before the temperature exceeded their endurance limits. Clang! 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 The closer they got to their destination, the clearer the sound of metal hammering became. After passing through the final connection point, Mark and the others finally saw their intended target, Master Forger Eitri, from whom they require help for this mission. Eitri swung his large hammer, continuously pounding the URU metal on the forge table that had already undergone thousands of foldings and compressions. He spoke to the group while working, apologies for keeping the honored guests waiting. When His Majesty Odin informed me of this matter, I had already begun forging this weapon. Based on our dwarven principles, I cannot interrupt my work until the forging is complete. I sincerely apologize. As they looked at the bearded craftsman standing there, who was over five meters tall and showed no resemblance to the word dwarf, Mark and the others felt like a group of ten-year-old children standing beside him. However, Mark did not display any arrogance due to the polite nature of the craftsman. He responded with great respect, saying, We are the ones causing the disturbance. I believe only a craftsman like yourself, who adheres to principles and meticulousness, can meet the requirement for high precision. Upon hearing Mark's words, a smile involuntarily appeared on the face of Dwarf King Eitri. After all, who doesn't like to hear flattery? Especially when Mark's praise was so fresh and subtle, it hit him in the right spot. Based on this alone, Eitri decided not to keep Mark waiting any longer. He accelerated the frequency of his hammer strikes, creating a whooshing sound that demonstrated the terrifying power contained in each blow. After a short while, the URU metal, which had already undergone thousands of foldings, was once again repeatedly folded and refined under Eitri's exquisite forging technique. When Eitri finally stopped swinging his large hammer, all impurities within the metal had been hammered out, leaving behind a portion that possessed both strength and resilience. Whether it was forged into armor or a weapon, it was an excellent choice. Using tongs, Eitri carefully picked up the finished product from the forge table and carefully examined every surface, admiring the unique patterns and designs formed through the forging process. Then, a satisfied smile appeared on his face. Gently placing the finished piece in its designated spot, Eitri lowered his head and said to Mark and the others, Thank you for your understanding. Now that I have completed my work, let's talk about the matter you came here for. Mark nodded and then looked at Thor beside him, raising an eyebrow. Thor immediately understood and took out the container carrying the ether, which he had been protecting, from his backpack and handed it to Mark. After receiving it, Mark held it high above his head and presented it to Eitri, saying, when His Majesty Odin contacted you earlier, he had already introduced my request. This item in my hand is the ether, which, thousands of years ago, caused havoc in the Nine Realms when the Dark Elves wielded its power. And now, they plan to return and plunge the entire universe into endless darkness. To gain an advantage in this war, I need you to modify the runes on the surface of the ether, at the quark level core, Mark continued. So, this is the ether. Eitri gently received the container that sealed the ether with his two fingers and carefully examined it. 
I have come across descriptions of it in the records left by our dwarven ancestors. Thousands of years ago, when Odin had not yet inherited the throne of Asgard, and Nidavellir had not yet allied with Asgard, Vanaheim was one of the most powerful among the Nine Realms. Even Asgard had to handle the Dark Elves of Vanaheim with caution. One day, the leader of the Dark Elves, Melkith, brought a mysterious artifact they had obtained by chance to the then ruling dwarf king of Nidavellir, requesting his assistance in forging it into an extraordinary weapon. Fearing the might of Vanaheim and moved by Melkitha's personal visit, the dwarf king at that time ultimately agreed to his request. And this is that weapon ether. What the dwarf king didn't expect was that, after obtaining it, Melkith led the Dark Elves to begin a mad plan. They wanted to take away all the light and plunge the entire universe into darkness. This action undoubtedly declared war against all the realms of the Nine Realms. They dispatched armies one after another, attempting to intimidate the Dark Elves and make them abandon their plan. However, the Dark Elves remained steadfast. They directly gathered the power of the entire realm of Vanaheim and launched their attack. With the help of the Aether, although they fought on multiple battlefields simultaneously, stretching their forces thin, the Dark Elves achieved continuous victories. They even directly forced the surrender of the three small realms of Nornheim, Nivelheim, and Svartalheim, and withdrew from the war. With the defeat of these three realms, the remaining kingdoms also felt a strong sense of crisis. After discussions and consultations, the kings of each realm decided to temporarily set aside their grievances and form a coalition to resist the invasion of the Dark Elves. You already know the outcome of the war. It ended with the failure of the Dark Elves, and the Aether was sealed away by King Bor, never to see the light of day again. But I didn't expect that in my lifetime, I would have the opportunity to see this weapon and appreciate its exquisite craftsmanship. Upon hearing Eitri's account, Mark and the others were also very surprised. They had not expected such a little-known history behind it. However, the information they gained from this story added confidence to Mark and the others. Since the Aether was created by the Dwarf King thousands of years ago, Eitri must have a way to fulfill Mark's request. You should return to the living area in the outermost ring and wait. The ultra-precision runic engraving is a closely guarded secret of our dwarf race. I will modify the ether according to your request, Aitri said. You are well aware that our dwarf race cannot fully unleash the power of the weapons we create. There is no need to worry that I will covet this treasure, he assured them. Mark and the others nodded and agreed to Aitri's proposal. Mark and Thor were not concerned that Aitri would do anything foolish for the Aether. After all, if he had that intention, he would have already dominated the Nine Realms and waged wars across the universe with the weapons he created. Why would he need to trade his forging for the protection of Asgard? As for the Warriors Three and Sif, they were simply unable to endure the extreme heat in this environment. As long as they could leave this place as soon as possible, they no longer cared about anything else. However, even though they left, Mark was very curious about the secret that Aitri mentioned. Since it couldn't be observed openly and directly, he could only resort to some tricks and secretly learn from it. As Mark followed Thor and the others away, no one, including Aitri, noticed that three barely noticeable nanobots detached from Mark's fingertips and settled on Aitri's thick beard. After undergoing upgrades and modifications, these nanobots were capable of withstanding temperatures exceeding 3000 degrees Celsius. Even in the extreme environment where Aitri resided, they would be able to carry out the tasks assigned by Mark. At that time, all the actions performed by Aitri would be recorded by these three nanobots through their internal holographic modules and transmitted to Mark's presence. Mark would then know what the closely guarded secret of the dwarf race was and whether he could learn from it and develop a production device with quark-level precision. Returning to the outskirts of Nidavellar's living circle, Mark was prepared to stay up late and watch the live show of the dwarf king Aitri's ultra-precision skills. He intended to learn a few tricks and gather inspiration for his future development of new manufacturing equipment. You see, quarks, as the basic particles that make up all matter and also the smallest units of particles, are incredibly difficult to engrave with runes. It is even comparable to collecting all six infinity stones and making a wish come true. The fact that the successive kings of the dwarves possessed such extraordinary skills made Mark eager to know the secrets behind it. However, Mark only guessed the beginning but not the end. After carefully comparing and memorizing the runic styles that Mark requested for modification, Aitri did not stay on the circular platform where he had been working but instead walked directly to the gate sealing the heart of the star, carrying ether. 
In the astonished gaze of Mark, Itri calmly stepped into it. Soon after, due to the extremely high temperature of the star's core, which had already exceeded the nanobot's tolerance limit, the three robots left by Mark turned into ashes in an instant, and the live broadcast was interrupted. Mark had no idea how Itri managed to withstand the billions of degrees of heat from the star's core without any harm. He also didn't know what Itri did on the star's core or what the secret of the dwarves' ultra-precision craftsmanship was. When Itri appeared again in front of Mark and his group, it had been exactly three days. Itri appeared extremely haggard and weak, lacking the imposing aura he had when wielding his hammer for the first time. However, the gleam in his eyes showed his excitement. Obviously, completing the transformation of Aether through that forging technique was a tremendous test for his skills, and Itri was thrilled after successfully meeting the challenge. However, what intrigued Mark the most was how Itri managed to withstand the terrifying temperatures of the star's core and still keep his hair intact. Unfortunately, this would be a regret for Mark. He could only carry this unsolved mystery back to Asgard. Because just now, Itri had already handed the successfully transformed Aether to Thor. Their only mission for this trip had been completed, which meant they had to leave and prepare for the impending war. After Itri's work, the function of the ether had changed from transforming matter into dark matter to transforming dark matter into normal matter. This meant that the dark elves, composed of dark matter, had no way to resist Asgard with the transformed ether. After their bodies were corroded, their consciousness would dissipate, and they would become lifeless bodies. Even if the dark elves were able to take back the ether, they would be unable to activate them due to their reversed function. As long as the dwarves on Nidavella were protected, the Dark Elves would be powerless. Heimdall After a brief thanks and farewell to Itri, Thor shouted Heimdall's name loudly into the sky. Soon, the Bifrost descended from the sky, enveloping the six of them, and then carried them back to Asgard. But just then, a sudden change occurred. Within the quantum tunnel constructed by the Bifrost, where everyone had been completely quantum informationized, they suddenly felt a distance shaking throughout the entire passage. Then, a burst of energy pierced through the quantum tunnel's membrane, propelling Mark and Thor out of the tunnel. Meanwhile, the warriors three and Lady Sif, who had turned into a quantum state, could only helplessly watch as Mark and Thor gradually disappeared from their sight, unable to provide any assistance. At least luckily, the four of them still followed the established route and returned to Asgard, where they could report the detailed situation to Odin. And now, Mark and Thor, brought by that sudden surge of mysterious energy, had appeared directly on a desolate planet. Others might not know the origin of the mysterious energy, but for Mark, from this sudden event, he had already deduced two pieces of information. First, the mastermind behind bringing them here is the Dark Elves, and this desolate and sandy planet is the birthplace of the Dark Elves, the dark world of Svartalfame. Second, it is highly likely that the Dark Elves have also gained control of the Tesseract, the Space Stone. The energy surge just now was triggered by the Tesseract. Mark, who had conducted extensive research on the cube, was very familiar with such energy fluctuations and immediately deduced the result. Although the Dark Elves were now able to activate the cube's power, their application of it was inevitably still immature. This is why, originally intending to transport everyone in the group, only Mark and Thor were affected by the energy surge. However, this indicates that the Dark Elves had been watching them since the moment Mark and the others left Asgard. They waited until this final opportunity for their return to strike. Mark speculated that the Dark Elves probably didn't know the true purpose of their visit to Nidavellir to find the Dwarf King, otherwise, they wouldn't have waited until now to make their move. As he gazed at the Dark Elf warship hovering in the distance, Mark revealed a smirk filled with mockery. Although the Dark Elves were not slow, they managed to decipher the usage of the Tesseract within a few days. After all, unlike Aether, the Tesseract does not have specific limitations based on the user's race. Coupled with the Dark Elves' extensive technological accumulation, their progress was within reason. However, compared to Mark's side, the Dark Elves were ultimately a step behind. Now, they were waiting for the only opportunity they had been waiting for centuries, the Aether, whose mysteries had been unraveled by Mark and modified by the dwarf King Itri. After the triumphant return of the Warriors Three and Lady Sif to Asgard, they would undoubtedly provide a detailed report of the situation to Odin. Nidavellir would then receive tight protection from Asgard. This meant that the Dark Elf leader Melkith and his army of Dark Elves, had lost their chance of victory. 
no matter how they struggled, they could not change the ultimate outcome of defeat. Therefore, when Mark saw Melkith, accompanied by the curse warriors and a group of soldiers, marching towards him and Thor with an aggressive stance, he couldn't help but display a mocking smile. It seems our calibration had a slight deviation. The energy release failed to wipe you all out. Furthermore, I don't sense any trace of ether particles from you. But it doesn't matter. Now that Odin's son and a troublesome Midgardian like you are in my hands, I don't believe Odin will resist. Melkith approached Mark and Thor, looking at them with great confidence, clearly considering them his captives. The curse warriors and the dark elf soldiers behind him dispersed, surrounding the two, emanating a terrifying aura. However, the more confident the dark elves appeared, the angrier it made Thor. They were underestimating him. Beside Thor, Mark appeared very relaxed, finding the dark elves' behavior increasingly laughable. Not only had he disrupted their chance for a comeback, but Melkith and the Curse Warriors were also defeated by him before. Now, they thought they were invincible just because they had greater numbers, which was nothing short of arrogance. But before Mark could utter a few mocking words and undermine their morale, Thor couldn't hold back any longer and directly attacked. In his mind, he thought, you act all high and mighty, but I want to see if you, the leader of the Dark Elves, are truly worthy of your name. He leaped high, using the full power of his legs, and raised Mjolnir, the hammer of Thor, aiming to strike Melkith's head with a mighty blow. Boom! The impact of the hammer, combined with the accompanying lightning power, would severely injure Melkith if it struck his head, possibly disfiguring him. However, Thor's attack failed to land on Melkith. Just as his hammer was about to hit its target, a tall figure suddenly appeared, standing in front of Melkith, and with his right hand firmly gripping Thor's wrist, he not only prevented Thor's attack but also put him in a passive position. The one who blocked Thor's attack was his most loyal subordinate, the Curse Warrior. With one hand, the Curse Warrior lifted Thor's hammer-wielding right hand into the air, while his other hand clenched into a fist, striking heavily on Thor's abdomen with a powerful gust of wind and thunder. Bang! Thor, enduring the punch from the Curse Warrior, displayed a pained expression on his face. The strength of the Curse Warrior, who could restrain him and prevent him from breaking free, was at least four or five times his own. It was no wonder that Thor felt the pain from being hit like this. However, as someone who had withstood the punches of the Hulk, Thor quickly recovered. Seeing that the Curse Warrior was about to strike again, Thor immediately lifted his leg and curled his body, entangling himself around the Curse Warrior's right hand. Then, with a skillful twist of his body, he cleverly freed himself from the restraint. Returning to the ground, now aware of the opponent's strength, Thor no longer acted recklessly. He quickly stepped back and rejoined Mark's side. The situation is getting a bit troublesome. I feel the same way. But it's not us who are in trouble, it's them, Mark said, raising an eyebrow as he spoke. What do you mean? Thor asked, puzzled. They want the ether, right? Let's give it to them. Let's see if that big guy has what it takes to handle. This generous gift, Mark replied. Upon hearing Mark's words, Thor suddenly understood, and a mischievous smile appeared on his face as he took out the container sealed with ether. Indeed, as soon as Melkith saw Thor's action, he took the bait immediately. Ether. I didn't expect to find it with you. So, this is what you obtained in Nidaveller. It completely shielded my perception of the ether. In fact, not long after Mark and the others entered Nidaveller, the Dark Elves lost their connection with the ether particles. It was precisely for this reason that Melkith was eager to take action against Mark's group before their side fully mastered the power of the Tesseract. That's right, what's sealed inside is the ether you've been yearning for. If you promise to release us, I will hand it over to you, Thor directly presented his terms. Ha ha ha. Upon hearing Thor's words, Melkith laughed out loud. Now your lives are in my hands. What right do you have to negotiate with me? As long as I capture you now, the ether will be within my grasp. Warriors, attack! At Melkitha's command, the curse warriors rushed forward, followed closely by the dark elf soldiers, all converging on Mark and Thor, narrowing the encirclement. As the curse warriors approached, Thor's face blossomed with a radiant smile. Since you want it so badly, then have it, then, Thor opened the seal of the ether particles and directly threw it toward the position of the curse warriors. Snap! 
Instinctively, the cursed warrior raised his hand and caught the gift that Thor suspiciously handed to him. As expected, the modified ether, despite only changing one thing, acted on their natural instinct. When not activated and controlled, they would actively seek a host to parasitize and absorb the life energy within the host's body. Sure enough, in the moment the cursed warrior caught it, the ether, like a shark smelling blood, surged out from the open seal and directly parasitized the cursed warrior's body. Faced with this sudden change, the cursed warrior first froze, but then intense pain spread throughout his body. He began to tremble uncontrollably, rolling and thrashing on the ground like a fish just caught from the sea. What have you done to my subordinate? This thing can't be ether. Ether only makes us dark elves stronger. Besides, I don't sense any dark aura from this thing. Melkith exclaimed while questioning Mark and Thor, feeling a wave of fear in his heart. If it had been him just now, he would have undoubtedly reached out and caught that thing without hesitation, resulting in a fate similar to the curse warrior's current state. If he were to die here, the Dark Elves would be leaderless, and their only outcome would be destruction by Asgard. T.S.K. Tisk. Mark wagged his right index finger back and forth. You're wrong. The thing that parasitized him just now is indeed ether, no doubt about it. As for why you didn't sense a hint of darkness, well, that's because we modified it. Now the function of the ether has completely reversed. For you, it's no longer the supreme source of power or an invincible world-ending weapon. It's now the deadliest poison, the ultimate nemesis. Do you see what's happening to your subordinate now? The ether that entered his body is converting the remaining fragments of ether. Once the conversion is complete, all the body tissues composed of dark matter will be transformed into ordinary matter by the ether particles. First, his immune system instinctively rejects these newly appearing abnormal tissues, and his body will start to deteriorate from the mutated areas. As the conversion spreads wider and faster, the immune system will eventually fail completely, and the body's organs will collapse. In the end, he will appear normal on the surface, and because the nervous system will also fail, he won't feel the pain of death, nor will he even know that he has entered the realm of the dead. And before Melkitha's eyes, the events unfolded exactly as Mark described, step by step. The ether that had originally entered the curse warrior's body through the ether stone gradually assimilated. He began to revert back to his original appearance, but due to the excessive consumption of life energy earlier, he now appeared even more aged. Then, his body started to experience tissue breakdown. Intense pain caused him to curl up on the ground, gasping for breath. The constant flow of blood from his body added to the irregular rhythm of his breathing. Finally, the severe internal bleeding seemed to have stopped, but the curse warrior's breath grew weaker and weaker, a symptom of organ failure. However, despite the impending suffocation, his expression became increasingly relaxed and calm, indicating a loss of sensory perception. In the end, everything fell into tranquility, and Melkitha's most trusted comrade and loyal subordinate died such a tragic death. Melkith felt grief and despair in his heart. His brother, who had been with him for thousands of years, had died, and the ether had become a poison that the Dark Elves could not touch. Their only hope for a comeback was shattered. All the psychological support that had sustained Melkith's hidden existence for thousands of years collapsed in an instant, and he felt an unprecedented sense of darkness that he had never experienced even in the Dark World. But as a cunning strategist, after a brief struggle, Melkith adjusted his mindset. As long as he was still alive, there would always be a glimmer of hope. The sensing of the ether stopped when the other party entered Nidavellar. In other words, they completed the modification of the ether with the help of the Dwarf King. So if he had the chance to find the Dwarf King and threaten him to restore the ether to their original state, then there would still be hope for the Dark Elves. Melkith was well aware that under these circumstances, Asgard would definitely dispatch heavy forces to protect Nidavellar, so going there now would be futile. Moreover, having lost the curse warrior, his side no longer possessed the curse stone, and both their top-tier and low-tier combat power were inferior to Asgard. Going there now would only add to their losses and walk into a trap. His thoughts quickly turned, and in an instant, Melkith made all his considerations. The first thing to do now was to safely leave this place. Without the curse warrior, even though his side had more people, they would not be able to handle the son of Odin and the powerful Midgardian. He had to quickly escape from here, ensure his own safety, and prepare for the next step of his plan. 
Therefore, Melkith had already decided on his destination after leaving Svartalfame, the Nine Realms Center, Midgard. Since they couldn't match the mighty Asgard, they could only target the softest spot. Midgard, being the latest civilization among the Nine Realms and with the lowest technological level, would be a piece of cake for the Dark Elves to occupy. Once they controlled Midgard, they would have a hold on Mark's lifeline. At that time, they could threaten Mark to deliver information about Asgard and gain advantages for their own actions. Considering Odin's level of trust in Mark, after gaining control over him, it might even be possible to use Mark's hand to eliminate Odin. When Asgard is in chaos, there would be an opportunity for him to enter Nidavellir and restore the power of the Aether. With this in mind, Melkith had made up his mind. He ordered the two people beside him to carry the curse warrior's body and ran towards the direction of the warship. The remaining soldiers stayed behind to delay Melkith's escape. Mark hadn't expected that Melkith, as the leader of a clan, would be so shameless as to turn and run when things didn't go well. But this also showed a lack of analysis on Mark's part. Based on Melkith's behavior thousands of years ago, when he was defeated by King Bor, it should have been apparent that Melkith was a cunning strategist. But at this point, it was too late to say anything. Although the Aether had been modified, the enemy had obviously figured out that the Dwarf King, Itri, was the key to it all. They clearly had plans for taking him away. Furthermore, with the power of the developed Cosmic Cube, Mark and Thor were powerless to stop the enemy who was determined to escape. Now we're in trouble. Thor furrowed his brow. In this dark world of Svartalfame, not even Heimdall's gaze can easily penetrate. We're trapped here without any spacecraft tools. We're as good as dead. Announcement, dear readers, I'm thrilled to kickstart my journey as a digital artist and share my illustrations with you guys. Please subscribe to my new YouTube channel and follow Instagram page for a colorful adventure. YouTube at LR underscore digital arts Instagram at LR underscore digital arts let's create, inspire, and imagine together. Your support means the world. Cheers, Light Reaper, don't worry, Mark reassured Thor, this is a once in thousands of years phenomenon called the Nine Stars Alignment. During this time, the Nine Realms will align in a straight line, causing spatial boundaries to overlap and become chaotic. In other words, as long as we can find the chaotic anomaly point here, we can leave. Then we can call Heimdall and have him bring us back to Asgard through the Bivrost Bridge. Isn't that a solution? Upon hearing Mark's words, Thor's brow slightly eased, but he still expressed some concerns, saying, but Svartalfame is so vast. If we rely on luck alone to find the anomaly point, it's possible that by the time the Nine Stars alignment is over, we may not be able to locate it. Indeed, as Thor pointed out, Svartalfame's size is immense, and even if there are multiple anomaly points, finding them would be like finding a needle in a haystack, relying entirely on luck. However, since Mark had already come up with this idea, how could he leave his fate to chance? He remembered from the original storyline that after Thor and Jane entered a cave, the sudden ringing of a phone determined the location of the spatial anomaly point. It was because the satellite signal from Earth passed through the spatial anomaly point to Svartalfame that Jane's phone call was connected. Otherwise, even without considering signal attenuation, the time it would take for radio waves to transmit from Earth to here would be enough for Jane to enter a coffin 767 times. Although it could be said that Thor and the others had incredible luck, miraculously solving this problem by virtue of their protagonist's aura, Mark already knew the process of their escape. He just needed to replicate it, and the process was not difficult. You can rest assured. I promise to easily lead you to the anomaly point. Just follow me, Mark assured Thor confidently. Baymax. Mark communicated through telepathy. At your service, Master. Maximize the power of the signal collection device, search for any wireless signals using Earth's communication protocols, determine their sources, and mark their locations on a map for me. Understood, Master. Searching in progress. Search complete. Confirmed a signal source, currently determining the coordinates. Location determined. Data has been uploaded to you. Please check it. Well done, Baymax. Mark exclaimed excitedly, not using telepathy this time but shouting out loud with an enthusiastic fist pump. This left Thor standing there confused and at a loss for words. Cough. Cough. Mark coughed awkwardly, realizing his sudden outburst. 
He then explained to Thor, don't get me wrong. I got excited because I found the spatial anomaly point, you found it already. Upon hearing Mark's words, Thor also looked at him in astonishment, afraid that he might be joking. But Mark didn't disappoint Thor and nodded affirmatively, saying, we found it, and it's not far from here. I'll point you in the right direction, and you can take us there with Mjolnir. We have to be prepared before Melkith takes any action. Good. Thor immediately responded. Under Mark's guidance, the two quickly arrived at the spatial anomaly point in Svartalfheim. The anomaly point was located inside a cave, and upon entering, they saw obvious earth-made items like a Coca-Cola can and a keychain on the ground, confirming that this was the cave where Jane and Thor were supposed to enter according to the original storyline. It also indicated that this was the spatial anomaly point leading to Earth. Buzzing through the spatial anomaly point, the two indeed returned to Earth's surface. This is where I departed from when I brought Jane back to Asgard. Thor said, looking at the familiar surroundings. At the beginning of the nine stars alignment, the positions of the spatial anomaly points may change due to the rotation of the planets. But once the anomaly points form, their relative positions become fixed, so it's not strange for us to return here. But what I want to know is what they're planning to do here, Mark interrupted with a perplexing question. Ha! Huh. Hearing Mark's abrupt question, Thor looked at him confusedly and followed his gaze upward. Then, Thor was also stunned. What appeared in his line of sight was the enormous worship of the Dark Elves. It was unexpected that shortly after their separation in Svartalfheim, the two groups would meet again on Earth. I know what Melkith is planning. The Nine Stars alignment is about to occur, and the Dark Elves are determined to achieve their ambitions that have persisted for thousands of years. Besides needing the Aether, they must release it at the right time and place. The time is during the Nine Stars alignment when the Nine Realms align in a straight line, forming a group like a magnifying glass. As the released ether passes through each realm, its power will exponentially increase, ultimately reaching a level that endangers the entire universe. And it seems like this location is on Earth. Due to the time we spent obtaining the ether, combined with the fact that even if they managed to force Itri to serve them and restore the functionality of the ether, it would still take some time. If the Dark Elves don't want to hide and wait for thousands of years again, they must complete all preparations before the final day arrives. Controlling Earth not only ensures their control over the location but also allows them to use it as leverage to make me help them resolve the trouble with the ether. That's why they've descended to Earth. Humph. They won't succeed, Mark. You can rest assured. I'll have Heimdall contact my father, and we'll send our army to annihilate them. Thor declared. Thor couldn't bear to see Jane Foster's homeland being invaded by the Dark Elves, let alone his fellow Avengers living on Earth, and Mark was Jane's savior as well as their mother's. However, Mark shook his head and stopped Thor from summoning reinforcements. Asgard not only needs to defend its own realm but also needs to allocate forces to protect Nidavellir. Our forces are already stretched thin. But no matter where reinforcements are sent from now, we would fall into Melkitha's trap. With the advantage brought by the Tesseract, he could make a swift advance. If Nidavellir's forces are weakened, it would fulfill Melkitha's desires. If Asgard's forces are diminished, it doesn't matter. Once Asgard is eliminated, they will become the rulers of the Nine Realms, and their plan will proceed unhindered. Even if they have to wait for thousands of years for the next Nine Stars alignment, they can accept that. So now, we can't seek help from Asgard. Even if we ask for assistance, I believe that your father, in his wisdom, wouldn't send reinforcements for the sake of the greater good. This. Hearing Mark's analysis, Thor was at a loss for words, not knowing how to solve the crisis before them. Don't feel guilty. Ultimately, one's homeland must be protected by their own abilities. Relying on others indefinitely is impossible. And they think that Earth is a piece of fat meat on a chopping board, but they're completely mistaken. Today, I'll finally put the satellite energy beam I've prepared to use. Baymax, help me establish a connection with the orbital weapon satellite. Get all satellites currently operational in orbit that can target Greenwich into launch preparation mode and aim the cannons at the Dark Elf warship on the ground. Understood, Master. With a command from Mark, the four satellites orbiting the Earth in distant outer space all received the order simultaneously. However, two of the satellites were too far from Greenwich, where the Dark Elves had descended, and were unable to perform targeting operations. 
they ceased the preparation for energy beam emission. However, the other two satellites had already completed their targeting locks. The gun barrels tracked the movement of the Dark Elf warship, constantly making slight adjustments to the angles. Meanwhile, within the cannon barrel, the antimatter particles had been accelerated to a stable sublight speed state through uninterrupted energy transmission in the particle ejection device. They were ready to deliver precise strikes against the Dark Elf fleet descending upon Earth, awaiting Mark's final confirmation command. Master, among the orbital weapon satellites in operation, two are capable of launching strikes against the target. They have completed the launch preparations and can initiate an attack at any time. Less than 20 seconds after Mark issued the command, the orbital weapon satellites that he had deployed in space at a considerable cost had completed all preparations. Since that's the case, let's leave them with a memorable lesson. Start with a test shot from one satellite while the other remains in a ready state, temporarily on standby. Then, Thor witnessed a scene that would forever haunt him and also instill fear of Mark within him. A yellow beam of light, like the Spear of God's Judgment, tore through the thick cloud layer in the sky, precisely piercing the Dark Elf warship descending upon Earth. Boom! The tremendous roar continued for over ten seconds. The dazzling light forced Thor to temporarily close his eyes. When the beam disappeared, and Thor opened his eyes again, what he saw was a deep black hole, devoid of bottom. The warship that was once there had vanished without a trace. The destructive power of such an attack was almost comparable to the Bifrost. Even Thor himself felt a shiver in his heart, wondering if he would be able to withstand such an attack if caught off guard. And he believed that if Mark were provided with an abundant energy source and high-intensity materials capable of withstanding prolonged output of high-energy particle beams, he could definitely bring it to the level of the Bivrost's world-ending destruction. Baymax, during the process of the orbital weapon's output attack just now, did you detect any spatial fluctuations? Mark was concerned that the Dark Elves might have escaped through the Cosmic Cube before the attack landed, rendering his previous strike futile. Master, based on all the data information I have analyzed, there were no signs of spatial fluctuations. I believe the enemy has been completely eliminated. Very well, then let the other satellite cancel its standby status. We don't need to launch the remaining shot. I didn't expect the first test shot to be quite effective, hitting the target directly. Mailkith should have perished in this fatal, base strike. Baymax, contact the damage control company and have them send the micromagnetic axis robots to restore this area to its original state. Also, carefully search the vicinity for traces of the cosmic cube and ether particles. I believe the Dark Elves would have kept these two things on their warship, so they must be lost nearby. It seems you were right, Mark. Earth no longer needs protection from other forces. You can handle threats from the universe on your own. Thor displayed a congratulatory smile and spoke to Mark. However, Mark could easily see the hidden fear in Thor's eyes, despite Thor having visual information processing capabilities. Mark felt helpless about it as well. Sometimes, relationships between people are like this. Even with close friends, once the balance of power between them shifts, most of the time, the friendship comes to an end. The side that originally held the advantage finds it difficult to adapt to a vulnerable state of mind and starts resisting interaction and contact. Although Mark's current abilities and Earth's technological level were far from reaching Asgard's level, the fact that Earth no longer needed Thor's protection was indeed a cause for Thor's melancholy. However, Mark couldn't do much to help with Thor's mindset. It was up to Thor to adjust and overcome it. As a friend and comrade, Mark felt it necessary to say, indeed, Earth is now capable of facing threats from the universe with its own strength. This was established when the Avengers officially formed. Indeed, after hearing these words from Mark, a contented smile appeared on Thor's face. The slight fear he felt towards Mark was temporarily buried deep within, as if it had never existed. But who could say that this didn't sow a seed of fear in Thor's heart, which would sprout someday if given enough nourishment? And at that time, when this feeling called fear had grown into a towering tree, it would completely devour Thor's rationality and create irreparable cracks in his friendship with Mark. Meanwhile, on the other side of the earth, as the sun had just risen, chaos reigned in the command center of S. H. I. E. L. D. All agents and researchers were in a frenzy and the reason behind their agitation was none other than the super-particle beam Mark had just launched from the orbital weapons. 
the concentration of the power equivalent to a small nuclear explosion into a particle beam capable of precise air-to-ground strikes from space was like holding the sword of Damocles over the heads of various governments. This enormous threat was naturally the trouble that S. H. I. E. L. D. needed to resolve. Have you found the source? Fury asked urgently as he rushed to the command center from his office, addressing his right-hand man, Agent Hill. We have found it, and I don't think you'll be surprised once you see it. Saying that, Hill displayed a holographic projection in front of Fury. If it's him, then it's not surprising at all. Fury nodded in agreement after seeing the contents of the projection. However, that doesn't mean I'm comfortable with the feeling of having a gun pointed at my head at any time. Tell me the details. Our military satellites captured footage in Greenwich, showing an unknown alien army suddenly descending upon Earth. Shortly after their appearance, Mark and Thor also appeared there, not through the Bivrost of Asgard but seemingly materializing out of thin air, similar to the spatial portal opened by the Cosmic Cube during the Battle of New York. According to the recent research conducted by Dr. Selvig, whom we have been closely monitoring, there have been phenomena of spatial disruptions in the area. This is related to the rare alignment of the nine realms that occurs once every few thousand years, which affects the stability of space between them. Therefore, we speculate that Mark and Thor appeared in Greenwich through a spatial anomaly. The particle beam that triggered an extremely high-energy alarm response in our agency was the devastating strike launched against the unknown alien warship after their arrival. According to the satellite data, the impact left a crater with a diameter exceeding 120 meters and a depth of nearly 70 meters. Crystalline materials resembling those near a volcano were found in the vicinity. Thermal imaging thermography showed that the highest temperature at the center of the beam reached an astonishing 120, 000 degrees Celsius. What's even more astonishing is that such immense energy was perfectly contained within the entire beam range without dissipating outward. Finally, based on the optical data of this beam and computer analysis, we obtained its emission data. Combining it with the latest real-time satellite orbit map, we found the only satellite that met all the criteria at the time. It was one of the four satellites Mark launched into space under the guise of private communication satellites two years ago. After obtaining this result, we quickly checked the real-time status of the other three satellites. The results showed that the other three satellites also exhibited varying degrees of anomalies. We have reason to believe that these three satellites also possessed the same orbital strike capabilities. So you mean the four satellites Mark launched into space are not communication satellites for personal use, but rather orbital weapons capable of launching deadly strikes? Fury asked with a grave expression. Exactly. These four satellites indeed serve the purpose of Mark's private communication satellites, but at the same time, they are powerful carriers of orbital weapons, Hill replied meticulously to Fury's question. Contact Mark and have him relinquish control of the four satellites. We are willing to provide him with the necessary compensation. If he refuses, don't hesitate to shoot down all four satellites. We cannot allow such a significant threat to linger over our heads at all times. Also, notify Alexander Pierce that I agree with his proposal. If we really have to aim guns at everyone's heads, it should be handled by S. H. I. E. L. D. Yes, Director. The scene returns to Greenwich. Just moments ago, Thor, after conducting a thorough search, returned with the cosmic cube and ether particles, which were now back in his possession, to Asgard. He needed to report the events to Odin and reallocate the destination of the ether particles because ancient prophecies in Asgard had issued warnings. Under no circumstances should the six infinity stones be reunited, as it would bring unimaginable calamity. Therefore, although Odin had never thought of collecting all six infinity stones and had hidden the stones separately, like how he hid the cosmic cube on Earth before, now the ether particles also need to find a reliable destination. So, after hastily bidding farewell to Mark, Thor returned to Asgard with the two treasures and promised Mark that when he sent Jane back to Earth, he would express his gratitude to Mark for the significant contribution he made to Asgard and the Nine Realms. Mark did not feel disappointed about missing another opportunity to obtain the ether particles and the cosmic cube. Because this experience had already brought him tremendous gains, which would keep him busy for a while. It seems I'll return to that state of mad research again. Fortunately, my psychological issues have been resolved. While contemplating his future research plans and work arrangements, Baymax suddenly interrupted Mark's thoughts. Master, there's an incoming call. 
It's Agent Coulson from S-H-I-E-L-D. Patch it through. I already have an idea why he's calling me. At this point, the purpose of the call was already evident. It was definitely about his orbital weapons satellites, even a child could figure that out. However, although Mark had this thought, he wouldn't have brought up the matter himself if Coulson hadn't mentioned it. He could have played dumb and fooled his way out of it. It had been a long time since he last heard from Coulson. Mark, even if we're not friends, we're at least half comrades. Let's be frank. You know the reason why I called. Director said that as long as you voluntarily surrender control of the satellites, he will provide you with necessary compensation. Otherwise, they will immediately launch an attack on your four satellites without any compensation. You would be at a loss. Upon Coulson's well-intentioned advice, Mark coldly chuckled without hesitation. He didn't agree to surrender. When he decided to use the orbital weapons to strike the Dark Elf warship, he anticipated this situation and had already prepared a countermeasure. What he didn't expect was that S. H. I. E. L. D. S. phone call came so quickly. He had just saved the Earth from a crisis, and now S. H. I. E. L. D. was immediately coming to him for something. This action made Mark feel somewhat uncomfortable. However, Mark didn't show it. He also understood Fury's nature, and he knew that it wasn't worth feeling upset about such matters. What mattered was that he had done the right thing and didn't regret it. Coulson, tell Director Fury this, I won't hand over the control of the orbital weapon satellites. Such weapons are far safer in my hands than in S. H. I. E. L. D. S. hands. But since you are not at ease, I won't insist. Give me a few days, and I will dismantle the satellites and return them to Earth through appropriate means. I believe that should resolve any concerns, right? Okay, I got it. I'll relay your message to the director. Also, Mark, I believe in your intentions for developing and launching the orbital weapons. I trust you to make the right choice. After saying that, Coulson hung up the phone, not putting much thought into Mark's slip of the tongue about S-H-I-E-L-D, handing over control of the satellites is impossible, not in this lifetime. It is to prevent the orbital weapons from falling into the hands of Hydra or becoming a tool for authoritarianism and domination. Likewise, Mark will not actually dismantle the satellites and bring them back to Earth from space. The future enemies that Earth will face are not only numerous but also unimaginably powerful. Without the orbital weapons as a trump card, Earth will undoubtedly pay a heavy price. Therefore, Mark must retain them. The reason Mark had Coulson reply in this manner to Nick Fury was twofold. Firstly, it was to clearly tell the other party that he would not surrender this technology, cutting off any hopes that S. H. I. E. L. D. and other forces behind them may have had. Secondly, it was to appease the other party. Since the government is concerned about the threat posed by the orbital weapons, Mark can remove the weapons. In doing so, he voluntarily conceded a step, giving the other party face. Although neither side gained nor lost anything, it can be said that this is a mutually acceptable outcome. Considering the Stark family's economic influence on the country, the personal influence of father and son, and the assessment of their future value output, it is also impossible for us, H-I-E-L-D, or the forces behind them to turn against Mark over just this orbital weapon. So, the situation can only be settled this way. Of course, this is only the surface result. Mark will not really retrieve the orbital weapons he has painstakingly deployed. Mark's consideration is that his proposed suggestion will inevitably be conveyed to the World Security Council and the true masterminds behind the scenes by S. H. I. E. L. D. Regardless of whether they agree with Mark's proposal or reject it, Mark can use the time they spend discussing it to prepare for his deceptive plan. His confidence in being able to deceive them comes from the detailed technical data on the Dark Elf warship that Magneto collected. Among them, the technology used by the Dark Elves to achieve ship invisibility can help Mark smoothly carry out his dismantling and retrieval plan for the orbital weapons. The Dark Elves' invisibility technology is different from S. H. I. E. L. D. S. reflective plate technology. It does not achieve ship invisibility through optical reflection. Instead, it has an energy field generator inside the ship. When activated, an energy field surrounds the ship causing light to be distorted and continue along its original path without illuminating the ship's hull. Compared to S. H. I. E. L. D. S. reflective plate technology, the Dark Elves' energy field technology is not only easier to modify but also has advantages in reliability and stealth capability. 
As long as Mark reproduces the energy field radiation modules, puts on a show of dismantling and retrieval, installs them on the orbital weapon satellites, shuts off the monitoring interface open to the NASA, and cuts off the satellite's external communication, Mark can continue to covertly operate these four satellites in space, executing his plan of deception. However, in doing so, the orbital weapons will truly become Mark's last resort. Unless it is an absolute necessity, launching the orbital weapons will never be the first choice against enemies because once the orbital weapons are used, all hidden methods will become ineffective. Even though the stealth capabilities of these four satellites remain intact, everyone understands that the orbital weapons, this metaphorical sword of Damocles, will always hang over their heads. Coulson should have already reported my proposal, and I need to quickly start deciphering the Dark Elf stealth technology. In that case, I can't leisurely fly back on a plane. Baymax, you supervise the cleanup work here. I have a more important task to handle now. After speaking, Mark's body floated in mid-air, and nanobots surged out of his body, forming a black battle armor. At the same time, a pair of thrusters gradually took shape behind Mark. Boom! In the next moment, the thrusters accelerated abruptly, leaving behind a terrifying roar, as Mark soared into the sky and disappeared over Greenwich Square. Two days had passed in the blink of an eye. During these two days, with the assistance of the server cluster, Mark's brain was firing on all cylinders. All restrictions were lifted, and his mind entered a fully operational state. In this state, Mark completely deciphered the Dark Elves' stealth technology in less than an hour. The next step was to let Baymax handle material procurement and fully automated production and assembly based on the design and production flow charts provided by Mark. However, while Mark acted swiftly, S. H. I. E. L. D. was not slow to respond either. Nick Fury, without going through Coulson, directly called Mark to express his agreement with Mark's plan. However, he requested that Mark complete the retrieval of the orbital weapon satellites within one week. Furthermore, if necessary, both NASA and the Space Force were ready to provide necessary assistance. Mark agreed to the timeframe set by the other party during the phone call but did not accept the so-called assistance. The plan itself was about deceiving others, and the so-called retrieval was just a smokescreen. If he really asked them for help, it would expose all of Mark's designs. Moreover, Mark was well aware that NASA and the Space Force were not charitable organizations and would not offer free lunches for no reason. If he asked for their assistance, they must have ulterior motives. Besides the core technology of the orbital weapons, there was nothing else worth their involvement. It couldn't be as simple as them wanting to sell Mark a favor. Coincidentally, the four stealth devices that he needed had already been assembled and passed Baymax's functional tests. They could withstand the vacuum, low temperatures, and strong radiation of outer space and maintain normal operation. Now, all that was left was to send them into space, complete the modular assembly, and realize the preset functions in the program. For this, Mark needed to deploy the space operation robots he had prepared. The so-called space operation robot, in reality, does not have a humanoid structure. In order to create a better illusion that the orbital weapon satellites have been retrieved, Mark needs to hide some ordinary satellite components in advance. This way, after wandering in space for a while, he can produce the items and present them to the prying eyes, completing his plan of deceiving others. Therefore, the overall shape of the space operation robot resembles a sunflower seed-shaped aircraft. It has a pointed head and a large rear end, which not only ensures aerodynamic efficiency and reduces air resistance during flight but also provides sufficient storage space that Mark requires. In addition, there is a storage compartment on each side of the robot. When opened, two folding octagonal mechanical arms can extend from them. The flexibility and precision of their movements are comparable to the top microsculptors among humans, allowing for precise installation of the stealth modules. Furthermore, Mark has equipped the space operation robot with his latest invention, the augmented reality system, which can create virtual images to deceive cameras and human eyes. Even if there are forces using satellites or telescopes to secretly monitor the entire plan, Mark's plan can still be executed smoothly. With everything ready, Mark applied for special launch permission in advance. With the assistance of S. H. I. E. L. D., he received a green light all the way and obtained permission for his space operation robot to ascend in the City of Angels. And, for a rare occasion, Mark broke his tradition of naming it with a negative connotation and named this robot, Angel, to commemorate its special ascent in the City of Angels. 
Since, Angel, used the same superconducting magnetic levitation system as Mark's suit, it did not need to carry heavy fuel like traditional rockets or spacecraft. The takeoff process lacked the earth-shattering effects. Even the noise generated during the ascent was quieter than the sound of a Formula One car starting. With just two ion thrusters powered by the arc reactor, the Angel smoothly reached the first orbital velocity and successfully maneuvered into the next level orbit of the orbital weapons satellite. Before entering the same orbit as the satellite, they needed to close the distance between them. Attempting to accelerate and catch up while on the same orbit was not only difficult to maintain their own trajectory but also risked collision accidents. If Mark's orbital weapon satellite collided with the Operation Robot, the resulting financial loss would be a minor concern compared to the real danger of space debris. The fragments produced from such impacts, whether large or small, would travel at high speeds on their respective orbits. However, since they lack propulsion devices, they could change orbits at any time. This could lead to collisions with other satellites operating normally on different orbits, generating even more space debris. As space debris increases, the difficulty and risks of launching satellites or probes for humanity will greatly increase, slowing down the progress of human civilization towards space. Therefore, as a precaution, even though Mark is confident in his invention, he adopted the safest approach. Although this slightly slowed down the progress, things proceeded smoothly, and each operation was precisely executed without revealing any flaws. After activating the stealth devices, the achieved effects met Mark's previous expectations, and no malfunctions occurred. Since the four satellites were in geostationary orbit, after several orbital changes and pursuits, they completed the retrieval mission and successfully returned within a day. However, the landing site for the return journey could not be set in the City of Angels. According to the suggestions of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and the Space Force, carrying the dismantled satellite components would result in an extremely heavy payload. To avoid the potential hazards of a crash, the landing site should be chosen in an area with sparse population and vast land. Eventually, the chosen location was Old Bridgetown in New Mexico, which was where Thor first arrived on Earth and encountered Jane. However, due to the battle between the destroyer and the howitzer, the town was reduced to rubble by an antimatter annihilation bomb. Although Mark promised to compensate the local residents and rebuild Old Bridgetown, most of them chose to move to more prosperous cities after receiving Mark's substantial compensation. As a result, the town remained in a dilapidated state over the past two years. Although the suggestions from NASA and the Space Force may seem reasonable, based on the chosen location and Mark's understanding of them, things would not be so straightforward. Old Bridgetown is remote, and even driving to the nearest airport would take a day, let alone the fact that the town has declined in recent years, and the surrounding roads have received no maintenance or management, further increasing travel time. This long transportation route presents ample opportunities for the numerous factions eager to obtain the orbital weapons. Firstly, the area is sparsely populated, and as long as they make some disguises, they can choose a suitable location along the route to attack and seize the cargo without leaving any evidence. Mark would be helpless against them without any proof afterward. Secondly, the journey is long, so even if they fail in their first attempt, they can launch a second operation. The transportation team won't find any shelter along the way, and Mark's support won't arrive in time. Although Mark knows exactly what they are up to, he doesn't expose their intentions. Let them plot all they want, as the most they can obtain in the end is some ordinary components with no real value. Besides, it will also provide Mark with an opportunity to present a splendid performance, so why not? However, for this performance to be truly spectacular, having only NASA and the Space Force is not enough. There needs to be an equally greedy and powerful competitor to ignite the dramatic conflict. And that role undoubtedly belongs to Hydra. So, Mark directly called Nick Fury and asked him to help transport the recovered satellite components back to his company. In a situation where Hydra has infiltrated the entire S-H-I-E-L-D, Mark's action is clearly offering them assistance. This way, all the roles in this grand play have been assembled, and a battle for the orbital weapons components is about to unfold.